Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament, and that thou would be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respects to the elders past and present of all Australia's indigenous people. Now just before we commence today, Senator Waters, I'm just going to make a few remarks. Um, I just wish to inform the Senate that this morning the Speaker of the House, the member for Casey, Mr Tony Smith, submitted his resignation as Speaker to the Governor-General as he indicated he would do in the last sitting period. Being new to the role of Senate President, I had only a brief time to work with Tony as my counterpart. But uh, that has been all uh, that has been necessary to gain an appreciation of the quality that he brought to the role, not only as a facilitator of fair parliamentary debate, but also as a manager of this building, its people and its varied workings. Tony became Speaker in 2015, making him the longest serving in the role since Billy Snedden, who served from 1976 to 1983. He put his personal stamp on the role by ensuring that he did not impose himself on proceedings. It should never be about the Speaker, and Tony always understood that. Uh, Tony got certain uh, responsibilities that I didn't. He got to exercise 94A, uh, and he got to uh, not go to the party room, two things which I was slightly envious of, but uh, I'm glad I, I don't have. Uh, I wish to thank Tony and his office for all their support and assistance as I transitioned into the role of Senate President. Tony's corporate knowledge, judgment and support on so many matters over the past few weeks have, have made uh, my entry to the role invaluable. And although our roles differ as surely as our respective chambers do, I have noted in particular Tony's ability to work with parliamentarians of all parties to ensure trust in the process. It is a quality in his performance admired by many, including myself, and one which I will endeavour to emulate in my role in this place. And on behalf of the Senate, I wish to acknowledge his service. Yeah. Senator Lyons. Just seek leave to make a few remarks as Deputy President. Is leave granted? Leave Thank is you. Granted. So I too would uh, join um, my remarks to those of the President, and I worked uh, with Tony since becoming Deputy um, President of the Senate, and I can also say that he was very inclusive. Um, certainly, the President and I did a lot uh, with the Speaker, and I had um, the honour of attending a couple of conferences with him. He's, he was very inclusive and um, certainly uh, never played the political card in any of the roles that I saw him in. I'm uh, sad that he's going, but I wish him well in whatever he does next and I thank him particularly for supporting me as the Deputy President. Senator Waters. Thank you, President. Pursuant to Standing Order 78.3, I object to the withdrawal of the notice of motion for the disallowance of industry research and development carbon capture use and storage development program 2021 and I ask that the notice stand in my name. It will be put in your name and it will be dealt with later in the day. I'm just going to do documents and committee meetings first, Senator Patrick, so I call the clerk. Mr President, I table documents pursuant to statute as listed on the dynamic red and I indicate that committees have lodged proposals as shown at item four of today's order of business. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. There being no one. Senator Patrick. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to the consideration of the Australian Federal Integrity Commission Bill 2021 as circulated. Is leave granted? 
leave is not granted. Senator Patrick. Pursuant to contingent notice of motion standing in my name, I move that so much of the standing orders be suspended as would prevent me moving a motion to provide for the consideration of a matter, namely a motion to, to provide that a motion relating to consideration of the Australian Federal Integrity Commission Bill may be moved immediately, have precedence over all other business until determined and be determined without, without amendment or debate. Mr President, it's 1,077 days since the, the Coalition uh, announced that they were going to bring ICAC legislation to the Parliament. 1,077 days. And basically, we've waited, we've waited, we've waited, and nothing has come. And uh, whilst uh, you know, it's, not, it's not normal to want to inter interrupt the normal running of the Senate business, there's a point where you reach where you say, enough is enough. Enough is enough. The wait has been too long. There are a number of uh, of allegations uh, in relation to the coalition, uh, and, I'm, and I stress their allegations. I'm not going to uh, impugn anyone, but just put on the record a number of concerns the Australian public have had in, re in respect of uh, coalition uh, members and uh, ministers. There's been uh, Mr. Taylor in relation to uh, the $80 million uh, sale of uh, strategic water purchases, uh, Senator McKenzie in relation to sports rorts. Um, uh, uh, Senator, uh, sorry, uh, Mr. Dutton, in relation to um, in relation to uh, AU pairs, um, we've seen uh, Mr. Joyce also involved in uh, controversy over water purchases. We've seen uh, uh, Mr. Frydenberg in relation to Grassgate, uh, Mr. Fletcher in relation to a, a $10 million grant, Mr. Sucker in relation to. Uh, issues of expenditure of public money, Mr. Tudge, uh, in relation to the car parks rorts. So, you know, there is just uh, a whole range of affairs. We've seen a situation where uh, 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 Mr. Porter has received a blind uh, uh, has received money through a blind trust. That's almost unfathomable in a, in a, circum in a situation where we, we have openness and transparency and is really important from an integrity perspective and a confidence perspective to make sure that the public are able to see uh, our uh, transactions, how we might be influenced in terms of our votes. All of that has to be uh, on the table for people to see. And until such time as we get uh, a, uh, some form of independent commission against corruption, um, an Australian uh, Federal Integrity Commission. Uh, these concerns will linger. Now I know there are people on the on the other side that uh, object to the various different models. Uh, you know they, they don't want uh, public hearings. They don't uh, uh, you know they don't want uh, particular people demonstrated uh, uh, or sorry um, uh, particular people included in the scope of uh, a federal ICAC or indeed uh, for uh, certain matters relating to corruption to be excluded from, from, the, from the definition. Um, these are all things we can debate. These are all things we can talk about and we can debate, but we haven't had the opportunity—1,076, 1,077 days—and we've not had the opportunity to do that. And the Australian public have been waiting for this. So there is now urgency. There is urgency in that we have to uh, uh, basically force the government to, to uh, comply with their promise, their own promise that they said they would introduce ICAC legislation uh, uh, to satisfy the demands of the Australian public. They made that as a promise as they went into the last election. And, and so uh, you get to a point where you say, sorry, you can't uh, have us wait any longer. We know the difficulties associated with this bill, these sorts of bills, the complexities. And uh, indeed, we know that uh, these, these sort of bills need to be uh, fleshed out in committees. Or we've already had one through the Greens uh, fleshed out in, in committees. Um, but uh, you know, the government basically is absent without leave on this. If you have a strong integrity commission, the test of it, if it's strong enough, you'll have no referrals, because no one would dare do anything that, that uh, looked like misfeasance or malfeasance or corruption or misuse of funds, those sorts of things. 
That's what happens when you have a really strong ICAC. If you have a weak ICAC, people still try to play at the fringes. It still allows and permits uh, corruption to occur, political corruption to occur. And that's why it's important that we need to deal with this bill uh, today to, to get the whole thing kicking along, uh, a comprehensive bill that is endorsed by uh, judicial officers, uh, eminent uh, uh, pr professionals in the integrity field. And I ask that the Senate support my motion to suspend. Um, Minister. Thanks, um, thanks, Deputy President. Uh, Deputy President, uh, the government does not support uh, Senator Patrick's attempt to uh, interrupt and change and vary uh, the order of government business and business in the Senate. Uh, the, uh, the government has a schedule of, uh, of legislation, and the Senate has a program before it that would ordinarily have seen us and otherwise see us proceeding a debate, the Independent National Security Legislation Monitor Amendment Bill, and then proceeding on to the Dental Benefits Amendment Bill and other legislation uh, scheduled for today uh, as outlined. Uh, we do not uh, support uh, this move uh, to interrupt that consideration of other government legislation. Deputy President, it often seems that uh, when uh, those opposite and those on the crossbench uh, speak about uh, matters in relation to a proposed Commonwealth Integrity Commission uh, or other names that others seek to give uh, such entities, that they do so uh, with some uh, belief that there is uh, a void that exists in relation uh, to accountability, uh, to uh, process, uh, to oversight, uh, when in fact that is uh, quite clearly not the case. Uh, that indeed uh, in Australia we have already uh, robust multifaceted approach to combating corruption. We have a range of existing entities that are in place, uh, from the Australian Commission for Law Enforcement Integrity, uh, the work of the Australian Federal Police, uh, the work of the Commonwealth Ombudsman, uh, the work of the Independent Parliamentary Expenses Authority. Uh, each of these entities uh, exist in a manner uh, where we are all held accountable equally to the law of the land, subject to investigation under uh, the operations of these different entities and bodies. Now, Mr. Uh, now Deputy, President, Deputy President, our government is, uh, has been working uh, to establish uh, a Commonwealth Integrity Commission that looks to build upon this existing framework, this existing framework that others seem to pretend just does not actually exist. That existing framework does provide already very important protections for Australians in relation uh, to the operation and conduct of all public officials, of all law enforcement officials, of all those who are subject, as I say, to the laws of the land and to investigation by, by the range of uh, entities that currently exist. Now, Deputy President, those opposite can seek to try uh, to make some sort of uh, attempted smear process out of, uh, out of these things. What we've said is that we want to go through the proper process. The Attorney General has released draft legislation and has received feedback in relation to that draft legislation and is working through that feedback around that to ensure, Deputy President, to ensure, Deputy President, that any future construct in Australia builds upon the effective existing arrangements that we have in place and does so in ways that guarantee due process, proper process for any individuals that we actually don't create the type of kangaroo court regimes that, uh, that have been seen to operate elsewhere that destroy reputations before proper process uh, has occurred. What we want to make sure is, given we have such sound, such robust, so many existing Commonwealth entities in place, that we build upon that legacy and that framework of those entities. We do so in a way that preserves the best elements of how they operate in terms of the thoroughness and the diligence they apply uh, to accountability across all aspects of Commonwealth activity, uh, but we do so in a manner uh, that ensures proper process and due process is followed in relation to any matters that are considered. We have bolstered funding for the different agencies and, indeed, budgeted funding uh, for the additional uh, structures that are proposed to be developed and to put into place. Uh, but, Deputy President, we're not going to suggest 
uh, that, uh, that, uh, that we should simply adopt, as Senator Patrick's motion seeks to do, uh, in the space of an hour and a half, uh, a model, uh, a model uh, that, uh, that has not been subject to the same type of rigour uh, and thoroughness and analysis uh, that the Attorney-General has been working through. Uh, we are going to stand very clearly by a process that ensures something as significant as this that will have long-lasting implications and complications uh, for the way in which uh, public officials work, uh, has all of the appropriate safeguards and thoroughness to make sure it works as I thank you, effectively Minister. Your time as has it should. Expired, Senator Gallagher, and then I'll go to Senator Waters. Senator Gallagher. Uh, Senator thank you, Waters. Madam Deputy President. Labor will support uh, the suspension uh, that Senator Patrick has moved today. And indeed, we would welcome the debate around establishing a national anti-corruption commission. Now, Labor's position about why we're supporting this is for the simple reason that the Senate needs to take charge of this issue because the government isn't going to. Uh, we've had a over a thousand days since the Prime Minister made a promise that there would be a national anti-corruption commission put in place. A thousand days the Senate has waited, the people of Australia have waited, and we haven't had a response from the government other than to explain that they're going through their processes and they're uh, you know, putting some focus on the detail. Well, plenty of people have done the work, and it's in the shape of the bill that Senator Patrick is seeking uh, to bring on today. Now, this eight-year-old tired government, there are plenty of reasons why they don't want to get to debate around a national anti-corruption body today or any day leading up to the next election, and that's because of the litany of scandals, rorts, waste and mismanagement that this government has presided over, and it would make them vulnerable. That's why we don't have one. And we can list them. The Western Sydney Airport land ripoff, the, the pork and ride scheme. Remember that? Money appropriated by this parliament through a budget that was then funnelled into just seats that the Treasurer held. The Treasurer of Australia gave himself four car parks after telling the people of this Australia that this program was for all of them. What a load of rubbish. That's the Treasurer. We know the Prime Minister had his hands all over sports rorts and car park rorts and the Urban Congestion Fund and Building Better Regions Fund. He's crafted the way that this money gets used for political purposes, appropriated for public purposes and then used for political purposes. And when a government has its prime minister leading the charge, where ministers are rewarded for the misuse of money like this, is it any wonder there is no desire to bring forward a debate about a national anti-corruption body? What a surprise! When ministers sacked amid scandal get recycled back into the cabinet, is it any wonder they don't want a debate about a national anti-corruption body? And the, the leader of the government says, well, we've got a set program and we've got all these bills to get to. The government's filibustering its own bills. Everyone in this place knows that. We've dealt with two bills yesterday. And the government added government members to the speaker's list long into the night last night. So don't come in here and say you've got all these urgent bills. You don't have a program. You're trying to cut deals left, right and centre because you're losing your own people. You, know, you lost five of your own yesterday. They left you because they don't like what's going on in the government. So don't sit here and pretend that you have a long program that we are now interfering with. That, what an absolute load of rubbish. If that was the case, we would be moving through the bills with the time that has been allocated for them. But this is a tired old government, eight years, going to an election where they're going to ask for their second decade in power. They have no plans to govern in the national interest. They are only governing now in their political interest, in their narrow political interest. They exist only for their own political interests, and so the Senate should allow this debate. We have to stand up for ourselves. This, this government 
doesn't comply with orders for production of documents, doesn't answer, answer questions on notice, refuses to be accountable, refuses to be transparent. They treat this Senate with disrespect, and at some time the Senate has to stand up for itself and go, you know what, if the government's not going to do its job, then we will. And the people of Australia want a national anti-corruption body. They don't trust us. We have to put something in place that responds to the concerns the Australian public have. A thousand and seventy-seven days ago, this Prime Minister promised, and we know he's not very good with telling the truth, promised to put one in place. And we are still waiting, and we have the opportunity today for the Senate to take charge and to have that debate. Because these guys Thank aren't going to do Gallagher. it. Gallagher, your time has expired, Senator Waters. Thanks very much, Deputy President. And the Greens will be supporting this suspension motion because we have waited far too long to see any semblance of integrity out of this government. It was an election promise last election that the government would introduce a corruption watchdog. Where's the bill? Nowhere to be seen. Consultation after consultation, which keeps getting ignored, and they still have a weak, pathetic body that has been criticised by experts as acting like a protection racket for their own MPs, rather than a watchdog to clean up politics and to genuinely dissuade corruption. And it's no surprise, I looked at the figures, half of the Cabinet have been embroiled in an integrity scandal over recent years. It is no wonder the government doesn't want to bring on a bill for a corruption watchdog. They'd lose half their Cabinet. Now, we passed a bill for a strong, independent corruption watchdog with teeth that could hold public hearings, that would be able to uh, have genuine coverage of the actions of members of parliament and public servants. We passed that bill in this Senate more than two years ago. The Prime Minister has been running scared in the House, and he has refused to bring that bill on for debate because he knows it would work, it would be effective, and it might clean up the mess that this government and their cabinet and their backbench keep creating. So it's no wonder that the Prime Minister is not delivering. Um, now, it's very interesting to see the position of One Nation as well. Now, they abstained on the vote on my bill two years ago. That's why it passed. Now, just uh, earlier, we saw, in fact, it was last week, we saw them change their position and say, actually, now, no, they think a corruption watchdog is just a witch hunt. Yet another deal that the government has done with One Nation to benefit their own electoral outcomes and to screw the Australian people once again. So I expect today that we'll see One Nation uh, oppose this suspension and oppose the bill. The government's got that sewn up. So much for this phony war that they're having. They are still in cahoots. They vote with the government almost every single time, and they are selling out the Australian public. This is why, in Queensland, we need to get rid of Pauline Hanson from the balance of power and we need to replace her with someone that will stand up for the interests of the people and the planet. Our Greens candidate, Penny Alman payne would be absolutely marvellous. But back to the corruption watchdog. Our version got top marks in an independent analysis of the versions, and guess who got the worst marks, the weakest proposed model? The government's model. So an independent analysis, the Centre for um, uh, Public Integrity, have said that the government's model is so weak, it's essentially a protection racket, it's worse than nothing. Um, our version got top marks as a strong corruption watchdog. That would do the trick. So it is no wonder that the government is running scared and won't bring it on. Now, what I want to say is that we welcome um, the crossbenchers also progressing this issue. Uh, it's been 11 years since the Greens have been calling for a corruption watchdog federally. We're the only jurisdiction that doesn't have one. We've been at this for 11 years. It took the Prime Minister until three years ago to finally say, no, this wasn't a niche issue, as he had initially described it, and agree that one's needed. Still hasn't actually delivered on that. Um, it took the Labor Party quite a long time to change their view too, and we welcome the fact that they've now done so. Uh, we welcome the fact that Helen Haynes over in the House um, and now Senator Patrick and, of course, Senator Lambie um, have been strong on integrity issues and are now proposing their own bill. There is a whole range of bills for a corruption watchdog on the table. The one that's not on the table is the government's version. We've been waiting for 1,077 days 
It's pretty clear we're going to be continuing to wait because this Prime Minister couldn't lie straight in bed. This is yet another broken promise. This is yet another falsehood from the Prime Minister. It is clear that he never intended to table a bill for a corruption watchdog. Why on earth are they prioritising bills to allow religious discrimination to be used as a sword, not a shield? They found the time to do that. They found the time to prioritise bills to suppress voters. We'll be seeing that in the, uh, in the Senate uh, sometime this week. They have found the time uh, to make sure that charities can't speak out one ele once election time is on. They are silencing dissent and they are suppressing voters. They have found the time to do that. They can't find the time to bring on my bill for a strong corruption watchdog, any of the crossbenchers' bills for a strong corruption watchdog, or even their own weak version. They are not committed to doing this. They have no integrity. Let's turf them out at the next election and restore some integrity to this parliament. Thank you, Senator Waters. Um, Minister. Mm, thank you very much, um, Madam Deputy President. Well, Senator Patrick's um, motion here today um, sort of flies in the face of everything that Senator Patrick stands for. He always stands for, I believe, you know, I'd, I'd even accuse um, Senator Patrick of being a, a procedural wonk um, in the sense that he, he is always a stickler for the process. Uh, and yet what we see here today is uh, Senator, Patrick, uh, Senator Patrick coming into the chamber and seeking to rearrange the business of the Senate. Now, Senator Patrick understands, like all of us in this place, that it is the role of the government and it is the privilege that is entitled to the government of the day to set the agenda of the Senate. So for Senator Patrick to come in here uh, and seek to to uh, to try and disrupt the order of business for the day, um, you know, really does fly in the face of everything that I believe Senator Patrick has always said he stands for. Um, there is a time in the agenda of every parliamentary sitting week where private sen um, crossbenchers, backbenchers are able to bring forward private senators' business, and Senator Patrick knows full well um, that the time afforded for bringing forward private senators' bills is that time. But no, today we see him coming in here and trying to disrupt the order of business on the basis of uh, him wanting to uh, be able to grandstand on a particular issue. Um, well, one of the other things I, I find um, really quite extraordinary in relation to, to this particular action that we're seeing here today, this is about seeking to suspend standing orders to rearrange the order of business in this place. Um, what we've seen so far is much debate around the, the particular matter in which Senator Patrick is seeking to suspend, but we actually haven't seen uh, much debate around um, the suspension in and of itself. Um, and we're sitting here and we're talking about issues of things like integrity, issues around um, people uh, and parties not telling the truth, issues of, of corruption, etc. Well, it is really quite extraordinary that we're sitting here and sitting on the other side of the chamber is a party who's prepared to go to the next election lying to the public. I mean, the irony of the fact that the member in the other place, uh, Julian Hill, was prepared to put a post on his Facebook page and his Twitter account that calls the Prime Minister a liar whilst at the same time lying to his constituents. Um, if we really want to have a look at some of the things that are going on at the moment, we should actually probably start calling out some of the absolute lies, um, despite the fact that Mr Albanese and everybody on the other side know that they are lying about the cashless debit card, they're quite happy to continue to lie. Um, you know, so if we're going to sit here and Order. talk about integrity, maybe we should get a little bit of integrity Order. in the debate that's going on. Um, and so for the opportunity that I'm standing here, Mr, Mr. President, um, I would like to put on the record again. The government of which I am a member, the Morrison-Joyce government, never has, doesn't and never will force age pensioners onto the cashless debit card. Now, I wonder how many times between now and the election there will be lies told by those on the Minister, other side. Minister, resume your seat. Senator Patrick, on a point of order. A point of order on relevance uh, to the, the, the suspension. <laughs> it, 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 it was getting into a fairly wide-ranging on the point of order, Senator Lambie. Finished? Oh, no, sorry, no. Sorry, Minister, are you.
conclude? Yeah, I'm just odd. I'm just um, the clock went to five minutes again. I'm happy to talk for another five minutes. Minister, you had the call. From my memory, it was around two minutes left. One thirty-five. The clerks have informed me. On the point of order. I, I understand the minister was about to finish, and so the clocks, the clerks reset for Senator Lambie. But is the minister had not finished? Please talk about lying more often. Senator Wong, thank you, Minister. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Um, but the reality of what we are seeing here is, uh, is, a, is obviously a stunt by Senator Patrick, um, you know, a stunt that goes against every single grain of everything that you stand for, Order. Senator Patrick. But you know, what, what we also have failing to recognise in all this is the existing framework of protections and measures and organisations and accountability processes that exist within the government process already. I mean, you know, things like the Australian Commission for Law Enforcement Integrity. You know, they have specialised skills to address corruption risks that face law enforcement agencies. We have the Australian Federal Police obviously have a very, very strong role to play in making sure that they deal with issues of fraud and foreign bribery. You know, we have the Commonwealth Ombudsman which is another mechanism which is, is able for investigating um, complaints and, and other things that particularly relate to us as parliamentarians in relation to making sure that we are dealing um, with our expenses, as an example, in an appropriate way. But we are absolutely committed to the integrity of this parliament, and we will not be lying going into the next election like others. But um, as I said, you know, we have a process that exists within this chamber, a process that exists within this chamber that affords the government of the day the control of the order of business of the day. I am tremendously disappointed that Senator Patrick would seek to disrupt that. It goes against everything you stand Minister, for. Here, here. Please resume your seat, Senator Lambie. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Sorry, on um, on a point, Senator it... Lambie, please resume your seat on a point of order. Uh, again, on the clock, Mr. President. I think the debate is expected to expire at 12:35, and the clock just went for to five minutes. So I think the clock should be at a lesser time. Thank you, for your... Senator Lambie. You have the call. Thank you. Uh, it has been 1,076 days since the Liberals promised us an integrity commission. 1,076 days. The PM stood up, told the country that we get an integrity commission in this term of parliament. He told us that he was committed to getting it done. Another lie. That was on the 13th of December 2018. A baby born on that day the prime, that the Prime Minister promised us an integrity commission would, not be, would now be nearly three years of old. Age. That baby has gone through three Christmases and she's coming up to her fourth. She's learned to crawl, to stand up, to walk. She's pretty much getting ready for preschool now and she's probably learning to count. You know what? That baby's made more progress in a thousand days than the Liberal Party have on their own bill. That is where we're at. A three year old. Shameful. Shameful. It's not even a bill, it's a ghost. It's in a whole pretend. It's another lie. Australian people are looking at you. They're sick of your lies. They're sick of you not putting up. They're sick of you not delivering. You do not deliver. You are finished in the next election. You're gone, I can tell you. You may want to get out there with your own boots on and see what your electorates are saying. Because I'll tell you what, you're finished. You're finished in Tasmania. I reckon your two seats there are gone. They're completely gone. Absolutely, and I look forward to doing that. I look forward to running my own candidates in those seats and passing those preferences where they deserve to go, but not to political lies. They're not going there. So make sure the old people in Bass and Braddon enjoy their last few months, because I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> Minister Cash says she can't put up her own government's bill, the bill her government has been sitting on for a thousand days, because she's scared the crossbench will embarrass her. And you're correct. You're correct. We are going to embarrass her because we know it's going to be something that looks like a gummy shark. No teeth. No teeth whatsoever. We know what to expect. She wants to get away with a do-nothing bill that won't fix the problems that are so obvious to so many Australians. She's scared we might fix her bill so that it actually does something and hold you people out there, over there accountable for your actions. How about that? 
going to put the big boy pants on and be held accountable for your actions. My goodness, we're going to act like adults. Yep, that's what we're going to do. So to say that you won't introduce a toothless ICAC because you're worried it'll have some teeth, if you don't want to be embarrassed, here's an idea. Introduce something that's not embarrassing for any of you. Wouldn't that be a lovely Christmas gift for us all this year? That would be just fabulous, absolutely fabulous. Honestly, I have to say you guys over there couldn't run a chook raffle, let alone parliament. That's, I think I really don't need to say much of this because that's pretty much what they're saying out about is on the ground. They're saying how shameful you are and that this is actually making the rest of us look shameful because of your behaviour over there because you're incompetence to get anything done, which does not because of your promises that you fail to deliver, that you've done the whole time you've been up here. Eight years of Liberal stuff I've had to put up with while I've been here, and you've gone from one Prime Minister to another. This is the worst one on record. I've said it out there, and I will continue to say it. He's incompetent, he's not a leader, and I'm enjoying watching him and you fall apart. It's as simple as that. The time for the debate has expired. The question is that the motion to suspend standing orders be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. Aye. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells. Four minutes.
Stop the bells. I'll just give a few moments to ensure that the whips are ready to go. The question is that the motion to suspend standing orders be agreed to. Ayes will pass to the right of the chair, noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart, teller for the ayes. Senator Smith, teller for the noes. There being 25 ayes and 25 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. We return to government business. I call the clerk. So, uh, we may just give senators a moment to resume their seats. I call the clerk. Government Business Notice of Motion No. 1, standing in the name of Senator Rustin, relating to the consideration of disallowance motions. Minister. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. I move the motion. Uh, the question is that the motion be agreed. Oh, no. Yes. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Clerk. Government Business Order of the Day No. 1, Independent National Security Legislation Monitor Amendment Bill 2021, second reading debate. Uh, thank you. Eric. Senator Brett. Mr Acting Deputy President, the debate on this bill was started some two and a half months ago and I made some introductory remarks on the 2nd of September for those interested in following the debate or my remarks. The Independent National Security uh, Legislation Monitor, or INSULAM, is an important part of our security framework, providing the necessary checks and balances. The monitor was established some 11 years ago. The bill seeks to update the role from a part-time position with no staff. The legislation on which the monitor operates clearly needs updating. Now, this bill has uh, five uh, proposals in it. 
It is to enable the independent National Security Legislation Monitor to report on reviews undertaken on their own initiative or own motion inquiries in standalone reports separate to the Insulum's annual reports as currently required. It will clarify the process for an Insulum review following a reference from the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security. It will clarify the reporting arrangements for statutory reviews conducted by the Insulum with the performance of functions and exercise of powers and provide current and former staff of the Insulum with appropriate protections in relation to anything done or omitted to be done by that person in good faith during the course of assisting the Insulum in performing functions or exercising power. The Insulum independently reviews the operation, effectiveness and implications of national security and counter-terrorism laws. The Insulum considers whether the laws contain appropriate protections for individual rights, remain proportionate to terrorism or national security threats, and remain necessary. Other countries deal with these matters as well, and that is why I believe the Anderson report of the UK Investigatory Powers Review has something to offer us. In that report, it is stated, and allow me to quote, and it's a lengthy quote, public consent to intrusive laws depends on people trusting the authorities both to keep them safe and not to spy needlessly on them. Trust in powerful institutions depends not only on those institutions behaving themselves, though that is an essential prerequisite, but on there being mechanisms to verify that they have done so. Such mechanisms are particularly challenging to achieve in the national security field, where potential conflicts between state power and civil liberties are acute, suspicion rife and yet information tightly rationed. Respected independent regulators continue to play a vital and distinguished role, but in an age where trust depends on verification rather than reputation, trust by proxy is not enough. Hence the importance of clear law, fair procedures, rights compliance and transparency." End of quote. Suffice to say, I agree. And the insulum or the monitor plays that very important role in our jurisdiction. And so it is important that this monitor have the capacity to undertake reviews of his or her own volition, of his or her uh, own motion. And similarly, it uh, allows references from the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security. And whilst I serve on the committee, I can at least vouch for everybody else that they take their role extremely seriously, as I would like to think that I do mine. And uh, it is something that we on the committee seek to balance up each and every time when we look at security legislation to ensure that we do get the balance right, that we do protect our fellow Australians from those that would seek to harm us whilst also ensuring that people's civil liberties are protected as much as possible. And in fact, the starting point, Mr Acting Deputy President, has to be the protection of individual rights and civil liberties. And if they are to be in any way diluted, a very strong case needs to be made for that particular authority to uh, be clothed with that power. And that is why, when from time to time such legislation comes forward, its ongoing necessity or its efficaciousness or efficacy, I should say, uh, should be considered, should be monitored and uh, considered by an independent body, a person such as the Insulum. Unfortunate acronym uh, for the person that has that uh, uh, title of the uh, the monitor, but uh, we all know in this place at least uh, what uh, or of whom we speak. 
that uh, the insulin uh, needs to review the operations, and I think that that is something that anybody who is genuinely concerned uh, in this space uh, likes to see. And I'm pleased that the uh, parliamentary joint committee has looked into this, supports these uh, proposals, and also that the government importantly uh, sees the need. Now, there have been some. Uh, equivocations in these areas where the previous monitor has uh, recommended that the Insulin Act be amended to provide for an express power for the insulin to report on a matter or matters within the statutory mandate, but more urgently or particularly than by the annual reports, and the government has accepted that recommendation. The previous insulin uh, also made the recommendation that the Act be amended to require a formal response by the executive government to the insulin reports to be tabled in the parliament within 12 months of those reports. Interestingly enough, a further review in relation to all this uh, came to an alternate view, and it's worth reading that in full. The insulin considers that an important part of the process begun by conducting a review and reporting is the timely response of the government of the day. Given the insulin's ongoing role compared to a royal commission, whose role is over once it has delivered its report, the insulin submitted that it has an interest in considering the implementation of its recommendations. The review agrees with public stakeholders that the government should give appropriate consideration to the rec recommendations of independent experts. The government specifically established the role of the insulin to provide independent expert analysis to it and therefore should consider that analysis and respond to it in a timely manner. However, and this is the important part, however the review considers it would be incongruent with the approach to government responses to parliamentary committee reports to legislate this requirement. There is generally no requirement in legislation for the government to respond to parliamentary committee recommendations. Rather, successive governments have undertaken to respond to parliamentary committee reports, including by way of resolutions. And so that, uh, and that is, I think, on page 293 of uh, that particular further review that I understand was undertaken by a Mr Dennis Richardson uh, some time ago. And so when you have a look at all the competing views, uh, it stands to reason that with some of these matters that are in this bill it, or aren't in this bill, it's a matter of balance, it's a matter of judgment, and there will be men and women of good faith on both sides uh, who would say that there should be more in this bill, there should be less in this bill. But at the end of the day, we have to come to a landing, we have to make a decision, and ultimately what the Australian people want us as a government to do, and which the Liberal National Government is absolutely committed to do, and uh, in fairness to reach out across the chamber, those who are in the alternate government, I am sure would also be committed to do, would be to seek to balance the security of our nation, the security of our individual Australians against uh, any security attack, whilst also balancing the rights and liberties of our fellow Australians. That is what this legislation seeks to do with some other machinery provisions. And, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Betts. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Independent National Security Legislation Monitor Appen Amendment Bill 2021. The Australian Greens will be supporting this bill with the amendments circulated, and I thank Senator Patrick for those amendments. In the Independent National Security Legislation Monitor, the INSULM, is responsible for independently reviewing the operation, effectiveness and implications of national security and counter-terrorism laws. 
This position is absolutely critical because this parliament has passed well over 70 counter-terrorism laws in the last two decades, and often they have never been used. The insulin is the body responsible for considering whether counter-terrorism and intelligence laws contain appropriate protections for individual rights, remain proportionate to terrorism or national security threats, and remain necessary. It's important that the insulin continues to have access to all relevant materials, regardless of national security classification and that they can continue to compel answers to questions and hold public and private hearings. I'm glad that this bill is being amended by the government to provide that the insulin is now a full-time position as opposed to it being a part-time position beforehand. It is quite surprising that regardless of how much intelligence and counter-terrorism legislation this parliament has passed, that the position of the insulin was still a part-time appointment. I'm glad to see this change in this bill. A case of better late than never, but at least it's happening. The Australian Greens are also heartened that there are clearer reporting requirements in this bill and the amendments, particularly requiring the Attorney General providing government responses to insulin annual reports and tabling them in parliament. In conclusion, the Australian Greens will be supporting this bill and the amendments. It's critical that all oversight bodies and mechanisms are given the resources they need to undertake their work. The work of the insulin is absolutely critical. Let's just hope that the government actually listens to the recommendations of the insulin because that's going to be the real test. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Saul. Uh, Senator Mullen. Uh, thank you, Acting uh, Deputy President. Uh, I'm, I'm caught remarkably short today because I'm, I'm normally, I gain a lot of what I can say to the Senate through the fact that the Greens uh, reject the bill. But I thank you, <laughs> Senator Thorpe, for your support of the bill. It leaves me not much to say. Uh, but uh, Senator Thorpe certainly pointed out to us the need when she spoke about the 70 counter-terrorist laws that this country has uh, enacted in the last 20 years. Uh, I don't see it as a failure that those laws have not been used. I see it as an absolute triumph. Uh, laws act both as a deterrent and as a punishment, and I think that's very, very important to realise. Uh, uh, Senator Abetz went through a good deal of the detail of the bill. Uh, as a man who's been on the PJCIS for a very long time, he understands the, the value of this extraordinary uh, committee. And uh, I'll be followed at some stage today by the chair of that committee, uh, a Senator Patterson, who, who will take us down into the real detail of, of, of the bill. And Senator, certainly Senator Abetz gave us a lot of the detail of the bill. Uh, but in the last 24 hours, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, in the last 24 hours we've certainly had national security as a theme. Uh, uh, it, it's been on the agenda as a theme and it's a very, very important theme. It's a very important theme both internally in Australia and as an external activity facing external threats. Uh, in the last 24 hours we've had the High Risk Terrorist Offenders Bill uh, in which we balanced continuous detention orders with extended supervision orders. And this is a manifestation of the flexibility that we need to react to any situation. Uh, extended supervision orders, of course, once a, a, a court becomes involved, can be applied to someone uh, who's been jailed for terrorist offences and is coming out of those offences, uh, is coming out of that detention, uh, but where the, the belief is, the reasonable belief is, that that individual still holds uh, very extreme views and the extended supervision order can be put on for three years. We, we, uh, even before the High Risk Terrorist Offenders Bill, we looked at the Critical Infrastructure uh, Bill and really that's uh, the legislation around critical infrastructure and really to defend ourselves against what is becoming a very, very common activity 
around the world, and that is the attack by uh, unknown people in many occasions, but sometimes, uh, as was pointed out to us by Senator Patterson yesterday, sometimes we know exactly who is doing this to us, why they're doing it and how they're doing it. And what frightens me even more is that where we don't know they have been, they have left the ability to turn things on and off at a time that actually suits them and that they will enact those activities cause those activities to be turned on uh, in, a, in a time of high crisis. So the number of, uh, the number of bills that we have brought into the, the, the parliament indicates that we are, we are dragging Australia into the 21st century. And the dragging that this government has done has been fabulous over the last year since 2013. Uh, even since 9-11, uh, since uh, we have led the world we have been a very, very effective and we have led the world in an awful lot of uh, counter-terrorist legislation, online safety legislation, anti-cyber legislation, which grants to those who have to protect us day and night, it grants to those who have to protect us the tools that they need in order to protect us. And so we recognise that the new situation. We, we've looked, we look back and we see 9/11. We see the attacks in London. We see uh, uh, the attacks in New Zealand. We understand uh, the, the internal threat in countries. We understand the threats which are coming from an external source, but are manifest in, in ransomware, in turning uh, off East Coast uh, gas pipelines, which is a possibility. Water pipelines attacking food companies. We understand all these things, and uh, we're, we're, we've got to move on and start recognising the new situation that we face in a much larger sense. So we're very, very good internally, uh, and we've now got to start recognising what's going on in, in, in relation to our strategic environment. And for 75 years, we have been an extraordinary country. We have the situation that we faced based on our alliances based on our own work, but also a good deal of luck, but based on our alliances, we have enjoyed extraordinary security and great prosperity. Now things are different. Uh, now we have a rising power in our region. In fact, we've got a number of powers in our region—China, Russia, Iran, North Korea—all of whom are rising, three of whom—pick any you like—three of whom are well and truly in the Indo-Pacific in our area. The US is certainly a mighty power and will re remain a mighty power. Uh, but the US has world responsibilities, and it is well and truly time that we looked after ourselves. Internally, I think we are doing exactly that. Internally, and the legislation that gives us power to look after ourselves internally is extraordinary, and we are having great achievements. Externally, we, are, we have started far, far too late, uh, but that doesn't matter. No government, no government since the end of the Vietnam War has done what uh, this government, this coalition government since 2013 has done in relation to external defence. No one has done as well as they have done. So external threats are certainly one thing. We can always do better, and I certainly advocate 24 hours a day that we should do better. Uh, uh, so we continued our record. Today we continue our record of looking at legislation, which is very, very important to us. Uh, and my experience of the PJCIS was, was an, an experience which gave me great faith in the processes within that tremendous committee. Uh, I wish very sincerely that we had the equivalent of the PJCIS instead of the Defence Subcommittee. As the Senate uh, as, as a, a bipartisan report recommended a couple of years ago, that could do in the area of strategy and national security exactly what the PJCIS does in the area of intelligence and lower level security. And the mechanisms that surround intelligence and security in the PJCIS, that surrounds this process and ensures that we balance the greater general good with individual rights is what we're here today to talk about. As Senator Abetz said, the essence is trust, and as the old saying goes, trust and verify. And the background to this bill is that this bill 
amends the Independent National Security Legislation Monitor Act of 2010, the, uh, known as the Insulum Act, to allow the Independent National Security Legislation Monitor uh, to report on own monitor inquiries in standalone reports, clarify the reporting arrangements for the monitor following statutory reviews or referrals, and the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security, and provide a framework for the engagement of staff, uh, including contractors, to assist the monitor. The government, of course, is committed to ensuring Australia has a robust national security and counter-terrorist uh, framework internally and to face internal and external threats. The Independent National Security Legislation Monitor is responsible for regularly assessing Australia's national security and counter-terrorism laws to ensure they remain appropriate to the current threat environment and that the objective of protecting national security is balanced against upholding the rights and freedoms of individuals. This bill will clarify reporting arrangements for the monitor and provide a framework for the engagement of staff, as I said before, to assist the monitor. The bill implements recommendations made by the former monitor and by the 2019 Comprehensive Review of the Legal Framework of the National Intelligence Community, which the government accepted. Passage of the bill will ensure that the monitor's enabling legislation reflects the current operation of the position and assists the monitor in the performance of this role. Uh, Acting Deputy President, I recommend this bill to the Senate. Thank you. Senator Patterson. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Independent National Security Legislation Monitor Amendment Bill 2021, and I do so as one of the primary customers of the important work done by the office uh, as the chair of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security. At the outset, I want to pick up on a theme of some of the other contributions to this debate so far, in particular to the last two contributions that I listened to from Senator Molan and Senator Thorpe, and a particular data point that has been bandied about in this debate and is common in debates about national security legislation, which is to refer to the number uh, of pieces of legislation which have passed in this space. Uh, the statistic that Senator Thorpe uh, referred to and Senator Mullen echoed was 70 counter-terrorism uh, pieces of legislation that have passed in the last 20 years. Sometimes that number is higher by incorporating a broader category of legislation, of all national security legislation. Sometimes it's 120 or 130 bills. Now, I'm not accusing either senator in this case of using that in a pejorative sense, but some people do say it's almost a problem in and of itself that we have passed so many national security bills in the last 20 years. I think, uh, to the contrary, it reflects the very different operating environment that we now exist in, the very different security environment and the different trends that we're dealing with in terrorism, as well as espionage and foreign interference and other threats. And I think it's very important to place that number of bills in context. Uh, yes, that's a large number of pieces of legislation, but included among those pieces of legislation are oversight and scrutiny bills that make sure that those bills are exercised proportionately and consistent with the law, and we're dealing with one of those today. And I haven't done a tally. Perhaps I will ask the hardworking staff at the Parliamentary Library to do this for me. But if you counted the number of Treasury law amendment bills passed in the last 20 years, I suspect it would be a lot more than 120 or 130. I suspect, given that we deal with one on almost a weekly basis through this chamber, it would be in the many, many hundreds. And what we see in the national security space, which I'll outline in a minute, is a very robust framework of parliamentary oversight, executive oversight and independent oversight of those powers and of those bills as it should be, because many of them are rights restrictive and we should ensure the right balance is struck between our liberties and our safety and security. My regret is that that robust oversight framework that we have in the national security space is not replicated more widely in other areas of parliamentary life, that other areas of legislation are not subject to the rigorous scrutiny and oversight that we have in the national security space, because it is not only laws in the national security space which can restrict our rights or which impact on our freedoms or which impose costs 
on business and community and society. Many other laws do that. And so I think, in fact, what we have in the national security space is the gold standard, and we should seek to raise up other areas of public policy to that gold standard of scrutiny. The Morrison government has consistently displayed a clear commitment to safeguarding Australia and the Australian people by passing many critical pieces of national security legislation. And we saw two of those bills pass through this chamber last night, uh, the Security of Critical Infrastructure Bill and the High Risk Terrorist Offenders Bill, two very important initiatives to better secure and safeguard Australia against cyber threats in particular and to seek to deal with the problem of unreformed, unrecidivist uh, high-risk terrorist offenders whose sentences are expiring and pose an ongoing risk to, risk to the community if they are released. One of those bills, the High-Risk Terrorist Offenders Bill, actually demonstrates quite powerfully the importance of the insulum itself, because it was out, arising out of an insulum review and insulum recommendations that the extended supervision order enacted by this parliament last night in that bill was proposed to fill a gap in the legislative framework. What the public doesn't always see, though, they do often see and are often aware of those new bills and those new powers that are granted to our agencies. What they don't always see, however, is that robust oversight and scrutiny process that is applied to these bills that seek to ensure that they are proportionate, that they are targeted and that they are operationally effective for our security agencies. The Office of the Independent National Security Legislation Monitor is a critical contributor to that framework. It complements the work of the Inspector General on Intelligence and Security, the PJCIS and the Executive Oversight to ensure that the significant powers we entrust to our agencies are subject to the scrutiny that you would expect of a liberal democracy which values freedom and the rights of the individual. The Monitor is responsible for regularly assessing Australia's national security and counter-terrorism laws to ensure that they remain appropriate to the current threat environment and that the objective of protecting national security is balanced against upholding the rights and freedoms of individuals. In conducting their reviews, the Monitor has access to all relevant material, regardless of the national security classification, that they can compel answers to questions, that they can hold public and private hearings. This bill amends the Insulum Act to clarify the reporting arrangements for the Monitor and further provides a new framework for the engagement of additional staff who can support the vital work of the Monitor. These amendments respond to recommendations made by the immediate previous Monitor, Dr James Renwick CSC SC, and are particularly important and timely when we consider the breadth and complexity of the national security threats we are responding to in this uncertain time and, therefore, the legislation that is required and the operational capability that is required to meet those threats. These changes will also ensure that the Monitor is properly equipped with the right resources to undertake their role and fulfil their obligation to ensure that our counter-terrorism and national security legislation remains fit for purpose and also consistent with our international obligations. As it currently stands, the Monitor can conduct own motion reviews on specific legislative matters and must also conduct specific statutory reviews referred to it by the Attorney-General or by the Prime Minister. The Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security can also refer matters to the Monitor, which the Monitor may choose to take up as an own motion inquiry. When this role was established back in 2010, it was envisaged that the Monitor would only undertake one review a year. The bill reflects the evolving nature of the role and would allow the Monitor to report on own motion inquiries in standalone reports, separate to the annual reports authored by the Monitor, and clarifies the review and reporting arrangements for statutory reviews, own motion reviews and reviews conducted after referral from the PJCIS. The Office of the Monitor is currently supported by three permanent employees of the Attorney-General's Department. This bill provides for formalised arrangements by amending the Insulum Act to allow for the engagement of additional staff, including specialised contractors, to assist the Monitor with the exercise of powers, drafting and reviewing of reports and the performance of other functions that are required. The Attorney-General has made clear that the appropriate conflict of interest policies and practices must be developed and implemented to ensure the engagement of appropriate staff, including contractors. This is very important when you consider how critical it is for the Office of the Monitor to maintain its independence from any agency or organisation who may be affected by or who has an interest in a particular inquiry. 
The Attorney General has tasked the Insulum to develop that framework to ensure these amendments can be implemented once passed in this place. Finally, the bill brings the appropriate protections for current and former staff of the monitor in line with the arrangements for the staff of other statutory oversight uh, office holders, such as the Commonwealth Ombudsman and the Inspector General of Intelligence and Security. These protections extend only to acts and omissions done by that person in good faith while assisting the monitor in the performance or exercise of their powers. I want to personally acknowledge the importance of the office of the monitor. As chair of the PJCIS, I welcome the insight and depth of knowledge that the monitor has been able to provide, which ultimately assists us in our own deliberations, and it is often common for us to make recommendations consistent with those made by the insulin. There have been four monitors since the inception of the role. Mr Brett Walker, SC, the Hon Roger Giles, AOQC, Dr James Renwick, CSC, SC, and the current monitor, Mr Grant Donaldson, SC. I thank each of them for their commitment and their professionalism in that role and pay tribute to their service to the cause of safeguarding Australia's national security interests as well as our individual rights and freedoms. I commend to parliamentarians and others interested in oversight of our national security architecture a recent special edition of the Australian Law Journal on national security and the law, which was edited by Dr Renwick. Uh, for those of you who are a bit more time poor, uh, perhaps a podcast released last week by Professor Rory Medcalf of the National Security College at ANU, which interviewed Dr Renwick about uh, that special edition. And it really provides an excellent insight into the role of the insulin and wider national security policy issues. One of the things that Dr Renwick noted was the great value for money that Commonwealth taxpayers got of his time, given that he was only theoretically supposed to spend 100 days of the year on this role, but ended up spending much more. And this bill will help address, address that issue for all uh, current and future monitors. The government acknowledges and appreciates the monitor's ongoing role in reviewing the proportionality the operational effectiveness and the implications of our national security and counterterrorism laws. We are committed to ensuring there is an appropriate oversight framework that ensures that agencies remain accountable and that laws remain targeted, and the monitor plays a critical role in ensuring the integrity of that framework. This bill underlines that commitment and ensures the Office of the Monitor is appropriately resourced and equipped with fit-for-purpose enabling legislation to allow them to exercise their functions and powers effectively. I commend the bill and urge the Senate to support its passage. Thank you, Senator Patterson. Minister. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I thank my parliamentary colleagues for their contributions to the debate on the Independent National Security Legislation Monitor Amendment Bill. This bill reflects the government's ongoing commitment to ensuring Australia has a robust national security and counterterrorism framework. It will assist the Independent National Security Legislation Monitor, also known as the Insulum, in the performance of their role, helping to ensure Australia's counterterrorism and national security legislation remains necessary, appropriate and proportionate. The bill implements recommendations made by the former monitor and the 2019 comprehensive review of the legal framework of the national intelligence community to allow the monitor to report on matters more urgently or more particularly than in their annual report. The additional amendments moved by the government will ensure appropriate reporting and staffing arrangements for the um, insulin, ensuring they are able to effectively execute their important oversight role. Um, I'll go some more into those during the committee stage, um, but at this stage can I thank my colleagues across the chamber for their support of these important measures. Thank you, Minister. I'll now put the question. The question is that the bill be read a second time. Those that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Uh, as amendments have been circulated, the Senate will now move into the Committee of the Whole. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There have been no objection. It is so ordered. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Minister. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Um, I table a supplementary explanatory memorandum relating to the government amendments to be moved to this bill. And on that very subject, I seek leave to move amendments 1 to 7 on sheet ZC 104. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you.
Thank you. Um, the amendments on sheet ZC104 will ensure appropriate reporting and staffing arrangements for the insulin. Um, I'll go into a little depth on each of those. Um, the first of those two amendments would clarify that the requirement for the monitor to give emphasis to legislation that has been recently applied or considered does not apply where the monitor is conducting a statutory review or a special report. This requirement is relevant for the monitor's annual reporting function or a decision to undertake an own initiative review, but it's not required for statutory reviews and special reports because, um, in a practical sense, those reports could cut across financial years. So it really is a matter of um, administration and organisation more than anything else. And the second of the amendments would allow the monitor to be appointed on a full-time basis and provide that a new monitor must be appointed as soon as reasonably practical, practicable following the position becoming vacant. When the position was established in 2010, it was envisaged that the monitor would only undertake a single review per year. The role has since evolved, shifting from doing point-in-time assessments um, through annual reports to engaging in rolling reviews, including referred reviews and statutory reviews um, that are much more burdensome on the insulin's time. This amendment would enable the potential for full-time appointments in the future should such a course be necessary. It would, of course, not affect the current part-time appointment of the current monitor, Mr Grant Donaldson of Senior Council, who is appointed until November 2023. Um, there are a couple of other amendments I'll touch on briefly. Um, amendments 3, 4, 5 and 6 would provide that monitor reports must be tabled in Parliament within 15 sitting days or 30 calendar days after receipt of a report, whichever is earlier. Um, at the moment, the requirement is for tabling to occur within 15 sitting days. Um, these um, are about striking a balance on getting um, an appropriate time frame for the release of reports. And Amendment 7 would provide that a person may only assist the monitor with the written agreement of the monitor and that the monitor may withdraw that agreement at any time. The purpose of this amendment is to confirm that the monitor has discretion and control in relation to staff who are assisting him or her. To support the staffing provisions to be introduced by the bill, um, the minister has asked the monitor to develop appropriate conflict, conflict of interest policies and practices to provide a framework for the engagement of staff particularly where the monitor is unable to complete a review without the assistance of an employee of an agency which is um, either affected by or has an interest in a particular inquiry. Um, I will say a few things about um, the amendment that I understand uh, will be moved in due course by um, Senator Patrick, but um, for the benefit of the chamber, that's the purposes of the government's amendments to the bill. The question is that the amendments... Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, could I draw to, uh, to, to your attention the state of the chamber, please? Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Quorum required. Ring, ring the bells.
Quorum present. Senator Brown. Labor supports the government amendments. The shadow attorney general approached the governor general with a number of suggestions to improve the bill several months ago, and Senator Cash has engaged constructively with Labor on those suggestions and ultimately agreed to many of the amendments sought by the shadow attorney general, either in whole or in part. Moreover, why two of Labor's suggestions were rejected by the government, in both cases the Attorney General agreed to workable compromises. I would like to thank the Attorney General for working with the opposition to improve the bill in the national interest. In addition to making some minor technical but nonetheless useful changes to the Independent National Security and Monitor Act, the amendments agreed between the government and Labor would do the following. First, the tabling requirements for reports by the independent monitor will be amended so that reports must be tabled within the, within the earlier of 30 calendar days or 15 sitting days of receipt by the Attorney General. This will ensure that reports by the monitor will be made public much sooner than is currently the case. Second, Australian public servants and other potential employees can only be made available to the independent monitor with the monitor's agreement, and that agreement can be revoked at any time. It is important that the monitor is independent and is seen to be independent of the government. That is the principle that this amendment is designed to uphold. Third, the Independent National Security Monitor Act will be amended to enable the monitor to be appointed on a full-time basis. Labor supports these amendments. Okay, there have been no other speakers. Okay, I put that the amendments be agreed to. Um, all those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Senator Patrick. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Oh, sorry, uh, Mr. Mr. Chair. Sorry. Um, I, uh, I seek leave to move. Uh, Amendments uh, one to four together by leave on sheet uh, uh, 1424. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Okay, thank you. Uh, listen, I, I was going to speak to this uh, uh, to, to my amendment. Uh, basically, my amendment flows from recommendations that have that have been made by the Insulin himself uh, over many different reports, uh, and indeed spurred on by the uh, Law Council, who were quite concerned about the fact that uh, Insom makes his reports, but then uh, they go to government and uh, he doesn't get a response. So I'll just draw the Chamber's attention to uh, Dr. Okay. Dr. James Renwick, SC, or CSC SC, uh, who, in his, uh, in his uh, report number six, uh, December of 2018, uh, uh, basically made uh, a re reference to uh, a law council submission to the PJCIS and it said he said in his report in its submission the law council noted that government responses to insulin reports and implementation of recommendations has been ad hoc the law council recommends that the independent national security legislation monitor act 2010 be amended to require formal and prompt government responses to the insulin reports for example, within 12, uh, six to 12 months. Now, of course, uh, the uh, Insulum uh, looked at that uh, and uh, basically made a similar recommendation. Um, he said, uh, the question is whether the Law Council recommendation should be implemented. In my view, it should, was what he said. Uh, he then said, went on to say it's an important part of the process uh, of conducting a review um, uh, to have timely responses from the government. He made a point of distinction between Insulum and the Royal Commission and saying that the, the latter, the Royal Commission, once they've delivered the report, it is functus officio. Its role is over and it is no role or legal interest in considering re uh, implementation of the recommendations. Uh, in contrast, he said, I have an ongoing role which, which the parliament has itself provided for to continue to monitor counterterrorism and national security laws. So he's making the point that uh, he, he, in order to be able to continue to do his job, he, he expects some form of response from uh, the government. And uh, I'll, I'll turn to describe, therefore, uh, my amendments. Uh, Senator Patrick, it's now 1.30. So um, thank you for your 
courtesy to the chamber. It being 1.30, the committee reports progress. Pursuant to order, I now call upon Senator's two-minute statement. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. And today I rise to offer huge congratulations to the amazing workers at the Country Road Warehouse in Truganina. Mostly women, they were earning less than the male warehouse workers doing the same work and just above the minimum wage. And they decided that that just wasn't right. On strike for almost two weeks and standing up for their basic rights, I visited them on Friday to show my support. I told them I would tell their story in parliament and I'm proud to do so right now. I'm also proud to convey that these women uh, this week have won their campaign and voted to support a new deal, a new deal that respects their contribution to the success of Country Road, a deal that acknowledges that it is their work while everyone else is asleep that makes it possible for Country Road stores to operate. It is their work that keeps this business running. These women wanted recognition of that contribution, but they did feel disrespected, and so they spoke out and they walked out. Going on strike is always a last resort. It's always incredibly tough to do. The women that I met on Friday spoke of doing this for their families, to be able to support their children and also to show their children that in Australia, standing up for what is right is always the right thing to do. So with that determination, these courageous members of the United Workers' Union won an increased pay rise, more permanent ongoing jobs, same job, same pay for all workers at the warehouse, and respect. Respect from their families, respect from the company, respect from the community and they won my respect as well. And I'd particularly like to give a shout out to Lydia and Kate for telling me their stories uh, and a huge congratulations to you both. Senator Mc McMahon. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise today to speak about the appalling state in the Northern Territory of the vaccine mandates inflicted upon Territorians by the Gunner Labor government. In the Northern Territory, anybody who has a job, who has contracts, who has a business uh, cannot work unless they're vaccinated or they are someone who works from home and never sees another human being during the course of their day. Um, Mr Gunner went on yesterday to say that anyone who does not support vaccine mandates are anti-vaxxers. So this means he is calling the Prime Minister, the Deputy Prime Minister and the entire government anti-vaxxers, which is clearly not the truth. He also went on to say, and I quote, that anyone who gives, gives comfort to or support anybody who argues against the vaccines is an anti-vaxxer. This is disgusting, this is un-Australian and this is unterritorian. This means that he is labelling people anti-vaxxers if they give comfort to or support anyone who does not wish to be vaccinated. This covers thousands of individuals and people out on Indigenous communities who have chosen not to be vaccinated, and other Territorians who, for various reasons, choose not to be. Now, there are many Territorians who choose not to be vaccinated, not because they're being belligerent, not because they're being difficult, but because they have a genuine fear and terror of being vaccinated. Now, I might feel that their fears are unreasonable and unfounded, uh, but to them they are real. Uh, fears and phobias are not rational or logical. Most people who are terrified of planes have never been in a plane crash. Most people who are afraid of spiders have never been bitten by a spider. And most people who are afraid of heights have never fallen from a great one. Yet their fears are just as real. Senator Rice. and said that he would introduce legislation to protect students from expulsion because of their sexuality. He lied. We are still waiting. And instead, the Prime Minister has spent years in secret meetings with the religious right. And what's the outcome? We still haven't found out, which is fitting, because for years the negotiations over the Religious Discrimination Bill have been secret 
and the updated text of that bill is still secret now. The only thing that hasn't been a secret is that Scott Morrison cannot be trusted to do the right thing for women, for disabled people, for LGBTIQA plus people and for people of minority faiths. Based on what we know about the proposed legislation, we're really concerned about the clause that would specify that statements of belief don't constitute discrimination, which would ride roughshod over our existing anti-discrimination frameworks at both federal and state and territory level. The Australian Discrimination Law Experts Group said about the statement of belief in the previous draft that it would enable a whole range of awful situations. They said that the currently unlawful situations under state and territory laws that would li likely become lawful if based on a religious belief included an employer telling a transgender employee that their gender identity is against the laws of God, a childcare provider stating to a single mother that they are evil for depriving their child of a father, a receptionist at a medical practice telling a person with a disability that they've been given their disability by God so that they can learn important lessons, or a waiter in a cafe saying to a client that they would pray for their sins if it to a gay couple. That's the Australia that Scott Morrison apparently wants to bring about. Our laws should be protecting people equally. No one should be discriminated against on the basis of who they are, who they love or what they believe Senator in. Brown. Prostate cancer was the most commonly diagnosed cancer among Australian men in 2020, with an estimated 16,741 diagnosed with prostate cancer and 3,152 men dying of prostate cancer. I recently had the opportunity to be briefed on a very concerning issue, that being Australian men who have higher risk prostate cancer being denied access to a treatment known as low-dose rate brachytherapy boost via the MBS. This is due to a decision made by MSAC in 2019 to reject the extension of the indication of this treatment on the NBS. What is concerning to me is not only has the treatment been available on the NBS for men with lower risk cancer for the last 20 years, but in 2017 a world-leading clinic, clinical study known as Ascend RT showed a greater than 20% reduction in cancer control, which effectively means the prostate cancer is cured. No other clinical trial has shown such a significant patient benefit. Based on this study, the USA, Canada, UK and leading European nations updated their clinical guidelines such that low-dose rate brachytherapy for men with higher risk prostate cancer is now available. For example, in the UK it is available at no cost through the NHS. So the obvious question is, is this. Why are men in Australia being denied access to this treatment when other leading nations have provided public access to men in their countries? Why is it that men in the US, Canada, UK and other European nations can access this treatment, but for men in Australia only some can access the treatment if they can afford to pay up to $25,000 privately? This is a serious issue, and I would ask that Minister Hunt Make, this, make his own inquiries as to why Australian men with higher risk prostate cancer are being left behind. Senator Roberts. Thank you. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I totally reject the concept that the government mislabels as a national cabinet. It's a fallacy. It's an artificial fabrication. National cabinet is not recognised under the constitution and has no particular authority or decision-making power. The name sounds grand, yet is nothing more than a meeting of the Prime Minister and State and Territory Premiers and Chief Ministers. Nothing that's agreed upon is enforceable because it came out of the meeting. Recent decisions of Premiers, which run contrary to supposedly agreed positions made at National Cabinet meetings about border happenings, clearly exemplify this. It's akin to the decisions that come out of COAG under a different name. This government has tried to assert that documents or information related to National Cabinet discussions should be considered immune to public interest claims for disclosure and transparency, because they may reveal cabinet deliberations immune to claims under freedom of information legislation. This is fallacious. Cabinet deliberations are protected from freedom of information claims. National cabinet, though, is a pretend concept, is not a body of cabinet, and therefore is not protected from freedom of information claims and subsequent scrutiny of its decisions and actions. This was considered in the recent Administrative Appeals Tribunal decision of Patrick and Secretary 
Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, Freedom of Information, where Justice White held that National Cabinet is not a committee of the, Nas of the Commonwealth Covenant, and its documents and records are not to be considered as an official record of a committee of the Ca Commonwealth Cabinet for the purposes of the Freedom of Information of Act 1982. The government's discussions and data about the mismanagement of COVID-19 are glaringly absent from the public eye. One Nation will always support transparency in government and condemns the government for trying to hide considerations that clearly are in the public interest and should not be shamefully kept secret. Thank you. Senator Bragg. I think everyone in this place can agree that the creation of the Australian Senate Committee some 51 years ago has established a benchmark where Australians can have their say in the democratic process through access to the Senate. And we are going to consider at some stage in this chamber motions to try and cancel the usual inquiries that these committees would make. Now, it is perfectly reasonable uh, that where taxpayer funds are expended, that the Senate will take a role in ensuring that those taxpayer funds are expended properly or that the agency is adhering to its legislative duties. And that is exactly what the Communications and Environment Committee is proposing to do when it looks at the complaints handling function of the ABC and the SBS. Now, people have said, well, why do you need to have this inquiry when the ABC itself has said that it would have its own? I mean, there are effectively two key reasons. And those reasons are that the Senate can afford witnesses legal privilege, and there are people that want to come forward that want to have legal privilege because they are afraid of doing this without privilege because of the financial burden. The ABC has spent $26 million in the past four years on legal fees alone. And the second uh, point is that people want to have their say at a public hearing. So the idea that the Senate will deny people a say, Australians a say, over a very run-of-the-mill process, which is the complaints handling function of a broadcasting corporation, a public broadcaster, which has nothing to do with editorial independence, I think would set a shocking precedent. And we should be committed to always maximising opportunities for Australians to have their say about public institutions and how they're run. Senator Griff. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Everyone in this place knows the power of money in politics. Everyone knows how donations provide access to our elected representatives. And everyone knows how political donations buy influence in policy and legislation. We know because we've seen it time and time again. And I worry we are seeing it again with the Food Standards Australia New Zealand, known as FSANS, FSANS is a small agency that plays a big role in regulating food ingredients and labelling. It is very important work. And it recently proposed pregnancy warning labels on alcohol, an initiative that would help prevent future cases of things like fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. This was opposed by two responsible ministers, Senator Colbeck and Mr Litterpriad. But they likely didn't oppose it because it was bad policy. They likely didn't oppose it because of the cost. They likely opposed it because the alcohol industry did not want health warnings on their products. Two weeks after the FSANS proposed a compromise, the ministers launched a review that could strip FSANS of its powers. And it wasn't long before the chair and the CEO were both out the door, the chair and the CEO. The circumstances of their departures are very much unclear. I can't help but wonder if they were pushed. There are three important questions we need answered, and we need them answered quickly. Has the independence of FSANS been compromised? Is the government working to benefit the health of Australians or the alcohol industry's profitability? And most importantly, is the government working in the public interest or their own self-interest. Senator Pratt. Yet again, we have a Morrison government that can't be trusted to tell Australian industry the truth. The latest example, in addition to the naval 
submarine backflip is the revelation in Senate estimates that the Pacific support vessels slated to be built in Australia and most likely in WA will now be bought secondhand overseas. This is despite WA industry having geared up for the work. These are Australian businesses ready to do the work, being passed over by their own government. Just like industry has been passed over with the dropping of the French attack class submarines that were to be built here. Now with the AUKUS submarine announced, there's another set of soft promises. Where are they going to come from? We know American shipbuilding yards used to manufacture nuclear submarines are operating beyond their capacity. No tenders, no timelines, expressions of interest and certainly no contracts. The, the problem is the same in Britain. The security problems associated with nuclear technology, including transport, means it is extremely difficult to see orca submarines actually being built here. We desperately need a solution to both the skills, industry and defence and the capability gap that we're about to jump headlong into. We need a solution made in Australia. Senator Patrick. Oh, sorry. I, uh, I, I miss Senator Smith and I'll come to you, Senator Patrick. Sorry. Thank you very Senator much. Senator Smith, I didn't Mr. see Acting you. Deputy President. I rise to acknowledge an inspiring and very successful local charity in Western Australia by, based just five minutes from my electorate office at Wangara in Perth's northern suburbs. Wheelchairs for Kids was founded in 1998 and is a group of West Australian volunteers that produce wheelchairs for impoverished children around the world, many of them living with disabilities caused by disease or war. It cannot be overstated how life-changing these wheelchairs are for the children who receive them and for, the, and for their families and communities. In many cases, they would have no other way of receiving an adequate wheelchair that enables them to live a full life with the freedom of mobility. I visited Wheelchairs for Kids Production Centre recently with my colleague, the member for Moore, Mr Ian Goodenough, where we saw firsthand the love and dedication shown by these volunteers. I sincerely thank them for the time they spend giving so much attention and thorough professionalism to what is a very, very important local and global charity. The volunteers work tirelessly to produce wheelchairs that meet global standards with the latest model including postural supports, harness, a tray, waterproof cushion and even a soft plush toy for children to enjoy. A wheelchair is produced for every $200 that's donated. Reaching more than 90 locations in 70 countries, Wheelchairs for Kids produced their 50,000th wheelchair in August this year, a truly remarkable milestone. It's also important to note that one of the major sponsors and supporters of Wheelchairs for Kids is the Rotary Club of Scarborough, with many of the wheelchairs produced by Wheelchairs for Kids produced by Rotary members. A visit, not long, long, a visit not long ago to my own Rotary Club of Perth reminded me of how Rotarians across our state, indeed across Australia, embody the best of community values, that value of selflessness. It's certainly an ethos shared by those at Wheelchairs for Kids, and I and many others applaud them for their fantastic charity work. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Cinemas have done it tough throughout, uh, throughout COVID. They were closed during lockdowns. They were limited in their capacity when they were finally allowed to open up due to social distancing requirements. There's, of course, also an apprehension about going into cinemas uh, uh, small rooms with uh, a lot of other people. And finally, very hard to get uh, movies, uh, blockbuster movies, to, to display in circumstances where the United States was closed down or Europe was closed down, so quite affected by uh, circumstances in other countries. So when JobKeeper end, I advocated for and the government provided $20 million in funding uh, in a screen fund to assist these cinema operators. $9.8 million of money was uh, distributed. Unfortunately, what's happened since is we've had lockdowns in both Victoria and New South Wales. Uh, and whilst in South Australia there weren't any lockdowns, again, distributors wouldn't release movies. Why are they going to release movies to, to a small market in South Australia uh, that undermines openings in uh, Victoria and New South Wales. So 
we've got cinemas that are really struggling. We heard, unfortunately, uh, uh, yesterday that Wallace uh, uh, Cinemas at, Je at Jeps, Jeps Cross, the uh, drive-in cinema, uh, is going to have to close. Now, there's $10.2 million sitting in a fund approved for cinemas, and the government's refusing to release that. In circumstances where they gave $13 billion away to companies that didn't need it, now we've got cinemas who desperately need it and they won't give it to them. They've let them get all the way through COVID and now they're going to let them fail, and that is just stupid. Stupid, stupid, stupid. Senator Ayres. Thanks, uh, Mr Acting uh, Deputy President. Well, last week we saw again the consequences of the weakness of this Prime Minister. We saw the cost. Violent demonstrations led by fascists, in some cases led by self-avowed neo-Nazis, nooses, threats, political violence. These aren't demonstrations. It is terrorism when the lives of members of parliament and senators are threatened. And this Prime Minister couldn't bring himself to condemn those threats or that violence or those demonstrations. Indeed, there were MPs and senators from this place who supported that activity. And that has real consequences for the future of our democracy. Now, the Prime Minister, there's always a but with this bloke. It's very difficult to understand where this weakness comes from. Is it self-interest because he's currying the favour and the votes of extremists? Is it self-interest because he wants the preferences of extremist political parties who will be out there with Senator Rennick and Senator Canavan and Mr Christensen out there with all of the conspiracy theories? frightening ordinary people, does he want their support? Is it weakness because he's frightened of the five senators whose weak threats to stop legislation in the Senate will probably come to nothing? Uh, or is it because he's weak on extremist politics? Well, this bloke has got to go. Senator Wish Wilson. Senator Wish Wilson, can you hear us? You calling me, Chair? Yes, I'm calling you. Right You're on. Have you ever seen someone snorkel in a mud pit? That's what it feels like watching this Prime Minister trying to tackle corruption. I think we all agree. The only politician who fears a corruption watchdog is a corrupt politician. So it stands to reason that the only political party that fears establishing a corruption watchdog is a corrupt political party. It's been 1,075 days since this government promised to establish an independent commission against corruption at the last election. The Greens tabled a bill to establish exactly this, which passed the Senate nearly two years ago. We've been campaigning in this place and outside this place for such a body for over two decades. No one has been more consistent or courageous on this than the Greens. But the government has refused to bring on the Greens bill in the House. Why? Because the story of the poor excuse for this government is a litany of lies, deceit, scandals, rorts, rip-off and corruption. More than half of the LNP cabinet have been embroiled in some scandal or another. So no wonder the Prime Minister, Mr Scott Morrison, won't bring on a, this bill for a debate, this Greens bill, because it may end up losing government if it did. That won't wash with Australians, who are increasingly seeing the LNP as a protection racket more than a political party and not just for each other, also for their big donors, such as in the fossil fuel industry. 
We urgently need political donation reform if we're going to clean up politics. This is the most corrupt government in our history. Bring on the election. It's Thank time you. to turf them out. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Senator O'Sullivan. I'm proud today to speak in support of the More Than Mining campaign, which is designed to give individuals and small employers in regional Australia the same tax treatment that our biggest companies enjoy in relation to housing. Nowhere is this reform more desperately needed than in the Pilbara region in Western Australia. The boom-bust of the Pilbara real estate cycle is legendary, with fluctuations of over 50 per cent when the swing cycles. In Port Hedland, <clears throat> people regularly pay over $1,000 a week for a Fibro 3x1. That's over $50,000 a year for an entry-level house. This is prohibitive not only for those working in the mining industry, uh, but everyone else within the community. Unless you're working for a mining industry company who provides you a house, you really don't get to get ahead. If a big company pays for staff housing, it is a business expense and therefore it can be wholly written off. A regional worker that salary sacrifices for their mortgage only enjoys a 50 per cent write-off. I believe that this should be extended to 100 per cent, even if only as a trial to encourage more people to put down roots and call the regions their home. Fringe benefit tax was never meant to capture remote housing. The Regional Australia Institute estimates that for every 100,000 Australians who choose to live in growing regional cities rather than our big five cities, an additional 50 billion will be released into the economy over 30 years in reduced congestion costs and increased consumption. This reform will work towards this, and I commend this campaign to all senators. Senator Sheldon. Senator Sheldon. Senator Sheldon. Today, in workplaces across Australia, there are hundreds of thousands of Australians working for labour hire firms. Many are being ripped off. They're paid 24 to 40 per cent less than the directly employed colleagues doing the exact same work. And unlike Mr Morrison, who spent $500,000 of taxpayers' money in legal fees to defend this dodgy practice in the courts, unlike Mr Morrison, who passed laws earlier this year to protect this labour hire casual rort, Labor believes this is fundamentally wrong. Labor knows that it's at odds with the Australian principle of a fair go. So yesterday, Labor leader Anthony Albanese introduced a bill in the House to enshrine a very basic right of law. Same job, same pay. That means if you work for a Labor hire firm, you're entitled to at least the same pay that a direct employee of the company receives for the exact same work. It ends a loophole used by companies like BHP and Qantas to use labour hire firms to undercut the pay of their own employees. It will protect workers in mining, transport, aged care and disability care, health care and manufacturing, and the list goes on. The Morrison government is fiercely opposed to this bill. They wanted to protect the labour hire rort. But unlike Mr Morrison and those opposite, who to pretend to be on the side of workers and then come to Canberra and vote against them time and time again, Labor is standing up and fighting for working Australians. Only an Albanese government, Labor government, will stand up for Labor hire workers. Only an Albanese Labor government will put same job, same pay into law. Senator Lyons. President, well, we've seen the latest stunt by the Morrison government as it intends to introduce legislation into this place which will seek to disenfranchise voters. Now, they're doing it by saying it's going to uh, rule out rorts. Well, of course it won't. Whatever form of ID you take to a polling booth, if indeed the legislation gets here and gets through the Senate, um, we don't have a, a, 
automatic voting. We use paper rolls, so you, you can still vote as many times as you like. But the reality is we don't have a problem with our democracy in this country. We don't have a problem with our voting system, and yet those over there are so desperate to cling to power, they think by disenfranchising First Nations people, the elderly, people from uh, non-English speaking backgrounds will somehow enable them to cling to power. Well, it won't because Australians have seen through them and can't Senator wait Lyons. to vote them out. It being 2 p.m., we will move to question time. Senator Lambie, I believe you are seeking the call. Yes, Mr. President, I seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, this morning, Senator Roberts leaked my personal mobile phone number on his social media. Since then, I've received any number of nasty, abusive and threatening phone calls and messages. I may have to change my phone number. I give my phone number to veterans whose mental health is not so good, and most of the time they're on their last legs. Those veterans know they can call me at any time of the day or night if they need someone to listen to them. If you've got someone's number, it's not hard to find out personal details that are linked to it. I'm going to have to change my phone number because I need to make sure my family and friends are safe. Mr President, it should go without saying that it is completely unacceptable to leak other senators' personal contact details to the public just because you don't like what they're saying. Every single one of us, no matter how much we disagree with one another, no matter how much we go at each other on the floor, we should know, one, we should know that one thing. One nation have crossed a line here that should never be crossed. You've got the AFP briefing politicians about our safety. We've got gallows on the steps of Victoria's parliament. And senators in this very chamber should not be facilitating any abuse. Mr President, I'd like to respectfully ask that you look at this issue. One Nation have leaked my mobile number. I ask you to consider whether Senator Roberts should front up and apologise for his behaviour, even though he's had more than two hours to do it personally to me. And I ask that you look at the safety of senators in this place more broadly, because I think we have some problems here. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Lambie. I, I will take that matter under consideration. Uh, I understand that Senator Roberts is seeking the call. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr. President. Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. Thank you. Yesterday, Senator Lambie said that people make decisions— oh, Sorry, you will need to seek leave, Senator Roberts. I seek leave to make a short statement, two-minute statement. Is leave granted? Leave, leave is not granted, Senator Roberts. Sen Senator Wong. Make a short statement. Is leave granted? There being no objection. I, I thank the government, and I, I, I want to respond briefly to Senator Lambie, and we, we, grant, we would grant leave to the Leader of the Government to do the same. When Senator Cormann left this place in the valedictory we, we had, I spoke about the importance of containment of conflict. And I made this comment. I said, we fight here, but there must be limits. There must be containment, because conflict without limits risks destroying too much. It risks damaging the polity, the people, the community, the institution too much. And I would add to that today, it risks the safety of colleagues and the safety of Australians. Uh, this is why Labor has been so critical of the Prime Minister's refusal to unequivocally condemn violence and violent extremists. This is, it was an abject failure of leadership. What I would say to the government and to One Nation is if you start a fire, it can quickly overwhelm us. And I urge the government senators and the leader of the government to unequivocally condemn what One Nation has done on this occasion. And I urge Senator Roberts to issue an apology in an unqualified manner, and I urge us all to have standards of behaviour, regardless of our differences, that re reflect the need to ensure colleagues and individuals across this country are safe. Mr President, I seek leave to make a short statement because Senator Wong has Senator, misrepresented Senator the Senator circumstances. Roberts, Senator Roberts, uh, uh, Senator Birmingham is on his feet. Minister, you have the call. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Mr President. I seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thanks, Mr. President. I thank the Senate. Uh, Mr. President, uh, the sharing of, uh, of private uh, contact details, uh, personal confidential arrangements in relation to uh, any member of parliament, indeed in relation to any individual without their consent and knowledge, uh, is inappropriate and should not occur. Uh, the government does not accept, and it is why, indeed, uh, I spoke to Senator Lambie prior to question time, uh, and the government, uh, along with other parties, agreed that Senator Lambie uh, should be facilitated to make the statement she has made to this Senate uh, to draw attention. 
uh, to the issue uh, and to seek to have an apology recorded uh, as would be the appropriate thing. Uh, Mr President, uh, as uh, I recall uh, the debate that Senator Wong referenced before, uh, and I recall my own remarks at the time in relation to the importance of civility uh, in, uh, in the conduct uh, of our political debate, uh, the importance that we actually debate on the issues, not the person. Uh, that is something that I hope and trust uh, we might see as we enter question time today, that we debate on the issues, not the person. Uh, that is uh, crucial at all stages. Uh, it's important, though, that, uh, that when we are having these debates, uh, we respect the differences of others uh, and we respect their rights uh, here as duly elected people, no matter how vehemently we may disagree with them and no matter how strongly we may engage in those debates in this place. And if we keep it on the issues, we respect the rights of each other to be here and we can maintain a civility and a decency of conduct uh, that the Australian people rightly reflect and expect. Uh, the government uh, was willing, and I believe others are willing, to provide um, Senator Roberts the ability to make an apology, if that is the uh, intention of Senator Roberts in terms of the publication of, uh, of Senator Lambie's uh, mobile, num mobile phone numbers. Uh, that, uh, that is uh, a matter for Senator Roberts in terms of making clear in seeking leave uh, what his intent is. Senator Roberts, are you seeking the call? I, I seek uh, leave to make a short statement to correct the record. Is leave granted? Is leave granted? Senator Roberts, leave is granted for two minutes. Two minutes. Thank you, Mr. President. Yesterday, Senator Lambie said people make decisions and there are consequences for those decisions. We don't condone publishing phone numbers that are private. Steve Mav, our Senate candidate, posted Senator Lambie's number, telephone number and a text message. So I need to correct the record and state that Steve was sent the phone number by a Tasmanian voter that got it from Senator Lambie's Facebook post with an invitation to contact her. A journalist has today confirmed that with Steve Mav, our candidate in Tasmania. At the last election, Senator Lambie posted her bank account details on Facebook with an invitation to send money. Steve has removed the phone number from his post. The text message stating that Senator Lambie opposes vaccine mandates remains, and I'll quote from that, and I'll read it. Senator Lambie said to Steve, I don't, to, to the Tasmanian voter, sorry, I don't support the mandate. It should be left for people to decide if they want the jab dictating to people is not the answer. That has been left on Steve Mav's Facebook page. Now, our candidate called on her to recant her comments and challenge her to a debate. One Nation, Mr President, is making inroads in Tasmania and Senator Lambie is, is running scared and playing victim and misrepresenting the circumstances. This phone number, this bank account, was issued by Senator Lambie publicly and a journalist has confirmed that today. So that is the record cleared. There being no further contributions, we will now move to questions without notice. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Yesterday I asked the Minister about a photo posted by LNP MP George Christensen a photo of the Victorian Premier Dan Andrews on his Telegram account, inciting violent comments threatening Premier Andrews life. These posts were drawn to the attention of the AFP. The minister took my question on notice. Can the minister today advise what action Mr Morrison has taken in response to Mr Christensen's online activity? The minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, sir. Thanks Mr President. Uh, uh, Mr. President, uh, I haven't received an updated brief in relation to, uh, to that matter. Um, I appreciate the senator is, uh, has now asked on, uh, on a consecutive day. Uh, I will uh, will seek that information urgently. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Well, yesterday the minister also said he was unaware that Mr. Christensen posted a video of Catherine King MP, which incited threatening comments directed at Ms. King, and that post was also drawn to the attention of the AFP. Can the minister advise today what action Mr. Morrison has taken in response to Mr. Christensen's online activity in relation to this post? Minister. 
Thanks, Mr. President. Well, they were uh, indeed a, a series of, uh, of related questions from Senator Keneally yesterday. Um, I refer to my previous remarks there. Senator Keneally, order. Senator Keneally, a second supplementary. Yesterday, the Commissioner of the Australian Federal Police revealed he's been investigating various threats against parliamentarians. Why hasn't the Prime Minister publicly condemned Mr Christensen's posts, which incited those very threats of violence? And will he? Minister. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Uh, well, I am uh, certainly not aware that uh, anything the AFP Commissioner has said relates specifically to the matters Senator Keneally has raised, um, uh, as I've indicated. Uh, I acknowledge the questions have been asked on consecutive days. Uh, I haven't received an update uh, in relation to these matters since yesterday, where I undertook to provide any information back to the chamber, uh, but I will urgently seek such an update. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs, Senator Cash. Can the minister update the Senate on how the Liberal and Nationals government national plan to safely reopen Australia is reuniting families and securing our economic recovery. The Minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Hughes for the question. Mr President, on both the health and economic fronts, Australia has fared far better than most countries when it comes to dealing with COVID-19. And what we are now seeing is that it is very pleasing that Australia is again reopening to the world. The incredibly high vaccination rate that we have in Australia has now meant that we can take further steps as a country to safely reopen. We see today from South Australia. South Australia is safely reopening. And uh, certainly the comments that I've had is it's fantastic to see more and more of the internal borders coming down as states and territories continue to have increased vaccination rates. And certainly to all Australians out there uh, who have gone and got themselves vaccinated, uh, we certainly thank you. What we see with the borders coming down and Australia reopening up is it's allowing families to reunite. It also has an important economic benefit for businesses in terms of finding staff and making it easier to do business, as we know, between the states and territories. The continued safe reopening is important for Australia to continue securing our economic future. Mr President, Australia's economic recovery, as we know, it is graining pace, with the RBA upgrading its growth forecast for 2022 from 4.25 per cent to 5.5 per cent, and unemployment is set to continually fall to be sustainably with a four in front of it. And certainly that's why you've seen the announcement from the 1st of December this year, we are now welcoming back fully vaccinated eligible visa holders to Australia without them needing to apply for a travel exemption. And this means eligible visa holders, including skilled workers, students and humanitarian, temporary working holiday makers and provisional family visa holders, they will now all be able to come to Australia, and Minister, that's a good thing. Your time has expired. Senator Hughes, a supplementary question. Thank you. How will the expanded travel bubbles help Australia's travel industry to recover, including in rural and regional areas? Minister. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. In terms of tourism, uh, in the financial year 2018-19, Australia actually generated $60.8 billion in direct tourism gross domestic product, and the industry itself directly employed over 670,000 Australians. 44 cents of every tourism dollar is spent in regional Australia. Um, and that is obviously a very, very good thing for our regional friends. And that is why safely reopening Australia is just so important, not just for our major capital cities, but also holiday destinations, as we all know, like Coffs Harbour and Port Douglas. Mr President, the Singapore Safe Travel Zone, it actually commenced on the 21st of November. It's opening. We are now welcoming eligible travellers into Australia from Singapore. And as we know, with the announcement by the Prime Minister on the 1st of December, we will now welcome citizens from Japan and Korea. Again, we are safely reopening, and in doing so, Minister, we are welcoming well people on. back to Time Australia. Has expired. Senator Hughes, a second supplementary. Thank you, Mr President. With Australia being the third most popular education destination globally, how will the reopening help our education sector continue to secure international borders? 
this international student, sorry. Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. And I think, as we all know, international education is Australia's fourth biggest export, and it contributes around $40 billion to the Australian economy. Normally, there are around 680,000 international students in Australia, uh, and without a doubt, they certainly contribute to uh, our city's livelihoods. This is a cohort who, on top of the fees that they pay, spend considerable money on accommodation, on leisure, and, as we know, they support many of our small and family businesses, uh, not just in our cities, but then they travel into rural and regional Australia. Mr. President, what we are seeing with the safe reopening of Australia, it really does demonstrate the success uh, of our national plan as the government continues to work with Australians to get Australia back to normal and reopen Australia to the world. As the Prime Minister himself said yesterday, it is another win for Australians who want to see Australia return to some form of normality that we knew before COVID-19. Your time has expired. Uh, Senator Marielle Smith. Thank you. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Why did Mr Morrison say in question time yesterday that he told the Leader of the Opposition where he was going on holiday while bushfires raged across the country when he had not? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Uh, I thank the Senator for the question. Uh, Mr Morrison, I believe, addressed those matters in the House of Representatives yesterday afternoon, and I draw the Senator's attention to the Hansard. Order. Senator Smith, a supplementary question. Why did Mr Morrison then stand up for a second time and double down on his comments, even though they were not true? Minister. I refer to my previous answer. <laughs> Senator Smith, a second supplementary question. Can the minister confirm that more than an hour after falsely claiming he had told the opposition leader where he was going on holiday and only after the leader of the opposition had left the chamber, Mr Morrison stood up for a third time to correct the record? Why does Mr Morrison have so much trouble telling the truth? Minister. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, in indeed, Mr. Morrison did address, as I said in my primary answer, those issues when he stood in the House yesterday afternoon. But of course, those opposite, predictably, as I thought might be the case, are seeking, as always, to play the man. Their ambition is to play the man, not the ball. Their ambition is to make sure that they get to run the grubbiest, most personal election campaign possible uh, without any resort on their part to policies, to values, to any of the types of things that might actually be to the benefit of the Australian people. Mr President, we can see this in terms of the tactics the Labor Party are playing day in, day out. You can hear the talking points in every interview that comes along, where every time one of them is up, it's usually not Mr Albanese because they keep in a box somewhere, but when any of the rest of them are out there, they've of course all got their scripted attacks and each of them go straight to the personal, straight to try to besmirch the Prime Minister, straight to try to make sure that they go undermining him in whatever way they possibly can. That's the Minister, type of grubbiness we no doubt Minister, will see from those Minister, opposite from now till Minister, polling Minister, the time for the answer has expired. Senator Cox. Thank you. My question is to Minister representing the Minister for Resources and Water, Senator Rushton. Uh, yesterday, Woodside gave the green light to the Scarborough Gas Project, which will generate 1.6 billion tonnes of emissions, equivalent to 15 coal-fired power stations every year. Scarborough will be the most polluting gas project in all of Australia. Minister, how could the Morrison government approve the most fossil fuel polluting project ever proposed in Australia? The Minister representing the Minister for Water and Resources, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, um, Mr President, and, uh, and I thank the Senator for her question. Um, the one thing that the Morrison-Joyce government will do is to ensure that the resources that are the wealth of Australia are able to be prosecuted to ensure that all Australians benefit from the wealth that sits yeah. under our ground. 
and we will do so in a responsible way, a way that's responsible when it comes to our emissions targets, a way that is responsible when it comes to making sure that we have got reliable and affordable power, because we are not going to make the Australian public or Australian businesses uh, pay for uh, the future that we know that we can achieve through our technology-led recovery. And I always wonder when we get questions from the Greens what they hate about regional Australia. What do they hate about jobs? What do they hate about businesses? I mean, this government has made an absolute commitment towards net zero by 2050. But we're going to do it in a way that is responsible, a way that doesn't tax Australians, Australian families, Australian households and Australian businesses. And we're absolutely committed to that. We are technology uh, uh, and, and source agnostic. We just believe that technology is the answer and not taxes. So I really don't understand why you are so against rural and regional Australia being able to benefit from the opportunity of jobs and the development yeah, of businesses. Yeah why you are denying the Australian public the opportunity to realise the wealth that exists under our ground. Because, as you may not actually realise, in rural and regional Australia we have two great industries. We have our resources sector and we have our agricultural sector. And these two sectors have been the backbone of the Australian economy for a very long time. They are two of the most responsible, environmentally responsible industries, and we on this side of the chamber will back them in for the benefit of all Australians. Senator Cox, a supplementary question. Uh, Woodside donates $220,000 every single year to the Liberal and the Labor parties. Former Liberal Resources Minister Ian McFarlane and former Labor WA State Treasurer Ben Wyatt both sit on their board. Minister, who is responsible for setting gas policy in this country? Is it Woodside or is it the government? Minister. Thank you very much, Mr President. Well, I'm really pleased to let Senator Cox know that it's the government that sets policy in Australia. And it's not just energy policy, but all national policy is set by the government. Now, you may not like it because you want to protest about everything that happens in this country, but we on this side of the chamber Order. are very happy to have the privilege and the honour to set policy to support Australians. We set policy through COVID that got us through COVID uh, safely um, and making sure that our economy re re remains sound. And what we will continue to do as we set policy going forward is to make sure that the best interests of Australia, of our economy, Order. of the health and safety of our citizens, of our national interests are always protected by the policies that Order. this government will always put forward. So I can assure you that your grubby attempt to try and besmirch and, and uh, um, the, uh, the policy of this government Order. is not working because this government will always make Minister, policy in the best interest of Minister, Australia. Minister, your time has expired. Just before we go on, it's, it is difficult for me to hear the minister, and she is only a couple of metres away from me. So I would remind all senators that interjections are disorderly. Senator Cox, second supplementary. The highly acidic gases from the Scarborough project will destroy First Nations cultural heritage at Murrajuga, not only the rock art but also the song lines of the Seven Sisters Dreaming story that are etched in the rocks at Murrajuga. Traditional owners have said no over and over to this project and are asking for it to be stopped. Why is the Commonwealth enabling the continued destruction of the Murrajuga rock art at the hands of the Woodside Scarborough Gas Project? Handy. Minister. Order. Senator Thorpe, order. Minister. Well, uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, I, I would disagree with the premise of the um, accusations that Senator Cox, Senator Cox has just made. Um, we, uh, in the development of our resource sector, um, of course, we must always remain very, very alive um, to the issues of, uh, of Indigenous culture in Australia. Um, and I can absolutely assure this chamber and anybody listening that that is always one of the absolute key considerations when we develop this sector. But the, the, the resource sector is a very important Order. element of the Australian economy. It benefits all Australians, uh, including Indigenous so Australians, our First Nations Australians, Order benefit from our right resources and sector. And we will continue to work in a process of co-design, consulting with First Nations Australians to make sure that we are developing 
all of our sectors across the whole of Australia in the best interest of all Australians. And Senator Cox, that includes Minister, First Nations. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for International Development in the Pacific, Senator Sazelja, who I note is freshly returned from a successful trip to Fiji. With Australia's border reopening as part of the government's national plan, can the minister update the Senate on how workers from the Pacific and Timor-Leste are contributing to Australia's rural economy, helping to secure jobs and supporting economic growth both in Australia and across our region as we recover from the COVID-19 pandemic? The Minister for International Development in the Pacific, Senator Sazelja. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr President. Thanks, Senator Scar, who is a champion uh, of Australia's relations with the Pacific. Um, and I'm pleased to advise uh, that we have now almost 19,000 Pacific and Timorese workers in Australia, the most ever. Uh, since our Pacific Labor initiatives recommenced in September last year, more than, more than 14,000 uh, Pacific workers have arrived from seven participating Pacific nations and Timor-Leste. Between now and Christmas, a further 2,000 Pacific workers will arrive to assist with the harvest period, and a further 55,000 Pacific workers are ready and waiting to come to Australia. Now, this is immediate action to address critical workforce shortages across regional Australia. Pacific labour mobility is also expanding and now involved in more sectors. Uh, Pacific workers are helping to bring in harvests, process meat, care for our elderly and staff, our hospitality venues as we look Order. to bounce back after COVID-19. The government recognises the outstanding job Pacific and Timorese workers have done in critical industries in Australia throughout the pandemic particularly in agriculture. These workers have played a vital role in many rural industries, including Samoan aged care workers in Catherine in the Northern Territory, Fijian meat workers in Inverell in New South Wales, Solomon Islands horticultural workers in Clifton in Senator Scar's home state of Queensland. On average, a longer-term Pacific worker will send remittances of more than $40,000 home over a three-year placement. Uh, this is an economic stimulus that directly allows our workers to support family, educate their kids, build homes and serves as a life-changing economic investment in our region. This makes Pacific Labor much greater than just a win-win initiative within the region. It's essential for our Pacific family and we're committed to its future. Finally, as Christmas approaches, we should also take a moment to pause and express our gratitude to these Pacific workers who will be away from family and their communities at this important time of year. Minister, I thank our Pacific family Minister, for the invaluable the contribution they're making to Senator Scar, a second supplementary. Thank you, President. Can the minister update the Senate on the Liberal Sorry, and Nationals stop. government's plans to improve and reform Australia's Pacific Labor Mobility Programs, further maximising the benefits to both businesses and workers? Sorry, and just to be clear, that was Senator Scar's first supplementary question. Senator, uh, Minister. Thank you, and I'm looking forward to the second as well. Can, today we have announced the next stage of reforms to the Pacific Australia Labor Mobility Scheme. Uh, the changes follow extensive public consultation with Pacific Island countries and our domestic industries, which will see a consolidated, improved and more efficient Pacific Worker Scheme benefiting employers, workers and participating countries. From 4 April 2022, the Seasonal Worker Program and Pacific Labor Scheme will be consolidated and replaced by an improved Palm Scheme simplifying administration and reducing duplication. The new single palm scheme will be managed by the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and its provider, the Pacific Labor Facility. We're also enhancing our commitment to skills and training as part of these reforms with more opportunities for palm workers to access job-specific training. These significant reforms will benefit employers, workers and participating nations, marking a new era of growth and success for Australia and the Pacific. Sorry, Senator Scar, I would never want to rob you of a question. A second supplementary. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister outline how the recently announced reforms will help more Australian businesses hire more workers from the Pacific and Timor-Leste, while also protecting worker welfare and cutting red tape for employees? Minister. Uh, Thank you. And the Palm Scheme will enable rural and regional businesses to engage the right workers more easily 
where and when they need them, alleviating critical workforce shortages. Visa arrangements will also be simplified with a single palm visa stream offering an extended length of stay of up to four years and the option to recruit workers for seasonal roles or longer term positions. We are also introducing more flexibility for workers to move between employers in response to workforce demands, improving productivity and workers' earning capacity. The Palm Scheme will further improve the high standards of program integrity and worker wellbeing that are central to the ongoing success of Pacific labour mobility. This is an exciting new era in Pacific labour mobility. These programs are win-win for Australia and our Pacific family. We look forward to welcoming more Pacific Order. workers to the invaluable contribution they make in Australia. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. In early November, Mr Morrison leaked private text messages from French President Emmanuel Macron. Why did Mr Morrison leak private text messages from President Macron and betray the trust of an ally just to score a domestic political hit? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, thanks Mr President. I thank, uh, I thank Senator Wong for the question. Uh, Mr President, uh, as uh, I'm sure everybody is aware uh, of the public commentary, news coverage and comments that had been made at the time in relation to uh, awareness uh, of discussions between Australia and France uh, on matters leading up to uh, the decision that was made by our government in the national interest to uh, cancel the contracts in relation to uh, the procurement of the attack class diesel powered submarines uh, in favour uh, of pursuing an alternate pathway through the new AUKUS strategic partnership with the United States and the United Kingdom uh, providing for procurement uh, of a future nuclear-powered submarine alternative. Uh, I think everyone, I'm sure, is aware, and especially Senator Wong, uh, that, uh, that there uh, were suggestions uh, that, uh, that, at some level, uh, France was uh, unaware of elements of Australia's concerns uh, about uh, the type of program uh, that, uh, that we would need and the type of capability that we would need uh, for the future. Uh, and, uh, and Senator Wong. Uh, I, think, uh, I think you uh, would fully appreciate uh, that what the Prime Minister, when he landed in the UK, sought to do uh, was outlined very clearly in response to some of that public commentary uh, precisely uh, the type of engagements that had happened in the lead up to that announcement, the type of discussions Order. that had been had uh, in relation uh, to ensuring, uh, to ensuring, to ensuring, Mr. President, uh, to ensuring, Mr. President, uh, that uh, the uh, the context in which all of those discussions were made was, uh, was uh, better understood in the public discourse uh, surrounding that. And we believe, Mr President, these were important national security decisions that firmly are in the national interest. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Yesterday, Mr Morrison tried and failed to use private text messages I exchanged with the Leader of the Opposition to blame shift his way out of trouble. Why is Mr Morrison making a habit of revealing private text messages? Minister. Thanks, Mr President. Uh, well, I think those are questions have been dealt with in terms of the previous questions that, uh, that I had and the question just, uh, just before, Mr President. I'd refer to those Order. answers, but, you know, you know, again it comes back comes back to those opposite wanting, as always, to Order. play the man. And we know they want to play the man because their advertising Order. briefs even show they want to play the man. Their advertising briefs even show it. You know, I was looking at their Order. advertising brief for their On TikTok campaign. And that said, Mr Minister, President— Minister, resume your seat. So, uh, Senator Wong, sorry. The, sorry What's I have the point two of order? points of order. The first is direct relevance. It's not relevant what the, this minister thinks about what the opposition might or might not be doing. It is a question about Mr. Morrison's behaviour. The second point of order, Mr. President, goes to the leader's continued uh, refusal to ever address you and to always address the chamber. It is customary for us to address the chamber through the chair. Now, I, I agree that there are. That I, I agree. Are you going to let me finish? Senator, would you Senator like to speak? Wong. Senator Wong, order on my right. 
Senator Wong, you have the call, but please. Come I appreciate to a that, Mr. President. Now, I accept all of us do address the chamber. This leader never turns to speak to you, and I would invite him to do so. Well, Senator Wong, you've had the opportunity to bring the minister. Senator Wong, Senator Wong, Senator Wong, you've had the opportunity on the. Senator Wong. Senator Wong. On the, on, the, on the first point of order, you've had the opportunity to bring the minister's attention back to the question. I'm listening carefully to the minister. On the second point of order, I don't believe there is a point of order. Minister. So, Mr. Mr. President, Labor's TikTok advertising brief, and let me quote from it. It, it is quite. Minister. Please. How is this Minister possibly Senator relevant? Wong, uh, direct relevance. How is this possibly relevant to a question about Mr. Hob Morrison's habit of revealing text messages? Please do not make I, question. Minister, please do not what, allow minister, question time to Senator so straight. I Senator haven't finished Wong. my point of order, Mr. President. I am asking you to not allow question time to so, so depart from conventions and from the standing orders. Please pull this minister up. Senator Wong, I am minister. Mr President, on the point of order, Senator Wong wants to interrupt as I'm midway through making a quote, a quote that she doesn't know where it finishes, or perhaps she's been looking a little more carefully at their advertising brief than I expected. But indeed, they want to ask questions that go to personal character assessments of the Prime Minister. Well, I think indeed activities that may well point to the fact that Labor have a plan, a tactic in this regard, uh, that their approach is all about personalisation, are indeed directly relevant. If they want to ask questions that are personal character attacks on the Prime Minister, then it is entirely, entirely appropriate to refute those. Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Wong, on the point of order, I am listening carefully to what the minister is saying. I will bring the minister back to the question. However, I do not know where the minister is going with a particular statement. I cannot know what's in the minister's mind. Minister, I'll bring you back to the question. You have the call. Oh, oh, Senator Wong, oh. I've just ruled. Saying something. Is, is, is this a point of order? Senator Do you want me to Wong? move dissent? Order on my right. The opposition will consider its position on your ruling, and I would ask to be very clear. I would ask you to be very clear after you hear the next part of the answer what your ruling is, so the opposition can consider its position on your ruling. Am I, uh, is that, am I, am I being crystal clear? Wong, you have made your point. Resume your seat. Order on my right. Order on my right. Order. I am listening carefully to the minister, as I always seek to do, uh, particularly when the chamber is not disorderly. Minister, you have the call. Thanks, Mr. President. As I said in the opening sentence in response to this supplementary, in the opening sentence, where I referred the senator to the answer to the previous questions that were asked in relation to earlier text messages, where I referred the senator to my answer to the primary question, they directly addressed the question that was being asked. I was then seeking Mr President to go on, indeed, to address the broader theme that is underscores the Labor Party question. I appreciate Senator Wong is very sensitive about Minister, that broader theme, Minister, but it was very clear Minister, in the opening sentence Minister, what the answer was. The time for the answer has expired. Senator Wong, a second supplementary question. Are Mr Morrison's colleagues concerned he will leak their private text messages if it suits him? Minister. Thanks, thanks Mr President. Well, Mr President, you know, this is the pattern we have from the Labor Party in terms of it being all about the personalisation of conduct, the personalisation of the Prime Minister. No, we're not, so Senator Wong can't say that I might not answer the question. No, we're not to answer that part of the question. 
But, Mr. President, Order Mr. President, uh, those opposite are clearly running Order a clear campaign. On my left. The quote I was giving before was the Labor Party creative brief. We want to create authentic and engaging content to create awareness on our overarching theme. Guess what their overarching theme was? Was it the Labor Party's values? No, it wasn't. Was it the Labor Party's policies? No, it wasn't. Minister, you to rule on whether that answer can possibly be directly relevant to my question. I ask for a clear ruling on that, Mr. President. I, Senator Wong, resume your seat. Senator Wong, I'm about to rule. Uh, you've had the opportunity to bring the minister back to the question. The minister did. Do, the minister did allow me to rule, Senator Gallagher. Well, then don't interrupt, please. The minister directly addressed the question at the beginning of his answer. He is now uh, expanding. I am listening carefully to what he says. You have had the chance to bring him back to the question. Uh, minister, I will order on my left. Minister, Senator Wong, you, uh, is this a different point of order? Uh, I'm asking you in relation to what I think is your ruling uh, to have the opportunity to take advice from the clerk, including the rulings by Senator Ryan, which indicated very clearly that the, uh, a directly relevant answer did not ground compliance with the standing orders of freewheeling thereafter. And I would ask, respectfully ask Mr President that you return to the chamber uh, with that ruling after you have the opportunity to take advice. Senator Wong, I will take advice and come back to the chamber tomorrow. Uh, however, I will say that I, am, I continue to listen carefully to the minister's answer. Uh, minister, you have the call for 20 seconds remaining. Thanks, Mr President. Well, to close it off and to bring it to the point of direct relevance to the overarching theme of Labor's question, what is Labor's overarching theme? Turns out it's Scott Morrison. It's not anything to do with their policies or their values or their approach. They put it in writing in their own advertising brief that their overarching theme is only about Scott Morrison, not about anything they've Order. got to offer themselves. Minister, resume your seat. Senator Davey. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Regionalisation, Regional Communications and Regional Education, Senator Mackenzie. Can the minister please update the Senate on the investment that the Liberals and the Nationals in government are making to ensure regional and rural Australia has access and connection to 21st century telecommunications services? The minister. Order. Order. Senator Lambie. The order. The min the Minister for Regionalisation, Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. And thank you, Senator Davey, for your tireless efforts in supporting rural and regional Australia, especially your constituents in New South Wales. Well, our government recognises the vital importance of digital connectivity to Australians who live, work and travel through rural, regional and remote Australia. They need access to good quality and reliable telecommunications. That's why we're delivering on our commitment to improve mobile coverage across Australia through our $380 million investment in the Mobile Black Spot program, which is providing more than 1,200 new mobile base stations in black spots right across Australia. 979 of those base stations have actually been activated and are right now, in real time, delivering real benefits to regional and rural communities right across Australia, including 320 funded base stations in your home state, Senator Davey. And, you know, there's been a lot of talk today about politics and partisanship, but how many base stations for rural and regional Australia has the Labor Party delivered? I don't know. You might be able to guess. This side of the chamber might be able to guess. Uh, if they had a policy on this, Order. the Labor Party might be able to tell us. I'll tell you. I'm, you know, zero. Zero. Uh, it's not even zero because you haven't been in government for that period of time. You actually don't have a policy to deliver mobile black spot coverage 
in this country. That is a fact. That is a fact. Whereas our side of politics has got $182 million, not just for our mobile black spot program, but our regional connectivity program, which provides place-based solutions for local communities out in the regions. And for Order. Senator Macdonald and Canavan uh, and Senator McMahon, we're also investing in connecting Northern Australia uh, through $685 million uh, dedicated to improving telecommunications in the north. We're about growing jobs and opportunities for the regions through connecting them with 21st century uh, digital connectivity. That's right. Senator Davey, supplementary question. Thank you. Can the minister also outline why quality telecommunications in regional Australia is vital to jobs and economic opportunity, as well as why it's so important in times of emergency? Minister. Uh, thank you, Senator. Well, it absolutely is critical, and we've seen uh, through COVID the importance of that connectivity for people, young people in particular, to access education opportunities. Um, telehealth has been of significant importance during COVID, and to keep those supply chains open, uh, particularly with food supplies during uh, lockdowns uh, and border closures by state governments. Um, Reliable telecommunication services mean being able to use uh, those sort of services, as I've outlined, when and where you need them. We've seen a move of uh, Australians out of capital cities into the regions, and it is that digital connectivity that we've been able to deliver over the last eight years that has been, meant they've been able to stay out there. It's why Telstra has said, you know what, you don't have to come back to the CBD to uh, the office. You actually can stay where you're loving to live and stay our employee. We've uh, consulted widely across the regions through our regional telecommunications Minister, review Minister, and look forward to delivering a response shortly. Expired. Senator Davey, a second supplementary question. And finally, is the minister aware of any risks to regional telecommunications services and what impact a lack of investment would have on our regional Australians and the communities they work and live in? Minister. I'm not aware of any alternatives. And as Senator Davey, as I said in my first answer, uh, nowhere in the Labor policy platform at the last election, nor in the ambiguity that they are talking to Australian people around the next election's policy, do they mention mobile black spot funding. Uh, big talk around the NBM, but nothing about place-based, localised solutions for rural and regional communities. Nothing about the Internet of Things on farm. Uh, nothing about how they can actually ensure that those that don't live in major regional capitals like Newcastle, uh, like Geelong, and like Ballarat and Bendigo, their two favourite regional capitals, that they are happy to invest in. But if you live outside of those two, Order. you get nothing. Nothing. Senate. No, no, absolutely nothing. So the greatest risk to, to connecting the regions, to growing the regions through digital connectivity, is electing Albanese and his best mates, uh, the Greens and Adam Minister. Band. Senator Lambie. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is for the minister representing the Minister for Defence. Minister, minister, lawyers are taking the Australian Defence Force to court on behalf of a young former recruit. They are alleging that on October 1, 2020, the former RAF aircraft man was bound, gagged and strangled by fellow recruits. In a video that appears to be of the events, the recruit is sexually assaulted. Minister, this is torture. This seems to be becoming standard behaviour of Defence Force. It's the torture of an Australian who signed up to serve his country. When did Minister Dutton become aware of these allegations? The Minister representing the Minister for Defence, Minister Senator Payne. Thank you very much, and uh, I thank Senator Lambie for, his qu for her question, of which I have no notice, and I am not aware of the um, uh, matters to which Senator Lambie refers. If the matters to which Senator Lambie refers at the beginning of her question are matters of fact, and if they are correct, as she has described them to the chamber, then in any circumstances they would be completely unacceptable actions uh, in any context, uh, not just the context in which Senator Lambie has raised it. However, Senator Lambie has gone on in her question 
to assert that these matters are, and I think I stand to be corrected by the Hansard, but these matters are standard behaviour or routine, uh, some variation of those words uh, in her remarks. I absolutely reject that. I absolutely reject that. These are not appropriate behaviours. They are not supported in any context in the Australian Defence Force. They are not standard behaviour, and I will follow these matters up, Senator Lambie, and come back to the Chamber with further information. Senator Lambie, a supplementary question? That would be wonderful. And when the Royal Commission goes through, I'll come back to what you just said, because that is all going to come out. Defence investigated the recruits' complaints of abuse last year, and nothing happened. Nothing happened. What kind of investigation was held here? At what rank was it held? And who did the investigation? That's what I want to know. Minister. Given that I've already advised the chamber that I am not aware of these matters, I have no further information for Senator Lambie. I'll take those questions on notice and return to the chamber. Senator Lambie, a second supplementary question. Defence have been offered to see the video and have declined to use it as part of evidence. They might be going. They might be. Go, they might be going back on that now. They say they are completely unaware of this ever occurring, and when given the chance to see it, themse see it themselves, say no. There have been dozens of complaints about the toxic culture that seeped into this one base. Why hasn't Defence done anything about these allegations? Minister. Senator, Lam as I've said. Order, order, Senator Lambie. As I said in relation to Senator Lambie's first and second questions, I'm not aware of this matter. I don't have any information for the senator, but I have indicated that I will take questions on notice and return with information to her. Senator Grogan. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Mr Morrison declared to the parliament in relation to former Australia Post Chief Executive Christine Holgate that she can go but later claimed that Ms Holgate chose to resign of her own accord. Why did he say that when it wasn't true? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, thanks Mr President. I thank, uh, thank Senator Grogan uh, for the question. Uh, I would, uh, would refer Senator Grogan to uh, the published statements uh, from Australia Post uh, at the time in relation to Ms Holgate's resignation. Uh, Senator Grogan, a supplementary question. Mr Morrison previously said that reports that he had tried to invite Brian Houston to the White House were gossip. Why did the Prime Minister say that when it was not true? Minister. Thanks, Mr President. Uh, well, I believe the Prime Minister has uh, addressed that question in the House of Representatives this question time, and I refer to the hands up. Senator Grogan, a second supplementary question. Does Mr Morrison still stand by his statement that he has never told a lie in public life? Minister. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Uh, well, indeed, I'm sure he does, Mr President. And you know what? I'm not going to stand here uh, and be lectured on integrity by the hypocrites opposite, Mr President. I'm not going to be lectured on integrity for those who invented the Medicare campaign and decided that that was the way they were going to try to somehow win office by scaring Australians on false policies. I'm not going to be lectured by those opposite who are currently running the pensioner scare campaign, again trying to sneak into office on a falsehood. And I invite any one of them to stand up and apologise to Australian pensioners who right now they're erroneously trying to scare into believing policies that simply do not exist that Senator Rustin has refuted time Order. and time and time again. Those opposite who come into this chamber and love endlessly, Order of course, to want to talk left. about you know, car park programs, when of course they invented the car park programs themselves and were happily touring Order the country announcing them themselves, left. or those opposite with their tick-tock dirty tricks that they're trying to run against the Prime Minister. That's the hypocrisy Minister. on show from those Minister. opposite. The time has expired. Senator Patterson. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Will the minister advise the Senate on the ways in which Australia is protecting and securing our national interests in a challenging world? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you, and I thank Senator Patterson uh, very much for his question, and particularly for his interest in these key issues. Because it is the case that the Morrison government is delivering clear outcomes in Australia's interests in the Indo-Pacific, in our bilateral engagement and in our multilateral engagement. 
As I noted in the Senate yesterday, we're the first country to secure a comprehensive strategic partnership with ASEAN and have formed CSPs with both India and Malaysia in the last two years alone, as well as our comprehensive strategic and economic partnership with Papua New Guinea, all key regional relationships. We've also seen remarkable progress on the Quad over the past two years. From just the first ministerial in-person meeting in 2019 to realising the historic in-person Quad Leaders Summit in September of this year, we've advanced our cooperation with Quad partners to make the region stronger, more prosperous, more stable through delivering practical outcomes together with the United States, with Japan and with India. To enhance our national security for decades to come, we have entered a partnership with the United Kingdom and the United States to share technology, including cyber, quantum and artificial intelligence, as well as nuclear propulsion systems for a new fleet of submarines. This is a landmark agreement. Only once before has a country agreed to share such nuclear-powered submarine technology with another nation, and that was the United States with the United Kingdom in the 1950s, over six decades ago. These outcomes, bilateral and others, are significant steps in our long-standing partnerships, but also cognizant of the changing strategic environment, befitting of the depth and of our shared interests in the security and prosperity of our region and in the interests of the Australian people. Senator Patterson. Thank you, Mr President, and thank you, Minister, for that answer. Will the minister update the Senate on the importance and role of international engagement and partnerships in addressing the COVID-19 pandemic? Minister. I thank Senator Patterson for his supplementary question, because the crucial word in our cooperation on the pandemic is partnership, yeah. based on the needs and the priorities of our partners. Our vaccine partnerships in the Indo-Pacific are not just about the sharing of vaccine doses but about training for health workers, cold chain equipment provision, public information campaign support and technical advice so that vaccines reach the arms of the people who do need them the most. And it was thanks to our strong relationships with Poland, with the United Kingdom, with Singapore and the European Union that the government was able to secure 6.5 million vaccine doses to also secure our to strengthen our domestic rollout. We're partnering with our neighbours' health systems as well, through Australian medical assistance teams and the supply of equipment such as oxygen concentrators, logistics and testing and surveillance. Through groups such as the Quad, ASEAN, the Pacific Islands Forum, we're aligning our responses and coordinating with multilateral initiatives such as the COVAX facility Minister, in vaccine delivery. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Patterson, a second supplementary question. Thank you. Will the minister advise how Australia is working to cement Australia's and our region's economic recovery from the pandemic? Medicine for his uh, <coughs> second supplementary question, because the government is focused on supporting a regional economic recovery that's underpinned by free and open markets governed by transparent rules. We know that jobs and investment in Australia's economy are linked with those of our region. Australia's Pacific Step Up has expanded and deepened our partnerships in the region, maintaining a record $1.44 billion assistance, development assistance to the Pacific in 2021-22. On 2 November, Australia ratified the RCEP, the world's largest free trade agreement, which will bring together nine of Australia's top 15 trading partners into a single economic framework. Following the signing of our Australia-India CSP in 2020, we've now formally resumed negotiations on a comprehensive economic cooperation agreement with India, deepening bilateral trade with one of our most important Indo-Pacific partners. Under this government, Australia is seen as a reliable, consistent and trusted partner, and our commitment to free and open trade is absolute. Minister. Thank you, Minister. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Uh, Senator, two days of question time in a row, and already the Prime Minister has been caught out again today, not telling the truth in the Parliament. This is very reminiscent of what happened when the Prime Minister went to Glasgow for COP26, on the back of being called out by the French President Macron. The Prime Minister's word was mud. Business leaders, community leaders, delegates, negotiators all knew they couldn't trust what the Prime Minister would say. 
after signing the Glasgow Pact, which requires Australia to make changes to keep temperatures below 1.5 degrees, including phasing down coal, the Prime Minister came back to Australia and said he didn't need to change a thing. Is the Prime Minister fibbing to the world, to our children or to himself? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. I uh, thank Senator Hanson Young for that question, Mr President. I thank Senator Young for the question because indeed the Prime Minister did go to Glasgow and he went to Glasgow armed with the facts of Australia's record on climate change. Yeah. And Australia's record on climate change is one of absolutely delivering what we promise. Indeed, of over-delivering on our promises is our record when it comes to climate change, Mr President. Australia has seen our emissions fall by more than 20 per cent since 2005. They're down 5.3 per cent this year, Mr President. We beat our Kyoto-era targets by 459 million tonnes, Mr President. So the Prime Minister was able to travel to Glasgow with a track record of Australia's track record of delivery by the Australian people, of Australian farmers, of Australian businesses, of Australians who have invested themselves and have seen their governments invest and have seen many businesses invest in achieving the change to reduce emissions. He was able to go to Glasgow with a track record in excess of that of many other nations, nations who the Greens sometimes seem to love to lord, whereas Australia indeed is exceeding them in terms of achievement when it comes to reducing emissions. Emissions reduction in our country faster than Canada, faster than Japan, faster than New Zealand, faster than the United States or the G20 or OECD averages. That is the track record that we were able to take to Glasgow, the Australian track record as the Prime Minister promoted the Australian way of reducing those emissions, the Australian way of investing in emissions reduction through technology, through innovation, through backing people to be able to get ahead and in getting ahead by reducing those emissions successfully without destroying jobs, elements of our economy or undermining Australia's competitiveness. That's the positive story the Prime Minister was able to take to Glasgow. It is one of achievement, overachievement and of clear plans for the future. Your time has expired. Senator Hanson-Young. Uh, thank you, Mr President. The Prime Minister's word was mud in Glasgow, and everyone knows it. Everyone knows it. We had an Australian pavilion that was whitewashed and greenwashed, covered in logos from Santos, not even a skerrick of representation from our First Nations people. Why is the Prime Minister denying not just the climate science and the fast track we need, but also denying First Nations people a right to have a voice in relation to this issue. Minister. Thanks, Mr President. Well, I suspect Senator Hanson Young was talking to a rather select group of individuals when she was in Glasgow. That's my suspicion. And that the group Senator Hanson Young was hanging out with probably had some uh, predetermined prejudices in their thinking, apparently even a prejudice against uh, uh, a fine, significant South Australian company like Santos that Senator Hanson Young chose to sledge on the way through in her question. Uh, Mr President, what Australia oh, highlighted uh... was not just our overachievement in terms of emissions reductions, but our commitments and plans for the future, the commitment to work towards net zero by 2050 and to achieve that underpinned by investment of more than $21 billion from government in low emissions technologies over the decade to 2030, helping to secure more than $80 billion in total investment by leveraging other private sector capital and investment that is going to help to achieve the type of emissions reductions through technological breakthroughs that have got us so far in achieving more than 20 per cent reductions to date Minister, and will help to achieve Minister, the further challenges we face. Your time has expired. Senator Hanson Young, a second supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. The Prime, Minister, the Prime Minister's performance at Glasgow was embarrassing. We've now got back to Australia, and again the Prime Minister can't be trusted on anything he says. He lied. He's misled. He has absolutely denied the truth in relation to Senator Abetz on a point of order. Oh order. Oh order. Uh, Mr. Senator President, the, uh, order. Yes, uh, the reflection on the Prime Minister is clearly against standing orders and it needs to be withdrawn unequivocally. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, Senator Wong on the point of order. 
Mr. President, you, and you may wish to go away and consider this as well, but I do note earlier today that Senator Rustin used the words lying, liar, lies on multiple occasions in the contribution on the suspension debate um, and accused uh, everyone on this side knowing that they were lying, made a number of allegations about lying. It may be uh, uh, that obviously we didn't take uh, no, we did. We didn't. We didn't take offence, and, no. and you know. But, uh, order, but order. I, I would ask you to just reflect on whether or not, the, given that the manager of the government has been prepared to do so, whether it's appropriate at this stage to rule this out. Yeah. Senator Wong, I'm, I'm, I'm prepared. I'm, I, I'm order in the chamber. There, there. There, is, there has been a clear Senator Wong, Senator Rustin. There has been a clear um, precedent and number of rulings that say that um, a, an epithet like lying directed at an individual is clearly in breach of 1933, whereas such a comment directed in general at a political party is not out of order. In the case of this question, Senator Hanson Young, your, uh, your accusation was directed directly at the Prime Minister, so I will ask you to withdraw that part. I think the rest of the question can stand. You have 11 seconds remaining. I would ask you to withdraw and then continue your question. Thank you, Mr. President. I withdraw. Minister, why does the Prime Minister have a problem with truth? Minister. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Well, uh, Senator Hanson Young, in, uh, in her reference to those international engagements that occurred at Glasgow, uh, obviously overlooked the fact that the Prime Minister, in those international engagements uh, with Australian ministers and our government, has signed new low technology emissions partnerships with Singapore, with Japan, with Germany, with the UK, with Korea, with Indonesia, with Vietnam. Demonstrating, Mr. President, Order. demonstrating, Mr. President, indeed, just Order. how closely the Prime Minister and our government are working with international partners, completely contrary to the type of claims that the Greens want to make. Completely contrary to the type of claims the Greens want to make. Those close international partnerships on technology cooperation uh, that uh, are a vote of confidence in terms of the investment we're making in that technology the work and commitment we have to emissions reduction and Australia's track record on achievement, which our government is proud of and continues to pursue and deliver. Minister, Senator Ayres. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Does the Prime Minister believe that an unvaccinated person in Sydney should be able to get a cup of coffee at a cafe today? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, Mr. President, uh, the Prime Minister you know, does believe that as we implement the national plan towards reopening, uh, which the Prime Minister took to the national cabinet uh, and worked with the states and territories to get them to make commitments consistent with that national plan, and as we achieve some of the highest levels of vaccination in the developed world. More than 91 per cent of Australians have now had a first dose. More than 85 per cent have now had a second dose. Uh, that we need to work through the different stages of that national plan, Mr. President. And the different stages of that national plan do chart a course towards normality. Normality as it was before COVID. Yes, knowing that, of course, vaccination and different health protocols will require us to continue to manage and work with COVID. The Prime Minister, I and all members of the government urge every single Australian to go and get vaccinated. That is what everybody should do. But we want to make sure as well that in terms of the cafe owners, the small business owners, the staff working in retail across the country, that all of those individuals uh, are respected in terms of uh, the engagement that they will have going forward, working, living, operating businesses in one of the most heavily vaccinated countries in the world. And that means that they should be free to operate in accordance with the laws of the land, but they also should be free in terms of not having undue 
longer term, more onerous than is necessary restrictions placed upon them in terms of how they enforce operations in their business or what they do in their businesses. That indeed is why the National Plan charted those different stages. And as we get the highest possible levels of vaccination in this country, we should be looking to move into those final stages. We should be looking Order. to the pathway into those final stages. That, of course, is the case here in the ACT, one of the most highly vaccinated jurisdictions Order in the world. And I've got no doubt that is the case we're seeing in terms of where Minister, New South Wales and other states will Minister, head. thank you. Senator Ayres, a supplementary question. Well, as opposed to today, in September, Mr Morrison said, and I quote, let's be clear about what the plan says. When you get to 80 per cent, domestic restrictions on vaccinated persons should be lifted. We're not talking about willy-nilly movement of people who are unvaccinated. But now, he says, restrictions should be lifted at 80 per cent for unvaccinated people to get a cup of coffee at a cafe in Brisbane. Time. Was he lying Senator in September Ayers. or is he lying now? Senator Ayres, resume your seat. Minister, insofar as the question was asked. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr President. Well, obviously this was a supplementary, so I assume the question draws on from the primary question, which was in relation to New South Wales. And I note, Mr President, that New South Wales is not at 80 per cent vaccination. New South Wales is at 92 per cent double dose vaccination, Mr President. 94.4 per cent first dose vaccination, Order, Mr lab. President. So New South Wales indeed has well and truly exceeded that 80 per cent target in relation to the national plan. That is why we welcome the fact that the New South Wales government has been able to make further commitments in terms of reopening, further commitments that have enabled us as a Commonwealth government to make additional steps and commitments in terms of reopening, including our international borders with the announcements made this week in relation to enabling visa holders to return to Australia. Those steps in the national plan are possible because of the very high vaccination rates that have been achieved. Vaccination rates in excess of what Senator Ayres quoted then, Minister, well in excess of Minister, them. your time has expired. Senator Ayres, a second supplementary. Mr Morrison's criticised the Queensland government for its restrictions on vaccinated people, but backs in restrictions on un unvaccinated people in New South Wales. Why has the Prime Minister got one position in Queensland and another position in New South Wales? Minister. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, I think, Mr. President, uh, if, uh, if the Senator cared to actually look at what Premier Perrottet has announced in terms of the different steps in relation to New South Wales, uh, there are uh, indeed further steps in terms of New South Wales' is opening up uh, that are being pursued and are being undertaken, uh, Mr. President. Uh, that is New South Wales operating in accordance with the scientific evidence of the national plan. And this is just it, Order. Mr. President. This is just it. Senator Our McAllister. government at every stage has sought to provide leadership in closing the international borders, Order leadership in sharing the health left. advice, leadership in terms of Senator mandating Keneally. vaccines where they're necessary for the highly vulnerable in aged care, in disability care, in high care health settings. We've recognised all of Senator that, McAllister. but also the leadership in terms of developing a scientifically underpinned national plan for reopening, something very few countries in the world had the opportunity to be able to do, Mr President. We have, Order. we did, we are now seeing it implemented, and that is to the great benefit Minister, of the Australian people. Mr President, I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Sen uh, Minister, Minister Payne, you're uh, Thank you, the Mr call? President. I wish to provide further information to the chamber in response to Senator Lambie's question. Uh, Mr President, the ABC published a story this morning detailing uh, the bastardisation to which I believe Senator Lambie refers. Uh, Defence was made aware of the existence of the video to which I believe Senator Lambie refers on the 27th, 22nd of October and immediately urged the individual's lawyers, Operational Legal Australia, to refer the matter to the civilian authorities. Defence has now also referred the matter to the Joint Military Police Unit for review. Defence has not seen the footage nor been provided a copy of the video. Defence is working to identify those who were pictured in this morning's ABC report. And, Mr President, it is not appropriate for me to comment further on individual matters, uh, as I'm sure the Chamber would appreciate. Uh, let me reiterate the observations I made in relation to Senator Lambie's first question. 
The Australian Defence Force is well known and highly respected around the world for its exemplary standards and its insistence on them. And I thank those members of the ADF, the many, many women and men of the ADF, for their past and ongoing service to our country. A, uni a unifying set of defence values and behaviour sets the benchmark for what defence expects of its people in the workplace. All defence personnel are expected to behave in accordance with the defence values and behaviours. Defence does not tolerate unacceptable behaviour and takes action when unacceptable behaviour occurs in accordance with the department's unacceptable behaviour policy. A soldier service has recently been terminated as a result of sending inappropriate images to his colleagues. Importantly, these instances are few. The vast majority of our personnel are a credit to the Australian Defence Force and to the nation. Defence has extensive awareness programs and support services in place to educate and assist all personnel. This includes trainee officers and ADF cadets. Our government is very proud of our Defence Force. Our ADF has been responsive and able and available to assist our Australian communities through some of the most difficult times this year and last year. They have been here for us through support and recovery through bushfires and floods. They have protected our communities as we deal with COVID-19 impacts, and we thank them for their service. Thank you, Minister. Senator Farrell, on this matter, because otherwise I have a matter I wish to update the Chamber on. No, not this matter. Uh... Uh, I just wish to update the Chamber on the uh, AFP MOU, uh, MOU and national guidelines. Uh, the Speaker, the Attorney-General, the Minister for Home Affairs and I have signed a new Memorandum of Understanding regarding AFP investigations where parliamentary privilege may be involved. The Australian Federal Police will also issue a new national guideline which updates the procedures that the AFP will follow for the collection and quarantining of material that could be subject to parliamentary privilege. The MOU and guideline are designed to ensure that law enforcement investigations are conducted without improperly interfering with the functioning of parliament, its committees and its members. They also ensure that parliamentarians and their staff are given a proper opportunity to raise claims of parliamentary privilege in relation to material that is obtained through the execution of a warrant. The new MOU and guideline replaced the 2005 settlement of these issues and includes some, some significant improvements, uh, particularly related to overall improved oversight of investigations which may intersect with parliamentary privilege, clarifying the application of the guideline to electronic information, particularly where this is held by third parties, and reporting to the Committee of Privilege on the use of covert powers in relation to parliamentarians and their staff. These changes address shortcomings in the 2005 protocols, which were identified in reports of the Privileges Committee in both houses tabled during the 45th Parliament. They also respond to the Senate resolution of December 2018, which called on the Attorney-General to work with the presiding officers to develop a new protocol for the execution of search warrants and the use of other intrusive powers by executive agencies. It was initially hoped new procedures would also be agreed in relation to the exercise of covert powers. However, more work is required to ensure these procedures address the concerns of parliamentarians, particularly in relation to access and use of telecommunications data and the quarantining of material collected covertly. In addition, there are practical issues which the AFP must address to ensure that the agreed procedures do not unduly hamper investigations. Further negotiations regarding the implementation of procedures that ensure covert powers are exercised in a manner, in a manner which does not intrude on parliamentary privilege will be conducted in the next parliament. I would like to acknowledge the work of the Speaker, Minister Andrews, the Attorney-General and particularly Senators Abetz and McAllister uh, and members of the Committee of Privileges, including the Chair of the Privileges Committee, Senator O'Neill. Uh, in particular, though, I wish to pay tribute to President, former President Ryan uh, for his clarity of thought and perseverance in this matter. He would have very much liked to have had this concluded before his departure. Unfortunately, that wasn't the case, but I know that he is pleased that it has been concluded. Now, I table a copy of the MOU and the National Guideline. Senator Birmingham. 
Thanks, Mr. President. Mr. President, I seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for two minutes. That's fine. Thank. Leave is granted. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. President. I thank the Senate. Uh, Mr. President, I just wish to uh, to make a short statement to acknowledge uh, the tabling of the memorandum of understanding uh, that uh, that you have just undertaken. The statement that you have just made, Mr. President, in relation to the memorandum of understanding on the execution of search warrants in relation to a member of Parliament. Uh, and of course, Mr. President, uh, to acknowledge in particular uh, the extensive work that has been undertaken in relation to this matter. Uh, I do so acknowledging that it is work that has transcended uh, presiding officers, uh, relevant ministers, uh, and a number of officials and others involved in the process, and therefore that, uh, that we extend that acknowledgement to all those who have uh, engaged in this process in good faith, uh, seeking to resolve. Uh, what are at times challenging issues of principle uh, in relation to the protection of privilege, uh, but also ensuring uh, that, uh, that in no way uh, is the proper uh, engagement of our law enforcement officials uh, impeded unnecessarily uh, in relation to the upholding uh, of the laws of the land. Uh, I particularly acknowledge the work uh, that, uh, that uh, the Privileges Committee uh, has undertaken in helping to inform and advise and presiding officers uh, and all parties uh, to this work, uh, and, uh, and trust Mr. President that uh, the safeguards that have been built uh, into the memorandum of understanding, uh, including in relation uh, to the reporting arrangements that exist, uh, will help to provide all parliamentarians uh, with the confidence uh, that they can conduct uh, their duties uh, in the manner in which uh, uh, all parliamentarians should be free to do so. Uh, in accordance with the historic conventions and traditions that have enabled uh, robust assessment and analysis by parliamentarians uh, of issues and prosecution of those issues uh, with the necessary freedoms and protections to do so, uh, but that also uh, these measures should give confidence uh, to all Australians that whilst our parliamentary democracy is protected, uh, so too uh, will appropriate uh, action be available in relation uh, to legal matters. Uh, and that, uh, that, as always, no Australian sits uh, completely above the law in our nation. Uh, Mr President, I thank you uh, for the statement that you have made to the Senate and the details that you have outlined to the Senate uh, and for, uh, for bringing this matter here and, again, acknowledge the cross-party and especially bipartisan way uh, in which these matters have been tackled. Senator Wong. Mr President, I seek leave to make a short statement. There being no objection, leave is granted. I thank the Senate. Um, these are fundamentally important documents that have been tabled today, which go to the heart of the relationship between Parliament and the executive. And I note that they replace an MOU and guideline agreed to in 2005. And since that time, but especially in the last five years, the Senate has dealt with multiple incursions into the privileges of its committees and of senators, which have been the subject of a number of reports by the Standing Committee of Privileges. In particular, during the 2016 election campaign, the Turnbull government launched a raid on the officers of the then Deputy Leader of the Opposition in the Senate, Senate, Senator Conroy, and the private home of a member of his staff. Extraordinary action which came about because Senator Conroy had information about the national broadband network that was politically embarrassing for the government of the day. The Privileges Committee recommended and the Senate adopted without dissent not only a finding that the claim of privilege by Senator Conroy be upheld, but also that the documents be withheld from the Australian Federal Police investigation and returned to Senator Conroy. This was a political action in the mi middle of an election campaign which was conducted with disregard of parliamentary privilege, as was evidenced by the further finding by the Privileges Committee in its 164th report that improper interference occurred with the functions of the parliament and the free performance by Senator Conroy of his duties as a senator. The necessity of a robust memorandum and guideline is demonstrated by these events. In December 2018, the Senate first agreed to a motion calling for the development of a new protocol for the execution of search warrants and the use by executive agencies of other intrusive powers complying with the principles and addresses the shortcomings identified in the reports tabled by the Bipartisan Privileges Committee. 
the intent of these documents is to ensure that Parliament and parliamentarians are not subject to inter improper interference in the performance of their duties. And they are intended to facilitate investigations in a way that does not amount to a contempt of Parliament and provide parliamentarians with a measure of confidence that parliamentary privilege is being respected and that parliamentarians will have an opportunity to make claim that material is protected by privilege. While the MOU and guideline are intended to operate as a safeguard against the possibility of contempt by providing for the rights of members of parliaments to be protected, it is important to note that their existence alone cannot preclude the possibility of contempt being committed. It is a reminder to the executive that privilege, parliamentary privilege is not a convention or a courtesy, it is the law. Mr President, I agree with you that these documents represent significant progress. I also agree with you that there is unfinished business. As the President has said, it was not possible to conclude negotiations on the operation of the memorandum and guideline with respect to the exercise of covert powers. I note the agreement explicitly refers to the further negotiation in relation to these powers in the next parliament, and regardless of who forms government after the next election, this agreement must be honoured. And I urge those senators across the chamber, including those opposite, uh, to really turn their minds uh, to the importance of making sure that privilege is uh, respected in terms of the interactions between uh, the executive and the parliament. It cannot be another 16 years before these documents are further reviewed and updated. I place on record my thanks, uh, personal thanks to Senator McAllister for her leadership and work on behalf of the opposition in negotiations on these matters. Renegotiation is something that we have been seeking for some years. I also uh, place on record my thanks to former President Ryan for his extensive work uh, in finalising these documents. Senator Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. President. I rise to take note of the answers given by Senator Birmingham. Uh, sorry, to the sorry, Senator Farrell, do you mind just resuming your seat? Sen Senator Patrick was actually seeking the call as well on another matter. Yes, and, and, and I might add it, uh, it's supported by the standing orders uh, uh, 70, uh, yes. 74. 5. Um, so, pursuant to that standing order, I would like to seek an explanation from the uh, minister representing the Prime Minister as to why question number 4085, which has been on the notice paper since the 6th of September, has not been answered. Minister. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr. President. Uh, in relation to uh, what I think was question 4085. Five that, uh, that Senator Patrick indicated, uh, dating back to the 6th of September. Um, I shall uh, shall uh, look into uh, look into those matters for the senator. Senator Patrick. Yes, I'd uh, rise to take note of that uh, response from the minister. Uh, look, this is an important question, uh, uh, minister, and it shouldn't have been a difficult one to answer. So I'll just read the question for you. Uh, since the decision in Patrick and Secretary, Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet in brackets Freedom of Information AAT 2719 was handed down on 5 August, how many Freedom of Information requests has the Department received relating to National Cabinet documents? Now, I would have thought that would be a pretty simple answer to get uh, access to. and It actually is uh, disturbing that uh, of the four questions that are outstanding in relation to uh, the notice paper, three of them are from the Prime Minister's office, almost uh, treating the, this place in contempt by uh, you know, just not answering questions in a timely fashion. I want to I go uh, to why this question is important. And it relates to a response that a constituent of mine received uh, a, a couple of weeks ago, and indeed uh, uh, a response that I received uh, a, a week ago from the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet in relation to an FOI request that I made. Uh, both of the requests from my constituent and myself were in similar terms. I'll read what my request was. I requested the agendas, minutes and records of decisions of the initial 10 Cabinet uh, meetings, excluding documents that were already released including the full minutes of the cabinet, uh, National Cabinet dated uh, 15 March 2020. So I was after National Cabinet uh, uh, minutes, 
Now, in response to that, I was going to read from the decision which was made by uh, Miss Angie McKenzie, and I think it's a disgraceful decision. It's a disgraceful decision that uh, really does uh, warrant some consideration by the government uh, because it seeks to override uh, Justice White's decision. And I'll explain how it does that. Um, uh, Ms uh, McKenzie uh, puts in her decision reasoning uh, to re in, in her refusing to give grant access to, to these documents the fact that, uh, and I'll read from the decision, I am aware and have considered the Administrative Appeals Tribunal decision delivered on 5 August 2021 by Deputy President, President in brackets Justice White in Patrick and Secretary Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet 2021 AAT 2719. Justice White was of the view that, on the evidence available to him, National Cabinet was not a committee of the Cabinet for the purposes of the FOI Act. Now, I just want to now read to you how this uh, officer inside the PMC uh, has now made a determination. She writes, in view of all the evidence available to me, not, of all, not all of which was available to the AAT in, in making its decision in Patrick, and as set out below, I have formed the view that National Cabinet is a committee of the Cabinet for the purposes of the FOI Act, and therefore National Cabinet documents are exempt from disclosure under section 34 of the FOI Act. To summarise what is being said here, Justice White says, uh, and says quite explicitly in his uh, judgment, he says, uh, uh, I find persuasively against the National Cabinet being a committee of the Cabinet within the meaning of the statutory expression. So that's what judges do. They look at the statutory ex expressions and they try and interpret what, uh, what the meaning of them are. So there's no doubt as to what Justice White was saying. National Cabinet is not a committee of the Federal Cabinet. That was his decision, wasn't appealed. And then we find uh, some short time later we've got some low-level official, uh, an acting secretary, um, which I'll get the uh, I get this right, assistant secretary, cabinet division, saying, "Don't worry about what, what Justice White says. She's found that it is." And I just can't reconcile that. I just cannot reconcile that. Now. What she did was she said, no, I've got some new evidence that Justice White didn't have. And uh, she says, on the 15th of March, the National Cabinet endorsed the terms of reference for National Cabinet, which explicitly provide that National Cabinet was established as a committee of the Cabinet and, among other things, goes on to talk about its proceedings and so forth. She suggests she's basically saying that's new evidence that Justice White didn't have. Well, let me just read from Justice White's, uh, um, from his uh, judgment at para uh, 189. He, he said, the respondents, who, and that's talking about PMC, who had the relevant onus, did not adduce formal evidence of adoption of the members of the National Cabinet of principles of collective responsibility and solidarity. I am willing to accept, however, that by the adoption of the terms of reference attached to the minutes of National Cabinet, it did resolve to act in accordance with such principles. So you've got an FOI officer who says, the judge didn't see the terms of reference, yet in his judgment he references them. He references and acknowledges them. So this is an incompetence of, a, of a, a, an order that I haven't seen before. The, the decision actually mentions the evidence that this official says uh, was not available to, uh, to Justice White. Uh, Ms. Uh, Ms McKenzie then goes on to suggest that uh, the, uh, the other piece of evidence that uh, uh, Justice White didn't have was a statement by the Prime Minister, Premiers uh, and Chief Ministers that they expect this to be confidential, as though a statement by a Prime Minister or a statement by a Premier that something ought to be confidential makes it law. Well, I'm sorry, it doesn't. You can't have a Prime Minister saying, uh, this is my view and that is law. That's not how it works. For it to be law, it has to pass through both chambers in this building. Not just be a statement. It doesn't matter whether it's this, uh, the Prime Minister or a Premier. 
So this, this uh, Miss um, Angie McKenzie clearly has no idea of how the law works even. It's a disgrace that this sort of uh, material comes out of Prime Minister and Cabinet, an organisation that's supposed to be the preeminent department in the Commonwealth. I actually think uh, Ms McKenzie has breached her obligations under the Public Service Act. What's happened is she has uh, not just trimmed her political sails, she's actually just put up a Liberal Party uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, spinnaker to make this decision. I, I see Senator Dunningham uh, shaking his head at me. How do you get a situation, Senator? How do you get a situation where a judge says, a, a judge says that is, yeah, I'm having a go at a public servant because this public servant is incompetent. It's incompetent, and public servants ought to know that if they do something as stupid as what she has done, I'm going to call it out, and I'm going to do that over and over again. I respect public servants, but not when they are politicised like this. Justice White made the point, made, the, made a determination that National Cabinet was not a committee of the Federal Cabinet. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to, to work out that, and that is not appropriate for a public servant to say, disregard what the judge says. That's not okay. And if and, and the problem we've got, and this goes to the reason why this, this question ought to be, have, have been answered, is because the number is somewhere above 50. 50 applications have been made to PMNC for access to National Cabinet documents since the decision uh, that was handed down by Justice White. And that's likely to be 55 decisions wrongly made by PMNC that goes off to the Information Commissioner and clogs up the entire system. And that may well suit uh, those on the other side of the chamber who simply uh, love secrecy. They don't want to have anything disclosed to the public. Well, the news is that everything that the government does is paid for by the public and is supposed to be for the benefit of the public, and they are entitled to see it except in very narrow circumstances. And this is just an abuse. So, yes. <coughs> Senator, I'm going to name a public official, particularly one that has uh, behaved in such an abhorrent way. Well, you want to, if you want to fire me up, you're welcome to, because this is just wrong. This is just wrong, and you ought to be standing up and actually agreeing with me that we respect what our judicial officers say. Now, of course, the government says, "Oh, well, the AAT, uh, you know, it's not binding upon the executive." Let's look at who was involved in this. Okay, the matter went to the Information Commissioner. She bumped it up the chain said, this is an important matter. It needs to be sorted out by the AAT. Gets to the AAT and the AAT recognises its importance and assigns a judicial officer as the presiding member. And it wasn't as though uh, even uh, Bush lawyer Rex Patrick argued the case. It was it was uh, Geoffrey Watson SC, a most eminent barrister with a, with a, a long history, uh, a gentleman and someone who knows the law inside out. And on the other side was, uh, was Mr Berger QC from, from, from PM&C. This was on, a, was on a kangaroo court. Serious legal minds dealing with this issue overturned by someone in PM&C who is a public official uh, who ought to absolutely respect the way the rule of law works in this country, absolutely should be respecting exactly what uh, uh, the, the authority of a justice in terms of making statutory interpretation. So yes, I am naming Ms Angie McKenzie. I'm naming her as incompetent and I'm naming her as politicised. She's been directed to make a decision contrary to law because it suits the Prime Minister, because the Prime Minister doesn't want anyone to know about anything that happens in the National Cabinet, doesn't want to know about all of the decisions that are made about the NCCC or what the AHPPC might have been saying about masks or, or, or protecting children or vaccinations. 
all things that we ought to be able to see. The National Cabinet is a meeting of uh, the federal government and the states. It's an inter intergovernmental uh, uh, meeting. Now, the FOI actually protects those sorts of meetings. It just doesn't give a blanket pr uh, uh, protection. It's, it's not controversial. I'm not saying open the floodgates, and neither was Justice White. He made the point that there are protections for intergovernmental exchanges that are, that are sensitive, that might give rise to a concern. But in relation to the minutes, they were released to me that I, that I originally requested. And, and, uh, there are a number of organisations, journalists, uh, NGOs, people who are trying to get access to want to see what's happened inside the National Cabinet, now getting frustrated by an official. Okay, because now every one of those decisions, because uh, she's ignored them, because she's incompetent and she's politicised, now have to go through a process that will take a year. It will take a year because your government hasn't properly resourced the office of the Australian Information Commissioner. When the Labor Party set up that office, there were three commissioners: the Information Commissioner, the FOI Commissioner, and the Privacy Commissioner. And Tony Abbott tried to defund the whole organisation. We were left with one, and that was the Information Commissioner trying to do the work of three. Finally, with some arm twisting, I've managed to help get us an FOI Commissioner, but we're still without a Privacy Commissioner. That whole organisation is underfunded because the whole plan of government is FOI request, we make a cavalier claim, goes to the Information Commissioner. Two years later, an answer pops out. If you still need to delay it beyond the election, you appeal it to the AAT at, at uh, taxpayers' expense. It's a disgrace. It's a disgrace. And the fact that Ms Angie McKenzie is in on it is, is just disgusting. And that's why I am calling her out. That's why I am calling it out. Now, you understand as well, Senator Van, that, that Parliamentary privilege allows me. It's not. It's not my privilege. It's a pr privilege of my constituents that allow me to say in this chamber what people can't say outside of it. That's a really important democratic principle. You need to understand exactly how this thing works and why it is important. Have you just not listened to the leader of the government and the leader of the opposition in the Senate? No, you didn't listen to them, did you? They were just talking about the importance of parliamentary privilege. You ought to understand it. You ought to, ought to respect what happens in this place. Okay? This is absolutely a disgrace. There's no other word for it. The government uh, has directed an official to apply secrecy in contravention to the ruling of a judicial officer. I've never seen that before, and I think it breaks the rule of law. Thank you, Senator Patrick, and I'll remind you in future to direct all of your comments to the chair. Thank you. Um, Senator Farrell. Uh, thank oh, you. I beg your pardon, I need to put the question. Sorry. <laughs> so the question is that the um, motion is moved by Senator Patrick be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. Sorry, Senator Farrell, you, this is like your third time jumping up, so I went to third you. Time, <laughs> third time lacking, uh, Madam uh, Deputy uh, President. Uh, I rise to take note of the answers given by Senator Birmingham to the questions asked by Senators Smith that is uh, Mario Smith, uh, Wong and Grogan. Um, <clears throat> Deputy President, uh, I want to speak about the uh, lies of the, uh, of the Prime Minister that we've uh, seen in uh, recent months, but in particular in recent, uh, recent days. Um, we, all, we all know, know about the, uh, the Prime Minister's um, ability to uh, bend the, the, the truth. We saw it first um, with simple things like um, his football team. Um, he claims that he was a Cronulla Sharks uh, supporter when we know all along he was in fact a, uh, a rugby union um, <clears throat> supporter. Now, I know you come from Western Australia and uh, union and league are not particularly uh, strong sports over there, but in <clears throat> New South Wales and Queensland, these are important distinctions and for the the Prime Minister to mislead um, the Australian people about who he really supports and, uh, and, 
who his, uh, his uh, football team is, is, uh, is very worrying. And of course, <clears throat> it went further, much further, of course, during the period of the sports rorts uh, scandal. You'll be very familiar with that, Deputy President, where we had the color-coded document and documents being transferred uh, between Senator Mackenzie <clears throat> and the Prime Minister uh, to hand out funds that were supposed to be for women's uh, sports um, around the countryside directed to marginal seats that the government were, were, was, was trying to win. But <clears throat> there's been a more recent big lie um, from, the, from the Prime Minister, and I want to talk about that. And that, that's in the form of the, the legislation that's going to come forward to us one of these days about voter identification, the, the so-called voter integrity um, law. Now, the big lie, what's the big lie here? Well, the big lie is uh, that there is something wrong with the Australian electoral system, that there are all these um, people out in the community who at election time are multiple voters. Now, it simply is not true, Madam Deputy uh, President. Um, at the last election, uh, there was a total of 2,000 people who voted more than once. So out of a population of almost 16 million people who voted at the last election, um, there was only 2,000 people who voted more than once. And the evidence from the Australian Electoral Commission uh, is that most of those people who voted uh, more than once were over the age of 80 and uh, in many cases English was a second language. Um, we do not have a problem with multiple voting in this country. Uh, in fact, the um, commissioner, the AEC commissioner, um, in evidence recently in the estimates process, described the issue as vanishingly small. So why is it, um, <coughs> Madam Deputy President, that we find that the Prime Minister says that that problem requires every single Australian 16 million voters likely at the next election uh, to come along on, at, uh, on election day and, uh, and show some form of identification. Now, for 120 years, uh, Madam uh, Deputy President, Australians have got themselves on the electoral roll. Um, they've come along on election day. They've uh, queued up, perhaps had a sausage like we had this morning with the uh, uh, protest uh, outside the front of uh, parliament and got their name struck off, been given a ballot paper and go along and vote. Now, for the first time in our electoral history, 16 million people are going to be required to produce some identification before they're allowed to vote. Now, why would you do this? So, one of the consequences, one of the clear consequences of that, of course, is you're going to be spending a lot more time at the, uh, at the polling booth, perhaps double, perhaps three times as much time as uh, you're spending at the moment. Why on earth, in the period of the worst uh, pandemic in Australian history, where you're trying to keep social distancing, why on earth uh, would you um, want to keep people at the polling booth longer than absolutely is required to exercise their democratic vote? Well, I'll tell you the answer, Deputy President. This government is so worried about the next election, so worried about their polling results, that they want to suppress Australian voting numbers. They don't want anybody who's likely to vote for them, against them. Thank you, Senator uh, Farrell. Your time has expired. Senator Bragg. Deputy President, very much. Uh, I rise to take note of the answers today and uh, with reference to the uh, electoral law amendments that are before this particular chamber. And there are many bills which are before the parliament which have been drafted up in response to, to JSCM inquiries or the inquiry into the, the last federal election. Uh, I mean, and there is no question that over the long run uh, the expectation that people wouldn't have to provide any sort of ID at a polling place, I think, is really out of date and out of touch. Um, during this pandemic, Australians have become so used to or accustomed to 
providing some form of ID. Uh, Senator Bragg, if I might just remind you, I appreciate uh, Senator Farrell did make reference to yep. the electoral laws, and he probably overstated that. But the, I'm listening to where you're going with this. But the, the questions asked of Labor senators by Senators Smith, Wong, and Grogan went to examples of where the Prime Minister has said one thing and then later said another thing. So that's really the characterisation of those three questions. And um, Senator Farrell was using the voter laws as a reference. And I appreciate he did go on a little, but as he only had 30 seconds to go, I, I, I allowed that through. But. Okay. Well, thank you, Deputy President. Um, my, I was here for the last few minutes of the statement, and yeah. I think it was all about the electoral amendment. So, um, I mean, I'm happy to talk about anything, uh, but in relation to uh, in integrity uh, in, in government, and I think that's where you're wanting to go here. Um, I mean, I, I, look, much has been said about these commissions and, and what sort of arrangements we should have in Canberra. Um, I don't think that calling it an integrity commission is the way to go. Um, I am much more of the view that um, it should be focused on corruption, and I would be minded to call it an anti corruption commission. Um, and that's what I think it should be focused on, any form of corruption. I think people have different definitions of integrity, and integrity is important in government. And there are institutions which are in operation all the time, which ensure that there is scrutiny of government. And in fact, the Senate plays a very important role here, because the Senate runs the estimates process. The Senate runs committees of inquiry. Um, the COVID-19 Select Committee, although I haven't been a member of that committee, I think has done some important work over the course of this pandemic. Uh, and it, it has brought to light matters of public interest through its public hearings and through its submissions process uh, on the vaccination program, on border matters, really material matters. So I, I would be of the view that the Victorian model uh, would be a, a preferable model for us to have in Canberra as opposed to the New South Wales model. But I wouldn't call it Integrity Commission. I would be calling it an Anti-Corruption Commission. My understanding of this is that under the Victorian model, there is a process where a brief of evidence needs to be established before coercive powers uh, are deployed. Uh, and I think that is a reasonable proposition. I think a reasonable body of work should be done uh, before anything else occurs. Um, um, Senator Bragg, I'm sorry hello. to interrupt you again, but nice to see you. the three questions um, from Labor senators, from Senators Smith, Wong and Grogan, uh, went to the Prime Minister. They were focused on the Prime Minister. That's, okay. and, and comments he had made and then later made a different um, comment about. So. Okay. Right. Well, as I say, um, I think you're talking about matters of integrity here. Yes, so it I've certainly is about integrity. To and that integrity was focused on the Prime Minister. Voter integrity or whether it's, um, it's been um, matters of how we ensure that there is uh, confidence in our system of government. Um, I don't think that getting into uh, personal attacks is the way to go, and I won't be engaging in that sort of business here. Uh, and I think that that only diminishes the public debate here. And um, you know, I don't think this is a, a partisan comment to make at all. But I think if if you look at the way that, that question time runs here or in the House, I mean, it really is low rent stuff, and um, I think it is a poor reflection on us as an institution. Um, it is way too scripted, um, and all this, this personal attack stuff I don't, I don't think does anything for anyone. Um, I would say, though, that um, I've been very impressed with the work done by the Senate committees. Um, I've been very impressed with the, the quality of the public servants that run these particular uh, secretariats. And in my experience, the Senate committees take the Senate 
and therefore the Australian people into places that um, other institutions don't go. And we are able to hear people's voices. And so I do think that we do incredible work here on behalf of the Australian people. But I don't think that we are, we are, we are focusing on the right stuff when we are engaging in endless personal attacks. I mean, there of course is a role to look at people's public records and what they say, but I don't think that getting into personal attacks is the way to go, and I, I won't be engaging in that. Thank you, Senator Bragg. Um, Senator Mariel Smith. Thank you, Deputy President. It's always um, a delight to follow Senator Bragg. That was quite the ride uh, through the different areas you thought we were talking about, but thank you for your contribution. Um, I do just want to, to go to one of Senator Bragg's points. Uh, it's a point raised in question time as well in response to the questions asked by me and other Labor senators. And that was the, the government accusing us of engaging in personal attacks. And I want to lend my support to what Senator Bragg has said. Of course, there is no room for personal, personal attacks on individual senators in this place. But these are questions not of personal attacks. They're not questions of personality. They go to questions of integrity. They go to questions about the way the government is run and what diminishes the debate in this country as well as personal attacks on individuals is dishonesty, dishonesty in the public discourse. And that's why we're asking these questions. That's why we were prosecuting these questions. Because from this Prime Minister, we've seen a pattern of dishonesty since he's taken the Prime Ministership, and indeed perhaps long before that too. A pattern of dishonesty which goes to a question of integrity, which runs through the heart of how this government is run, which goes to the heart of how this government deals with issues of accountability, which goes to the heart of how this government approaches issues of scrutiny. So they're relevant questions, and I don't think it's fair to say that it diminishes the debate. It's the dishonesty which diminishes the debate. And in question time today, when we ask these questions, when we pose these questions about the mistruths told by the Prime Minister, we saw members of the government wilt, delicate as flowers, so sensitive, so delicate, so delicate couldn't even answer the questions. And I get why you feel a little delicate, little petals, because you feel scammed too. You feel scammed by this Prime Minister. Because you had one bloke once, right? He was Prime Minister. And then you had another bloke who wanted to be Prime Minister. You guys weren't too keen on him. So you sort of looked through the, through the ranks of you and got the guy from marketing, and you gave him a crack, only to learn that when, uh, when the one thing you thought he was good at, marketing and spin, he can't actually prosecute. He's missing the point of marketing, right? Brand consistency. Brand consistency. If you're a good marketer, you've got to be able to run with brand consistency, which means you've got to have a consistent message in what you're selling. You've got to have a consistent message. And the Prime Minister can't get his story straight about anything in question time. He can't even get his story straight in question time on one issue. And then he has to come back when no one's looking, no one's in the chamber, because that would be pretty embarrassing for the Prime Minister, and correct the record. Correct the record. It's, uh, it, it's, it's interesting for a marketing guy. It's interesting, right, if you can't handle that. So I get why you're feeling a little delicate. I get why you're feeling a little delicate and a little precious about these questions, because you feel ripped off. You feel ripped off that you went to the dude for marketing and he can't even do that job properly. Pretty disappointing. But this Prime Minister, he cannot tell the truth. He cannot tell the truth. And he falls over himself. He can't even tell the truth about telling the truth. But that's embarrassing. It's embarrassing. But worse than being embarrassing is it goes to issues of integrity. And that's why it's perfectly reasonable for us to raise these questions in question time, when it goes to integrity, when it goes to accountability, when it goes to scrutiny. And this government seems allergic to all of those things, allergic to scrutiny, allergic to accountability. You let mistruth run through the heart of your government. And in this place, in this chamber, I agree, Senator Bragg, 
we should hold ourselves to a higher standard than others, which means it's more than appropriate for us to call that dishonesty out, for us to call out the examples, not just the one I referred to in my question to the minister representing the Prime Minister in this place, but also to the questions Senator Grogan asked about Ms Holgate, also to the questions that Senator Wong asked about the Prime Minister's dealings with the President of France. Indeed, ask him about how he feels about the Prime Minister's integrity. These are legitimate questions, accountability, scrutiny. I appreciate you feel a bit delicate in answering them, but it's more than reasonable that we pose them. Thank you, Senator Smith. Your time has expired. Senator Van. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. And I assure Senator Smith, Senator Mariel Smith, that I'll be anything but delicate in this. Because what we've seen today is marketing spin at its greatest. We've seen the Labor Party have their marketing plans exposed in the parliament by Senator Birmingham after the attacks from those on opposite, and now these questions in take note, that they are going to go after the Prime Minister, that they are going to highlight that he has been slow and late on vaccines, climate change bushfires and financial support for Victoria. Well, let me set the record straight on this, because we're anything but slow or late on any of these. So, in November 5th last year, the Prime Minister put out an announcement that we, he had already ordered 135 million doses of vaccine, more than f uh, enough for five doses for every Australian. And then last week, the Victoria, my home state, Premier Andrews says in the media that uh, he that uh, the Prime Minister forgot to order vaccines. Now we know that's a lie. We know that the, the Premier of Victoria lied on that. So. As a, on the 21st of February this year, the Prime Minister announced that the Australian government had a comprehensive plan to, and I'm quoting here, has a, a comprehensive plan to offer COVID-19 vaccines to all Australians by the end of October 2021. And I think we've seen by the end of October, or maybe a day or two after, that was done. We hit 80 per cent vaccinated. It's more than 91 per cent of the eligible population over 16 are now protected. No one said that the rollout of the vaccine had to be a linear line, that it had to be straight. Of course it's going to ramp up. We had no vaccine. There were countries that demanded vaccine and needed vaccine higher than we did, and they got it. But we met our promise to the Australian people. The Prime Minister made a promise to the Australian people, and we met it. Now, our record on the vaccine roll, it is rollout is better than that in the UK, better than the US, better than in New Zealand. So, with more vaccines going into arms every day, it's likely that we'll overtake more vaccines. Now, the Labor Party, their position on vaccines is woeful. The Labor Party has endorsed the candidate for the seat of Higgins, who spent all of last year and most of this year putting, um, putting out misinformation, creating vaccine hesitancy about the AstraZeneca vaccine, where she said it's a population-level experiment which has high stakes attached to it. Personally, I'm not comfortable with that approach at all. She also said there is a possibility that the AstraZeneca vaccine will be rolled out to 10 million adults. We still might be being vulnerable when we relax our international borders. Now, we know that's not true. We know that's not true. Would uh, the, uh, candidate, the Labor candidate for Higgins, would she have voted with uh, Pauline's One Nation yesterday? Sounds like it from this. She's promoted vaccine hesitancy all the way through. So we can see that Labor has had a really ordinary run on that. Bush, the financial support for Victoria, I'm happy to talk to that. The Morrison government has provided over $4 billion to Victoria through covid uh, economic support that is more per capita than any other state in the country. Um, Senator Van, I'm also going to remind you that the questions today um, from Senators Smith, Wong, and Grogan went to uh, the Prime Minister. Oh, and I'm answering that. I'm answering that. Uh, thank you. I am. I'm happy to take that point of order because I'm being directly relevant. I'm addressing each one of these. You were. And you I am. I'm addressing. I'm correcting the Senator, record. Senator Van, 
I'm, it's not an argument. I'm simply directing you to the questions that were asked by Labor senators. You started off on track, uh, but uh, over the last um, 30 or 40 seconds, you've gone off track. And I'm simply pointing to you that what the what the comments were. And now, Senator Smith. Madam President, in a contribution of five minutes, I think going off the track for 30 to 40 seconds does not warrant oh, an right. interven Senator intervention Smith, by the chair. It's not a debating point. I'm simply directing the senator to uh, the take note questions. Thank you, Senator Van. Chair, you know, that's exactly what I'm doing. Labor is attacking the Prime Minister on a record that cannot be attacked. He's done exactly what he said he would do and what we would do. We said we'd take on climate change. I'm going to again to your document, the one that you're all clearly following in the chamber today. We're going to see for the next two weeks and until the election. You're clearly going to go after the Prime Minister. This is clearly your tactic, to your point, Madam Deputy President. This is your tactic that I'm correcting the record on. We said we'd take, we went to the election, we said we'd take a target 26 to 28 per cent as our Paris target for our N N NCD, um, and we are on track to meet that. The Prime Minister is keeping his promise on that. He's keeping his promise on meeting and beating the Paris target. We've already projected that we'll hit 35 per cent. So every one of your points in your marketing plan, when Senator Smith talks about marketing and spin, we can see yours. We can see straight through your tactics. It's not going to work. The people of Australia are not going to believe it, aren't going to stand for it, and you, you will see the results in Thank the you, election Senator next Van, year. Your time has expired. Senator Grogan. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Um, Senator Van, we will hold the Prime Minister to account for his lack of integrity, and we will continue to do that. The pattern appears to be say something misleading, duck, weave, obfuscate, and then dig your heels in when you're called out on it. We saw just yesterday in the other place, when asked about his infamous trip to Hawaii, the Prime Minister told the parliament that he had, he had sent a text message to the leader of the opposition telling him where he was going. That is not true. It's very untrue. What he said was he was going on leave. Leave is not a destination. But <laughs> uh, Senator Van, I'd ask you to withdraw that. Thank you. Senator Grogan. Anthony Albanese did receive a text, that is true, but it did not mention where the Prime Minister was going. It did not mention his tropical destination. It did not mention that he was travelling overseas, a point that you think would be rather relevant. But what's astounding here is that this was unprompted. There was no reason to even mention that text message, none whatsoever. But when facing some political hot water, Again, a duck, a weave, an obfuscation, trying to get around a particular point, the Prime Minister brought this text message up of his own volition and then inappropriately and inaccurately referenced it. What I also find very interesting here is that the political gain that could have occurred or the personal gain that could have occurred by Anthony Albanese actually declaring that he had received it was not used at all. Anthony Albanese has a deep integrity and sees very clearly that a personal message, a private message, is just that and did not mention it. And that was two years ago. In two years, he has not brought it up. The contrast could not be bigger here between these two people. We have, we have Anthony Albanese not mentioning these texts because private correspondence should be private. And then we have the Prime Minister, Mr Morrison, making really, really poor calls with some of these things. We only have to look at this disastrous diplomatic experience with the French president um, leaking those text messages. The leader of one country, of this country, leaking a text message, a private text message, from the leader of another country. This is just woeful. 
the lack of integrity, significant, serious lack of integrity of the person who we have leading this country is despicable. How on earth are the Australian people supposed to trust him? And then we have the whole saga with um, former Australia Post Chief Executive Christine Holgate. Mr Morrison set off a chain of events in question time that ended with the highly regarded chief executive being forced out of her position, costing taxpayers more than a million dollars when she was awarded a termination payment. The Prime Minister attempted to gaslight the nation, making out like Ms Holgate had left the organisation of her own volition. She did not. We had the whole Brian Houston fiasco, where the PM tried to get his mate into an official White House function, and even the Trump administration wouldn't have him. And the lies that went on after that, where the Prime Minister just said he hadn't done it. When it finally came out in the American press that he had, he had absolutely tried to get his mate in. He then had to backtrack, duck, weave, backtrack and find some way of wriggling out of it. His commentary was, I don't comment on gossip or stories about other stories. That's hardly integrity for the people of Australia. He then went on that he just didn't want to be distracted by it. The true answer is he didn't want to answer the question. He didn't want to provide that clarity and honesty to the people of Australia. And he then said that at the end of the day it was not a significant matter. I beg to disagree. And he finished it off by saying, people have not asked me about it for months. Does that make it not an important issue? I think when it comes to the integrity of the Prime Minister of this country, I would fundamentally disagree. Are there any further contributions? Senator Cox? Yes. <laughs> that, uh, we take, the Senate takes note of questions to Senator Birmingham from various senators. Those that opinion say aye, against say no, the ayes have it. Senator Cox. Thank you, uh, Mr President. I move that the Senate take note of Minister Rustin's response to my questions. Um, the Woodside approval of the Scarborough gas project, it's a, a dark and devastating day for our climate, our planet and our future. And, and as a mother of, of two daughters, I, I, sh I shudder to think what that means for our future, for our children in 2030. Uh, when we have projects like this that are being funded, encouraged and endorsed by governments of this country. This pollution that the Scarborough Pluto project is equal to 15 coal-fired power stations every single year, not over the life of the project, every single year of that project. The emissions from this facility equal around 5% of the current total emissions every year in WA. This is greenwashing, greenwashing of what Woodside have put out. And the scientific evidence is pretty clear that this project is actually going to be worse than Adani. It's devastating both for our climate, it's devastating for our marine life. This project is going to impact on the coral reefs, the whales and their migration pattern the turtles and the dugongs in this area, it's devastating for traditional owners of that country who are trying to protect country. And as a First Nations person who's walked on that country, it is devastating. It is devastating for their water sources, their traditional foods that they rely on in this area, and that Scarborough will further destroy the Murrajulga area's world's largest and oldest collection of First Nations rock art. And this includes the first ever recording of a human face. It's quite significant in this area because it's nowhere else, nowhere else in this country. We have one of the oldest living cultures in the world, and still we don't respect, we don't want to protect, and we certainly don't want to make sure that it doesn't get ruined by 
development and mining and the resources sector that uh, our governments protect. This is also being considered for World Heritage listing. Hundreds of these rock carvings have already been destroyed, have already been removed for gas development. So the ones that are there we need to save. The rock art that's been eaten away is being eaten away by highly acidic gases that are being released from this existing Pluto plant that's already there. And sadly, this is going to be expanded. It's been expanded because it was approved yesterday. What's happening to the Marujuka art is being described as Duke and Gorge on slow motion. So not only is that uh, this rock art just lays out in the elements. It's not in caves, it's not in rock shelters, as it was in Jukun, but the importance of protecting that environment then from those gases is our responsibility, our collective responsibility. It's not just about the artwork, the rock art that exists there. This is the site of the Seven Sisters dreaming story, the songline that goes from the Murujuga area right across central Australia, across this country. It tells the story of the first peoples of this country, which no one in this place respects, clearly, because they don't care. They keep approving for it to be destroyed. If you dig down in that country, you will be able to see the song line. You will be able to help the people of the Murujuga area to help recover and heal this place. But well, no, we're not doing that. We have built an agreement. And when they built this agreement with the traditional owners group of this area, they went to them and said, there's got to be a train here, just like Hammersley Iron have built. But no, this is a gas transporting uh, train. It's not an iron ore train. And still, we have Woodside that say, oh no, there's no direct impact on First Nations cultural heritage there. They haven't even updated their Section 18 approval since 2007. <laughs> this is cultural genocide in action, people. Absolutely. This is where we get our native title connection. We can prove our unbroken continuation to culture through cultural heritage. So how is it the Woodside are getting away with this? Well, no doubt it's about their dirty donations, and it's contrary to what the minister has said during question time, that these gas policies are being driven by big corporations like Woodside. Their donations is what they rely on, and just like the Northern Endeavour project, they will abandon them and we will cover the clean-up costs. This Senator has got Cox, risk, risk, risk written all over it. Your time has expired. The question is that the Senate take note of answers from Minister Rustin. Those of that opinion say aye. Can say no. The ayes have it. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? Senator Fittervanti-Wells. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, pursuant to notice given yesterday— Order. On... Order. Senator Firavanti Wells, you have the call. Thank you, Mr. President. Pursuant to notice given yesterday on behalf of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation, I withdraw notices of motion proposing the disallowance of four legislative instruments made under the Industry Research and Development Act 1986. Senator Waters? Uh, yes, President, I just seek your uh, assistance. One of, uh, when I think one of those four has been transferred into my name, um, and I'm intending to move it. Can I seek your guidance on whether I so move that at this present time? My understanding is that, pursuant to the motion passed this morning, uh, the matter you're concerned about will come on following the placing of business. I'll just confirm that with the clerk. That's correct. Thank you, Senator Firavanti Wells. Uh, I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? Clerk. No postponement notifications have been lodged. Committees have lodged extension notifications as shown at item 10 on today's order of business. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. And now, pursuant to order, oh, sorry, Senator Urquhart, Seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I move that leave of absence be granted to Senator Polly for 22nd of November to 2nd of December for personal reasons. Uh, the question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it.
Now, pursuant to order, the Senate will consider a disallowance motion. Clerk. Business of the Senate, notice of motion number one, standing in the name of Senator Waters, proposing the disallowance of the Industry Research and Development Carbon Capture, Use and Storage Development Program Instrument 2021. Senator Waters. Thank you, President. And I move uh, the motion. That's a bit like Groundhog Day, really, isn't it? The Greens are in here once again trying to stop this government giving public money to big coal and gas to open up new ventures right on the, uh, in the aftermath of Glasgow and right when we are in a climate crisis, and just as those same companies have donated generously to the re-election funds of uh, not only this government but, sadly, also the opposition. So here we are again. And uh, Spoiler alert, we'll be back here again tomorrow on a different disallowance to give yet more taxpayer money uh, to yet more coal and gas companies, uh, that time to frack the Beedaloo Basin against the wishes of First Nations communities. Uh, but today, uh, today it's a different legislative instrument to uh, give free taxpayer money to wealthy gas and coal companies. Uh, and today, with a vote on this disallowance, the Senate has the chance to stop $50 million going to coal and gas companies for that mythical technology of carbon capture and storage. The unicorn indeed. Now, Combined with today's 50 million and tomorrow's 50 million on the Beedaloo disallowance, which we urge the Labor opposition and the crossbenchers to stand with us on, that's $100 million. We senators could stop $100 million of taxpayer dollars, public money, flowing into the offshore bank accounts of coal and gas corporations. We could do that here in the coming days. And I might note that those same corporations often don't pay a cent of tax in Australia because they exploit loopholes that ordinary Australians don't have access to. And those same corporations pour millions into the re-election coffers of the big political parties. So the instrument that we're seeking to disallow today uh, would set up the Carbon Capture Use and Storage Development Fund. Grant recipients have already been announced for the fund. And surprise, surprise, some of Australia's biggest polluters and this government's largest donors make the list. Political capture and storage is a proven technology, even if carbon capture and storage is far from it. So let's have a look at all the money that this government is handing over to coal and gas corporations through laws and regulations before this parliament right now. $15 million to major donor Santos who also are a deeply embedded lobbyist that often cycles staff in and out of the offices of MPs and then back to work for Santos again. Um, I might note that that $15 million that Santos will receive under these various uh, instruments is a pretty good return on investment for them, considering they made $2.1 million in political donations over the past nine years. And then they get back $15 million from the taxpayer. That is a very good return on investment. Don't know if you'd get that anywhere else. Uh, five, uh, $5 million under these instruments would also go to a subsidiary of Australia's largest coal exporter, Glencore. Might add they're another donor. And they also have a reputation for tax avoidance. Uh, Borrell will get a few million too. And the chairman of Borrell. Ryan Stokes, who is of course the son of billionaire Kerry Stokes, asked the treasurer to be the best man at his wedding. Nice little cosy relationship there. There's also cash handouts for companies uh, like Santos, but also Beach Energy, which is another Kerry Stokes company, to access billions of dollars of public money through the Emissions Reduction Fund, with the government paying the polluter to maybe store just a small portion of their emissions. Um, in yet more taxpayer larks, the Beedaloo fracking grant, which we'll seek to disallow tomorrow, will give Liberal-aligned gas company Empire Energy $21 million of public money. But Santos have also got their hand out under that fund, alongside two other secretive companies operating out of tax havens for another $29 million. There's also $30 million for Australian Industrial Energy, which is wholly owned by Australia's second richest billionaire, Andrew Forrest, to build a new gas fire 
power station at Port Kembla. And a bill is moving through the House right now that would formally relieve major gas donor Woodside of around $1 billion in liabilities for clean-up costs for their old rig and spread that across the entire industry. That same Woodside company that my colleague Senator Cox just pointed out has had some favours done for them by the state Labor government and by the federal Liberal government to approve the latest climate disaster that would be the equivalent of 15 coal-fired power stations in a climate crisis. So political capture clearly works, but what we know is that carbon capture and storage does not. Its whole purpose is to pretend that you can keep burning fossil fuels. We cannot, and that is perfectly clear after the Glasgow Pact, which this government signed up to while it was there and then has been crab walking away from ever since it returned. And Barnaby Joyce, Mr. Barnaby Joyce, had another tantrum. Carbon capture is the perfect excuse for coal and gas companies and their wholly owned subsidiaries in the Liberal and National parties. It's the whole perfect excuse for them to pretend that we don't have to worry about the climate crisis or climate collapse. But if those big coal and gas companies truly thought that carbon capture was the future, surely they'd be putting some of their own money into it. But instead, they spend that money on donations and then they get the taxpayers to pick up the bill instead. In June 2004, Prime Minister Howard said that he was providing $1.5 billion quote, to demonstrate breakthrough technologies. End quote. Seventeen years later, we are still throwing public money at coal and gas companies, hoping for this technology to break through, while clean technologies have thrived and grown around the world and work and create jobs, often in regional communities where they are needed. Just one single carbon capture and storage project has been developed in Australia, despite billions of public money having been thrown at that uh, process, just one. Chevron got $60 million in public funding for that one, and it's broken down more times than a 1980s Datsun. CCS is a waste of money, and it's not even a waste of those companies' money. It's a waste of taxpayer money because they won't waste their own money on it. We've got the solutions that we need to solve the climate crisis. We've got the wind, the solar, the batteries, the electric vehicles, the green hydrogen. We've got those technologies. We've got that innovation. We have those skills onshore and those resources. All we need is a government with ambition to take on the coal and gas corporations and to create the jobs of the future in clean renewable energies, jobs that will last jobs that will safeguard the livelihoods of those in those currently fossil fuel reliant communities and jobs that won't risk the health of those workers and jobs that won't be sacked when their big coal company mechanises and automates. Now, when Glasgow Australia signed up to the Glasgow Climate Pact along with nearly 200 other countries and a critical part of that agreement that same agreement that, as I said, the government signed up to while we were there and has then been distancing itself from ever since on return, a key part of that pact was to phase down fossil fuel subsidies. And you'll recall that the G7 had also earlier resolved to phase out public subsidy for fossil fuels from memory uh, within the next three years. So I say to my colleagues, on the opposition benches, on the crossbench, to the government. Let's start the end of those fossil fuel subsidies now. Let's disallow this $50 million slush fund for big coal and gas corporations and use that money for real climate action instead. Use that money to work with those currently fossil fuel uh, reliant communities to plan that transition because it's coming and if we don't plan for it, it will be those workers and those communities that suffer from your lack of reality and your lack of planning and the fact that you are completely in hock to the fossil fuel sector. Let's use that time and that money not to give handouts to your political donors that are cooking the planet, but to work with communities and transition to a job-rich clean energy future that will reduce people's power bills and provide work. That's the kind of leadership that the country deserves. We're heading to an election 
The Greens have a proud plan to be funding a massive investment in renewable energy, publicly funded, great job creation, tackling the climate crisis, protecting what's left of our Great Barrier Reef, because half of it's already gone. It's not just bleached, it's dead over cumulative coral bleaching episodes. This is the choice that people have to make, and the Senate is going to be crucial for that, because at the moment we've got a government that's completely for sale to the fossil fuel industry. We've got an opposition that continues to take their donations too, I might add, and they should stop accepting those as well. And we've got One Nation um, who take money from just about anyone um, and just tick off on whatever the government proposes. So the next election is going to be crucial, and the climate cannot wait for some leadership and for some decisions that are made on the basis of science and the public interest, not on the basis of a future fancy lobbying job or the basis of a big political donation. Senator Dunningham. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Well, the government will, of course, be opposing this motion. And contrary to much of what's just been said, uh, the funding is provided to support six carbon capture projects around the country, which will create close to 470 direct jobs, jobs clearly that the Australian Greens don't care about. And it'll also, contrary to the assertions by Senator Waters, deliver $412 million of investment on top of what's provided through this program. And much of this occurs in a part of Australia the Greens certainly don't care about, as demonstrated by what we just heard, regional Australia. It will reduce emissions from coal generation, concrete and gas production, amongst other sources of emissions, uh, something we actually need to have a functioning economy in this country. Uh, that's the reality that we live in, something they tend to ignore on that thin wedge of the Senate down there. Carbon capture and storage is recognised by the Biden administration, the United Kingdom, the EU, Japan. Singapore, Canada, Korea and many other countries, as it's an important emissions reduction technology. And of course, the IEA have said recently that a failure to support CCS would leave the world with, quote, very limited chances to reach our climate goals, if any, again a dose of reality in this debate. If successful, this motion would stop these six projects in their tracks and abandon workers in Australia's traditional industries and, importantly, also in regional Australia. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, Labor opposes the disallowance. Unlike the Greens Party, we are not ideological on carbon capture use and storage. We support any technology that stacks up scientifically and commercially. On carbon capture use and storage, Order. as with other technologies, that judgment will be made by the expert and markets, not by the Greens Party's stunts in the Senate. So the program should be allowed to proceed and Labor will oppose the disallowance. I will put the question. The question is that the instrument be disallowed. Those that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. no. The noes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
stop the bells. The question is that the instrument be disallowed. Eyes are passed to the right of the chair, nose to the left. I appoint Senator McKim, teller for the eyes. Senator Urquhart, teller for the nose. The result of the division is eyes 8, nose 27. The question is resolved in the negative. We shall now proceed to the discovery of formal business. Are there any formal motions? We'll proceed in an order to facilitate the chamber. Senator Griff, could we start with 1265? Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, I ask the general business notice of motion number 1265 proposing the introduction of a bill be taken as formal. There being no objection, it's taken as formal. I move that the following bill be introduced, a bill for an act to amend the Health Insurance Act 1973 and for related purposes. The question is the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Senator Griff. I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. The question is that the bill be read a first time. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Health Insurance Act, 19, Health Insurance Act 1973 and for related purposes. Senator Griff. I move that this bill now be read a second time and I seek leave to table an explanatory memorandum relating to the bill. There being no objection, leave is granted. I table an explanatory memorandum and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard and to continue my remarks. There being no objection, leave is granted. We will now move to 1266, also in the name of Senator Griff. Uh, I ask the general business notice of motion number 1266 be taken as a formal motion. There being no objection, this motion is taken as formal. Uh, Senator Griff. I move the motion. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. We will now go to 1268 in the name of Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 1268 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? If not, Senator Urquhart. I move the motion. Question. Senator Dunning. I seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted for one minute? Excellent. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, the government has nothing to hide here, and in fact, it's my pleasure to table the government's response to this inquiry. Question. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. We will now go to 1271 uh, in the name of Senator Hanson. Senator McGrath. On behalf of Senator Hanson, I ask that general business notice of motion number 1271 be taken as a formal motion. There being no objection, this is it's so agreed. I move the motion. The question is the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. We will now move to one, two. 
Oh, Senator Waters. Yes, can Apologies. I just ask that the votes of the Australian Greens be recorded on motion 1271 um, as opposing it that will motion? It will be so recorded. Senator Urquhart, which one were you going uh, to go 1270. to? 1270. 1270. Oh, we'll, we'll get there. We'll go now to 1264 in the name of Senator Patrick. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I seek leave to amend General Business Notice of Motion Number One Two Six Four before asking that it be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection? If there's no objection, leave is granted. I amend the motion in the terms circulated in the chamber, and I ask that it be taken as formal. Can we just just hold for a moment? We're just. Sorry, Senator Patrick, uh, okay. uh, where were we up to? Did you move okay. the motion? Okay, I, I amend the motion in the terms circulated in the chamber, and I ask that it be taken as, a for, as formal. So, uh, there being no objection, is so, so agreed? I move the motion as amended. Question is that the motion be agreed to, Senator Dunning. Uh, I seek leave to make a short statement. For one minute. Uh, yes, for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, that was the statement. You are? Okay, great. Well, thanks statement. for giving me one minute. Let's use it now, shall we? Okay. <laughs> All right. The. Uh, and the amendment may deal with some of this, but look, the preemptive nature of Part E of this motion inappropriately attempts to bind the Senate in the future. The decisions of the Senate on responses to orders for the production of documents should be made on the terms of the responses provided. It remains the view of the government that National Cabinet was established as a committee of Cabinet and its documents and deliberations should remain confidential. On 17 September 2021, the Prime Minister and all the leaders of state and territory governments made it clear that National Cabinet has strengthened relationships by facilitating regular confidential discussions in the national interest, founded on the same principles of trust, confidence and collaboration which underpin state, territory and Commonwealth cabinets. Cabinet confidentiality is a long-standing principle of Westminster systems of government and a well-established ground for the claim of public interest immunity with respect to orders by the Senate. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. Aye. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Stop the bells. The question is the motion be agreed to. Eyes are passed to the right of the chair, nose to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart, teller for the eyes. Senator McGrath, teller for the nose. The result of the division is ayes 23, no 17. The question is resolved in the affirmative. I would give senators moments to resume their seats, but I would ask senators to remain in the chamber. There will be further divisions. We will now move to 1270 in the name of Senator Gallagher. Senator Urquhart. Um, oh, sorry, Senator Patrick. Oh. President, uh, noting the success of that motion, I, I'd like to I'd, I'd seek leave of the chamber to give notice of a motion that I'll put tomorrow for an order for production relating to documents that uh, have uh, not been provided to the, the Senate on the basis of a national cabinet claim. Is leave granted? An OPD. Sorry. I waited until after I the motion had passed. Leave. Senator Patrick, yeah. so I, I seek leave to leave, leave. Leave was denied, so okay. Thank you. Senator Eckert, one two seven zero. Thank you, Mr. President. Before I move the motion, I wish to inform the chamber that Senator Hanson Young will uh, sponsor the motion along with Senator Gallagher. Um, I ask that general business notice of motion number 1270 be taken as a formal motion. There, uh, if there is any objection to this, is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being no objection. Senator I move Rickett. the motion. Senator Dunningham. I seek leave to make a short statement. One in a minute, Senator Dunningham. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, no publicly funded entity is above the scrutiny of the Senate, and there should be uh, no special set of arrangements for one entity over any of the others. The Australian government recognises the importance of the ABC. Its broadcasting services contribute to a sense of national identity, inform and entertain audiences, and reflect the cultural diversity of the Australian community. The independence of the ABC is enshrined in legislation. Parliament has guaranteed this independence so that the ABC's decisions are free of political interference. However, as a publicly funded entity, the ABC is not above the scrutiny for how they conduct themselves using taxpayers' money. I will put the motion uh, moved by Senator Urquhart. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Again, say no. no. The noes have it. Ring the bells for four, four minutes.
Stop the bells. Could 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 individuals resume their seat? Uh, the question is that the motion be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Burkett, teller for the ayes, and teller to Senator McGrath, teller for the noes. Senator Rustin, you will need to sit down, please. The result of the division is ayes 23, noes 22. The question is resolved in the affirmative. Senator Hanson-Young, uh, one, the matter 1267. Thank you, Mr President. Given the success of that motion, I will withdraw. The Thank previous motion, I will withdraw this one. Thank you, Senator Hanson-Young. Senator Patrick, were you seeking the call? Yes, uh, yes uh, Mr. President. I seek uh, leave to um, uh, uh, to give notice of a motion, which I'm happy to describe to the chamber. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave so, is granted. I give notice that on the next sitting day, I shall move that, noting the Senate resolution of today. Uh, relating to national cabinet and public interest immunity, they be laid on the table by relevant ministers no later than 9 o'clock, uh, 9 a.m. on the 30th of November 2021. The documents required by any Senate order, committee resolution, or question on notice to which a claim of public interest immunity was made on unacceptable grounds that material related to the national cabinet is subject to cabinet confidentiality, and I will give some examples of those documents. Thank you, Senator Patrick. I believe that is formal business done. I'm not seeing. All right, we will now move to the urgency motion. I'll give people a chance to resume their seats. I inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, 17 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the letter from Senator Urquhart proposing a matter of urgency was chosen. It is shown at item 12 on today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clocks 
accordingly, and I call Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you very much, President. And I rise to contribute on the matter of urgency moved uh, by Senator Urquhart. Uh, and we are in a global race, a race to net zero, a race to secure the global job opportunities of renewable and low emissions technology and bring them right here to Australia. Uh, we are in a race that, under the Morrison government, uh, we are going to lose. We are going to lose this global race because we have a Prime Minister who always does too little, too late. A Prime Minister who just does not know how to lead and who doesn't have a vision for our country. Not only does this Prime Minister fail to see a bright future for Australia as a renewable superpower, he can't even see the opportunities which have always been right in front of him. We all know that during the 2019 election campaign, oh, no. Prime Minister Morrison famously now said that electric vehicles will end the weekend. And no matter how many times he tries to deny it now, that is simply what he said. Now he says electric vehicles are the key building block in the government's net zero plan. Well, two years of missed opportunity to put Australia at the front of the queue to develop an electric vehicle industry. But what can we expect from the government that famously turned its back on the Australian car manufacturing industry, a move which was responsible for the loss of thousands of skilled jobs in this country? Imagine what could have been achieved for this industry and these workers if the government had a plan and if they acted on the opportunities before them. The story for those thousands of skilled workers and small businesses which supported the industry would have been so, so different. But what can we expect from a government who is driven on politics and not on principles? From a government which is only now seeing the advantages of green technologies, even while other countries have been investing in them for decades. What a shambles is this government's climate policy. This government has seen no leadership from its Prime Minister. And as the world moves rapidly towards renewable energy, we have the opportunity for Australia to take the lead. We have the opportunity to become a renewable energy superpower to generate thousands of new jobs as part of a global green technology revolution, to support our renewable energy to the world, the opportunity to rewire our nation to take advantage of our sun and wind. And what we have right here in Australia right now is the opportunity to rebuild Australian manufacturing. Um, we have the opportunity to do that with cheaper renewable energy to make more of what we need right here in Australia. The world's climate emergency is Australia's jobs opportunity, and Australia needs a government that is up to the task, a government that gives the energy sector the policy certainty that it needs to invest. A government that has a plan to create thousands of good paying jobs while making power cheaper for our homes and our businesses. Instead, what we have is a government that is absolutely divided on this issue, unable to move forward from outdated and completely inadequate mid-term targets, unable to legislate its net zero by 2050 target because it's afraid it won't have the numbers on its own benches to get the job done. We have a government with climate policies which have seen us fall to last place on global climate action. And without a real plan, it is Australian workers who will pay the price. If we do not act fast enough, Australian industries will face international carbon tariffs. And again, it is Australian workers who will pay the price, Australian workers who will face losing their jobs. If we don't act fast enough to seize the opportunities in front of us, workers will miss out. Australia has the most to lose if we act too slowly to respond to the global green economy. But we also have the most to gain if only this government could act right now. Australia is best placed to have a thriving battery manufacturing sector. 
we can mine the lithium that we need right here in Australia, and we can take that lithium to manufacture batteries for our own electric vehicles. We can build more of what we need right here in this country, if only we have a government that has a plan to act and harness those opportunities. We can do all of that, all while creating good, secure jobs for workers right here in Australia. Jobs on union sites, good, secure jobs, jobs with decent pay and jobs that will last into the future. We can do more than dig things up in this country. We can use these natural advantages that we have of our resources and we can add value right here instead of shipping them off and then just buying them back. But we need the ambition to do it and we need a government with that ambition. We need a government with the leadership to get the job done. And we are falling behind because the Morrison government lacks the ambition and lacks the leadership that we need. We are losing the global race to bring these jobs here to Australia. Australians want a government that has a plan. They want a government that will act right now. And what I'm hearing from people in my home state, uh, in Victoria, is that right now is the time to bring these jobs here. Right now is the time that this global race is on. And the people that I've spoken to overwhelmingly want this government to support new jobs in renewables. They know that this is a once-in-a-generation opportunity to rebuild manufacturing and deliver good, secure jobs. And they don't want Australian workers to miss out. But this government has put forward uh, a plan that is just not a plan. It is just a glossy document that is full of promises and no delivery, uh, not unlike this government's Prime Minister. This is a glossy document that promises to get to net zero, but has no plan and no policy to get us all the way there. This is a plan, a glossy document, that promises that 100,000 jobs will be created, but again offers no policies and no plans to get that job done. Um, I asked the Department of Industry, Science, Energy and Resources about the government's net zero plan during the economics uh, committee hearings earlier this month. Uh, and I asked about the 100,000 jobs that this government claims will be created in its glossy document. I asked when these jobs will come online. When can we expect to see them? Uh, and the response from the department was, and I quote, well, from the perspective of the 100,000 figure, that is a longer term projection. So when will we see these jobs? In five years? In 10 years? What is the government's plan? When will this government tell us how they are going to seize the global opportunities that are there right now to bring these jobs to Australia? The answer, of course, uh, is that we don't know because the government doesn't know. They have no plan. They have no vision. Uh, and this government has had eight long years to figure it out. Uh, and time is running out because we have a leader who just doesn't know how to lead. We have a leader who is not prepared to get Australia into the global race. He is just not prepared to run the race himself. Uh, but what he is prepared to do is let the opportunities of the future simply pass him by and pass the rest of us by as well. This Prime Minister is just not up for the job. The Morrison government has had long enough to come up with a plan, and Australia can't afford to wait any longer. The next generation can't afford to wait any longer. The planet can't afford to wait any longer. And workers who need a plan for good, secure jobs from this government, they can't afford to wait any longer either. Australians don't want a government that thinks electric vehicles will end the weekend. They don't want a government that doesn't know how wind turbines work. They don't want a government that they can't trust to deliver the good, secure jobs for local communities. 
They want a government with vision. They want a government that brings our country together to win this global race, a government that grasps the opportunities of the future with both hands, delivering the benefits to all Australians. Senator Walsh, your time has expired. Senator Macdonald. I rise to speak on this urgency motion that will no doubt be filled with breathless despair. No wonder children are worried about the future. By the time you've finished listening to the Greens and the opposition, you wonder why you'd even get out of bed tomorrow. Well, I am not filled with that same kind of despair because I know that the future in Australia and around the world is optimistic. And the reason why I know that is because of how Australia has performed over the last 10 years. Because it is in regional Australia where we grow the food, where we grow the fibre, where we mine the minerals. And by the way, all the renewable wind and, and solar projects are, and where you'll also have us make the batteries and produce hydrogen, all of the stuff that you don't want to see in the cities. That's where the action is in rural and regional Australia, and we are doing a pretty fine job without outrageous legislation, restrictions and government driving an agenda that will drive Australians into the ground. Because we have the benefit in this country of having an Australian plan, a particular plan that suits our climate conditions, our growing conditions. Our unique part of the world deserves a unique plan, and that is what the coalition has committed to. Not the UN's plan, not Greta Thunberg's plan. It is a plan developed in consultation with the very people who generate the wealth, the food, the fibre, the minerals and the renewable energies of this nation. It is realistic and it is based on Australia's minuscule contribution to world's emissions, whilst the largest emitters continue uh, to go forth. Australia's emissions reductions uh, up to 2030 will be 28 per cent. That is, excluding, uh, that is including our export data. The EU, the EU, the great proponent of all things emissions reductions, has reduced less by 21 per cent. New Zealand has reduced by 4 per cent, and they exclude all of their agricultural industry. The UK, they've done well, down 34 per cent. The US, less than Australia, 13 per cent. At the same time, China has increased by 72 per cent, India by 86 per cent, and South Korea by 33 per cent. So, Australia is doing more than its fair share in this space—28 per cent emissions reductions doing it our way, doing it with encouragement, with collaboration, letting market forces drive this space, letting farmers introduce new technology, letting manufacturing introduce new technology, and guess what? It is making them more money. They are more profitable, they are more productive, and they are doing their bit for emissions reductions. And yet you won't hear that from the opposition. What you're going to hear about is taxes, fines, penalties, big sticks, because, of course, you couldn't possibly rely on Australians to do the right thing without uh, forced compliance, according to the opposition and the Greens. We have committed to a plan that allows Australia to keep digging, to keep mining, to keep farming, to keep the lights on, because, as of this point, Fossil fuel still supplies 85 per cent of our baseline energy needs, and it has been done in a cleaner, uh, more controlled way every day because of technology. Because of technology, we we have agreed to no caps on methane, and yet there is science that is going to deliver not just methane reduction through uh, feedlots and animal production but will also increase the productivity of those herds and increase the amount of meat that we can grow. Because what is more important than growing food? Something that people in the cities can't do. Even the most, the most successful backyard veggie garden is not going to feed a family, and we rely on our farmers to continue doing the job that they do 
growing food and fibre, not just for Australians, but for a good part of our neighbours and the world around us. Industry leads the way, and they do it because it's good for their business, they can maintain export markets, it's good for their profitability, and it's good for the people who work for them, who have job security. Now, I want to touch on some of the implementation of renewable energy in Queensland. With the, the introduction of uh, rebates, renewable energy rebates, it increased the cost of electricity by $1 billion across the state. $1 billion. So that is every mum and dad and household who is paying for the change of new technology. Now, that is fine. That is part of the nation's objectives. But remember that in North Queensland, where I'm from, we pay three times the cost of electricity three times the cost of electricity to mine vanadium, to mine copper, to mine uh, uh, lithium and those products that are so necessary in the world economy. We pay three times the amount of insurance, and banks and finance institutions are increasing the rate of finance in that part of the world because of climate risk. But yet we are the part of the country that is going to solve the problem through the mining that we do, through the food and fibre that we grow, uh, and the work that we are doing to reduce emissions. Because I don't see it happening in the cities. I don't see the changes in emissions reductions in the cities. And that's what regional and rural Australia is asking for. Uh, so I've touched on what some of the, the farmers are doing. I wanted to talk about um, the MLA's commitment to carbon neutral by 2030. Meatworks, which was always going to be the most challenging area. Uh, I spoke to a meat worker the other day who will go from a 64-tonne emitter to a 16-tonne sequester of carbon by next year. DIT Technologies is introducing technology to use uh, water-soluble uh, feed inputs. Uh, Four Seasons is doing the same. Uh, JCU has developed Asparagopsis, which is a, a, a methane-reducing but uh, productivity increasing feed uh, for feedlots. So I hope that I've been able to give you a couple of examples of what Australian business is doing that doesn't require the big stick of legislation that the opposition and the Greens love to drive onto people. Because as part of our plan, we have no caps on methane, we have, uh, we're including soil carbon accounting. This is really exciting stuff for Australian producers, and we've also included a five-year review under the Productivity Commission to check in what is the impact on our people. Because this is about people. This is about Australians who are doing the work in regional Australia, growing the food and fibre, doing the mining, transporting things around, uh, and uh, having the renewable fuel, uh, renewable energy stations. Um, and, growing, and making batteries and all the other things that there is an expectation that they do. Uh, but it is these regions um, that are doing the heavy lifting, but they are going to have the biggest impact as well with the cost of electricity, the cost of insurance and the cost of freight and travel. So it's very important that we keep looking back and seeing how they're doing. It is important that we stop talking about the broad issue of climate change, and we start talking about measurables. So the Great Barrier Reef in my home state of Queensland, uh, we talk about reducing nitrogen and phosphorus, and now we have a market-based system for trading reductions in nitrogen and phosphorus runoff, a direct, a direct relationship between uh, an emitter or a, uh, a company that wants to buy uh, those reduced emissions of reduced uh, pollutants and the farmer who's doing that work. How terrific. David Littleproud, the Minister for Agriculture, yesterday announced a biodiversity trading platform. Again, a measurable way to understand what is actually happening in paddocks, uh, in regional and rural, and then benefit the people who are having to make the changes. I think that's incredibly positive. So, 
I would say to you that we do not need taxes. We do not need big sticks and fines and penalties. What we need is encouragement. We need industry to drive this agenda because that will be good for Australia. It will be good for Australian businesses. It will be good for Australian jobs. And most importantly, it will be good for our people. Because us on this side, we care about people. We care about them still having a job. We care about them being able to afford to have a lifestyle. And whilst the Greens and Labor are worried about whether or not electric vehicles will mean you have a good weekend or not, we're ensuring that people can still afford to have a weekend. Thank you. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise uh, uh, with only three minutes, so I really don't have time to do uh, justice uh, to the topic, so I'll restrict my comments to electric vehicles. It's been almost three years since the Prime Minister promised us an electric vehicle strategy. Instead, we've got a future fuel strategy, which states, and I quote, the government will continue to partner with industry to invest in enabling battery charging and hydrogen refuelling infrastructure for road transport to give Australian consumers and business confidence to purchase low emission vehicles that work for them. That's all we got. It fails to recognise that the way to give consumers and business confidence is to publish a policy which has objectives and which has timelines. We need to consider things like infrastructure, a national uh, EV charging network, for example. Now, we did see one of those go into the infrastructure plan in February 2019, where it's languished ever since, waiting to identify a proponent, let alone implementing it. Now, some progress has been made in relation to EV charging, but not because of some careful planning. Are fuel cell vehicles part of the solution? Well, if that's the case, we need to be talking about hydrogen refuelling stations. We need standards, we need codes, we need regulations for fuel and emissions uh, and for buildings. Now, having an electric charging point in apartment buildings, none of that's there. In terms of you know, vehicle type and investments, you know, the substantial difference between purchasing and depreciating a car uh, compared to a train and businesses must factor that in. So the, you know, the businesses need clear guidance. They've said that the current government strategy proposes changes. That's kind of a polite way of saying it's rubbish. The lack of national regulations leave consumers and industry subject to a patchwork of disparate regulations. It's like the rail um, gauge fiasco of, uh, of narrow standard and broad gauge radio. This is Australia's managing director was quite clear. He said, the most important role governments can play is to provide clear direction to the market on, the, uh, on, the sort, uh, on what the short, mid and long-term objectives uh, should be. This provides industry direction across auto, energy and infrastructure sectors, provides certainty for investment and, most importantly, provides clear direction to consumers. So industry and business are seeking stability. The Australian people are seeking clarity. Uh, yet we don't have that. Leaders are those that define the future, and we have an absence of leadership in relation to this government and electric vehicles. Senator Sheldon. I rise to speak on this urgency motion. Now, Australia has an obvious massive problem. We have a Prime Minister who will say absolutely anything to promote his own interests. He is shameless. He will leak private text messages of foreign leaders. He will disagree with what he, he himself has said. Just yesterday, he misled the House during question time about his holiday in Hawaii. And during the summer, of course, that holiday was taken during the Black Summer bushfires and was forced to walk that back almost immediately. He will point blank deny saying things that he has said on national television. And a case in point is his absurd statement that electric vehicles will end the weekend, a statement he now denies even making. How can any Australian trust what comes out of this bloke's mouth? We also have a government that is absolutely squandering the job opportunity presented by the climate crisis. After eight years of infighting 
after two Liberal Prime Ministers were rolled over climate policy, all this government has to show for is a glossy brochure Mr Morrison created so that he could show it off at Glasgow. And why? Because the government is too busy virtue signalling. Because Mr Morrison and members of this government are spending their time on stunts, like bringing in a lump of coal into parliament or smearing coal dust on their face and putting on a hard hat for a photo op. And it's all virtue signalling, pure and simple. Coal does have an ongoing role in the Australian economy for the foreseeable future. It has an important export and import important role for jobs. But if Mr Morrison cared even the slightest about jobs in the coal industry, then at some point in the last eight years, he would have stopped the labour hire rort that is destroying that industry. Here are the facts of the coal industry. In the 1990s, 94 per cent of people working on Queensland coal mines were employees of the mine operator. Today, more than half work for labour hire or other external contractors. BHP is the largest coal producer in Australia. BHP has told the Job Security Inquiry that across its coal mines nationwide, more than 70 per cent of people work for labour hire or external contractors. Just 29 per cent of people working at BHP coal mines are actual BHP employees. And even the Minerals Council of Australia admits that labour hire casuals earn 24 per cent less than direct employees doing the exact same job. At the Job Security Committee inquiry, we heard from a coal miner in central Queensland named Wayne Gulvich. He's one of the fortunate few that has, still has a direct job with the miner. But he said he hasn't had a new permanent employee join his team for seven years. Seven years of the company only hiring labour hire casuals and not hiring those same people as direct employees. This is disgraceful. Arthur Roris, the Secretary of the South Coast Labor Council, told us about the impact on miners in the Illawarra. He said, you've got a series of body hire firms now that essentially trade on being able to constantly undercut wage rates. We have workers who are sacked one day and rehired the next, doing exactly the same job with less money and worse conditions. And has Mr Morrison done anything to stop this? No. Of course not. Instead, Mr Morrison spent half a million taxpayer dollars defending the labour hire rort in the High Court. Instead, Mr Morrison passed a bill earlier this year that stripped rights away from casual labour hire mine workers. The fact is that while Mr Morrison brings a lump of coal into the parliament for a media stunt, he approves of billionaire mine owners using labour hire to slash workers' wages. Unlike Mr Morrison, Labor is fiercely opposed to this practice. That is why Anthony Albanese introduced the same job, same pay bill in the House yesterday. Mr Morrison is opposed to that bill because he isn't on the side Senator of mine Sheldon, workers. Senator Sheldon, your time has expired. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise today to speak on another matter of urgency. Urgency. The most urgent agenda for the Labor Party while we are just starting to recover from the global pandemic, while the economy needs astute management, while our borders are just starting to reopen and while the global security situation is perilous, the most urgent matter that Senator Urquhart and the Labor Party can dig up is comments made by the Prime Minister in 2019. What a farce. Really, it's embarrassing. Embarrassing. They seem obsessed. Maybe that's why they're taking out ads on TikTok to attack him. An apparent alternative government. Wow. They really are taking the opportunity to deal with the big issues here today. For the record, neither the government nor I will be supporting this motion, of course. Uh, on the issue of climate and emissions, we have already delivered. We have delivered through technology and not taxes. 
We have delivered greater cuts to our emissions than we committed to under the 2030 target. We meet and beat and bet our 2020 target. We are forecast to reduce our emissions by up to 35 per cent on 2005 levels by 2030. And we are doing this with the, with the most consistently transparent reporting regime in the world. Now, this is in comparison to China, whose 2030 emissions reductions target is that they will only double their emissions based on 2005 levels. But in the urgency that we discuss here today, let's, let's get to it. We will not be legislating a 2050 target. We will not lock in a blank cheque with no way to achieve it. What would the Labor Party do if they legislated a 2050 net zero target in, uh, in 2048 and if it didn't look like it wasn't going to make it? Which industry would they shut down? How many new taxes would they raise to buy offsets? I'll leave that to the Labor Party to explain. But we on this side, we're not legislating this emissions target, but we will meet them consistently. We always do. We beat our 2020 target and we're on track to beat our 2030 target. The only time that an emissions target has been legislated in Australia is when Prime Minister Gillard, who would never have had a carbon tax under any government that she'd lead, did exactly that. She led her government to a carbon tax. Madam Acting Deputy President, I think what really annoys those opposite the most is that we've actually set out a very credible plan to achieve our net zero emissions by 2050, while preserving, importantly, existing industries. We want to get down the cost of clean energy and low emissions technologies down. We want to get those costs down, not drive up the cost of meat and coal. Uh, gas and oil and steel and aluminium and other energy and emissions intensive goods. We will take advantage of new economic opportunities, ensure our regions continue to prosper and establish Australia as a leader in new low emissions technologies like hydrogen. Madam Acting Deputy President, I'll touch on hydrogen for a moment because I believe it has a very big future for Australia. Blue and green hydrogen will both have their roles to play. And there's actually a myriad of colours if you look into it. There's, there's brown, there's pink, uh, uh, but really the colour doesn't really matter. If we can get proof of concept, then we have a basis for a global energy industry. And I'm proud to say that in my home state of Western Australia, government and industry are already working together at pace, at pace to prove this concept. With the aid of 42.5 million dollar grant from the Australian Government, Australian Renewable Energy Agency, uh, Yarra Pilbara and NG will build a renewable hydrogen plant to produce renewable ammonia. Scheduled for completion in 2023, the facility will be one of the first, uh, world's first industrial scale renewable hydrogen production operations. The project will build upon pa uh, Pilbara's renewable energy potential. We know that it's the one of the sunniest and windiest places on the planet. And it, uh, this, this project is going to make a big difference up there for industry and indeed for that region. Uh, existing Yarra Pilbara ammonia plant will deliver green ammonia cu to customers for decarbonising emissions from power generation, shipping, fertiliser and mining explosives. I've toured Yarra, Yarra's current facility and I look forward to touring their new facility when it's up and running as well. The new facility will comprise a 10 megawatt electrolyzer, an on-site uh, facility of photovoltaic panels and battery storage systems that will allow the plant to operate without being connected to the main electrical grid. The first phase of the project will produce up to 625 tonnes of renewable hydrogen and 3,700 tonnes of renewable ammonia per year. This initial first phase will be a key to enable the facility to become a keystone in the Pilbara Hydrogen Hub and will build upon the existing export infrastructure that's already there. It's projects like this that will get us to net zero, not Labor's burdensome regulations and taxes. Our policies and investments are enabling households and businesses to deploy new technologies. Why? Because it actually makes economic sense. The plan is based on our, on our existing policies and focuses on driving down technology costs and accelerating their development at scale across the economy. 
Our existing policies work, and so will our plan. Our existing policies also do not spell the end to traditional industries like coal or natural gas. Indeed, it recognises their importance. Now, it's such a shame that the member for Hunter, Mr Joel Fitzgibbon, is leaving the Labor benches because he was basically the only one on their side that uh, was an industrial realist. Now, just yesterday, we saw an announcement by Woodside and BHP that they will uh, move ahead with their Scarborough gas project. Fantastic. Fantastic which is also located in the Pilbara in Western Australia, a region that is genuinely the engine room of the Australian economy. If you haven't been there, you need to go there, Madam Deputy uh, President, and just have an acting deputy president. You need to have a look at, what, at the scale of what is going on in that region. It certainly is the engine room. This project will see $16.5 billion in investment and create upwards of 3,200 jobs. And it's exactly this type of project and these jobs that will be under threat from a Labor government seeking to legislate a net zero position. Finally, I'll touch on the comments referenced in the urgency, urgency motion. Uh, now, I'm a fan of electric cars. I actually, uh, as soon as they're uh, more affordable, I reckon I'll be buying one. Uh, they're, they're very good, and I think there's an exciting prospect for them. Uh, but a, a, the fact is that there's, there's not a single electric car on the market that can tow a caravan. There isn't. Show it to me. It doesn't exist. Now, it's pretty true uh, that there, there are some emerging vehicles. There, there's the Rivian. I uh, challenge you to have a look at it. Uh, it looks like an exciting vehicle. But the reality is lithium-powered uh, battery vehicles, uh, they have a limited range. Uh, the vehicle is only so big and you can only put so much batteries in a vehicle. Now, a Rivian uh, is a dual cab ute. It can tow a large caravan. It can. But the reality is its range, without a load, is about 480 kilometres. As soon, anyone that has a caravan or a, or a boat, they'll tell you as soon as you put that load on the vehicle, it halves the range, even in a diesel vehicle. If a diesel vehicle's got a 500 kilometre range, you, you, put a, you, you put a boat on it or a caravan on it, and it significantly reduces it, more than half. More than half. Now, anyone with a caravan and boat, they'll tell you that. Now, this, the same is true for an EV. This vehicle has got the capability to tow it, but it will only be able to tow it about 240 kilometres. And with the battery in that, which is a 135 kilowatt hour battery, that will take about six hours to load up. Now, fair enough, if you've got a caravan towed behind you, I suppose you could always pull over and have a bit of a kip for six hours every two and a bit hours. You could go and do that, but let's face it, it's not practical. Now, hydrogen provides a future, but that's many years off. Hydrogen fuel cell vehicles may be the way to go in the future. Now, as soon as these vehicles become cheaper and more affordable and accessible, I've got no doubt that Australians will actively choose to buy an EV. And it suits small scale, it suits uh, commuter vehicles, driving around town, daily driver sort of vehicles. That's fine. I think Australians will make that choice for themselves. But this motion is emblematic of the modern Labor Party. They clutch at green straws while dodging the real issues of the day, seeking to legislate and regulate their world view on Australians. They're going to force these vehicles off the road. But we want Australians to have choice. Choice. That's what it's about. It's a long way off before you're going to be able to hitch up your caravan and your boat behind an EV. Let's face it, if you can show me a vehicle that can do it, you know what, I might even go and buy one myself. Uh, Senator Ciccone. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, and look, with its latest glossy document, the Morrison Joyce government claimed to have a plan to address climate change and achieve net zero carbon emissions by 2050. But the reality is this lightweight pamphlet did little to explore the real world impacts of, its, of this target. Like always, the coalition have refused to take responsibility and pass the buck. Fortunately, the Centre of Policy Studies at Victoria University recently published a paper titled Zero Greenhouse Gas Emissions by 2050 – What it means for the Australian economy, industries and regions. After reading through the marketing materials the coalition government called a plan, it's great to see some research that actually explores the real-world effects of achieving net zero by 2050. The paper dives deeply into several areas, but today I want to particularly focus 
on what net zero means for Australia's timber industry. This is an industry that is very close to my heart. For a long time, a job in the timber industry has meant decent pay, good conditions and reliable work. The sort of job you can depend on as you build a life, buy a house and raise a family. Now, it's heartening to see that the research predicts that by pursuing net zero by 2050, our forestry industry will be almost twice the size than if we did not take action on climate change. Sustainable forestry is essential to achieving net zero, as demonstrated by this important research. However, the Morrison-Joyce government's own summary barely mentioned forestry or wood processing. By treating net zero as a political problem rather than an economic opportunity, the coalition is overlooking the impact its decisions will have on industries and workers. Under the Liberals and Nationals, Australia's plantation estate has shrunk by 500 million trees, down 10 per cent since 2014. This must change if we are going to achieve net zero by 2050. The research also demonstrates, demonstrates the foolishness of those who seek to damage our forestry industry in the name of climate change. The paper shows that the forestry industry as our greenest form of carbon capture will need to grow to meet our targets. Those that seek to damage or disrupt the activities of our timber workers are not only hurting the livelihoods of working families and regional communities, they are also making it harder for us to hit our climate goals. Tree plantations in Victoria store 8.4 million tonnes of carbon dioxide every year. It is wrong to attack this industry when its work is essential to limiting climate change. We cannot afford to be distracted by some radicals more concerned with making themselves feel good than protecting our planet. And I back our timber workers, and so does the research by Victoria University. The real climate heroes are providing sustainable, green building materials to our construction industry. They are taking and storing carbon from our forests and regrowing the harvested trees to store even more carbon. They are working in an industry that provides good jobs and the foundation of local economies right around Australia and in regional Australia, an industry that needs to be supported to expand if we are going to meet our targets. The Morrison-Joyce government needs to understand that leadership isn't just waving a brochure around at a press conference. Leadership is assessing the impact of your decisions on the Australian economy. So we can help those who will need a leg up and create jobs right here in Australia. Activists need to understand that attacking the timber industry is not going to prevent climate change. You are targeting an industry that needs to get bigger, not smaller, to protect our planet. We cannot be tricked into believing that we need to choose between jobs and the environment. And the research from the Centre of Policy Studies confirms that this is a false choice. And I look forward to continuing to support the timber workers and their communities because Federal Labor is on their side, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, Senator Bragg. Look, thanks very much for that. And uh, it's uh, terrific to be able to have an opportunity to make some remarks about this matter of public urgency um, in relation to climate change, climate risk. And uh, look, I, my view has been that we can all win from getting to net zero. I'm not so big on the, um, the, the slogans and whatnot, but I, I do think that uh, we are on the right track with this policy. Um, I mean, the, it's important to point out here that I mean, this, this is about getting to net zero. It's not about getting to zero. So there, there will still be uh, emissions, um, agriculture, transport in particular. Um, but in the long run, I mean, it's possible that you get beyond net zero. I mean, you could become an exporter of carbon abatement services uh, for people that have visited. Uh, far-flung parts of New South Wales in particular, people would be aware that there is a lot of uh, land which could be put to good use in terms of offsetting uh, carbon. 
uh, and a lot of the people that live in these areas are, are low-income people, and uh, that could be a whole new uh, revenue stream uh, for these people. So uh, the reality is that Australia has never had enough capital to fund itself. We have relied upon foreign investment for the past 250 years, and that will always be the case. Um, and even under the superannuation system, uh, we are still very, very heavy, heavily reliant upon foreign capital. And, and the people that uh, are against foreign investment are often city slickers, uh, and they often fail to recognise that uh, the major foreign investment that is required to deliver this transition, a uh, large part of that will go into the regions. Um, and if you want to have offshore wind and you want to have pumped hydro and you want to have these new forms of um, energy, energy generation, uh, which is in many cases heavy industry uh, and high paying jobs, uh, you need a lot of money. You need a lot of money. So sending the, the right signals to the capital markets was always going to be an essential part of getting to net zero. Um, I, I'm very cognizant of this the point that people make that if you close down uh, coal, uh, you can't replace those jobs with the handful of people that work at a solar farm. I think that's a valid argument. So uh, if you want to replace, if you want to have a plan for uh, heavy industry jobs, uh, it is going to be on things like offshore wind. Um, I do think we should look at nuclear as well. Um, I've, never understood, I've never understood why we would take any, any form of technology off the table. I think there is way too much ideology in this area. Uh, and as a person that has tried to focus their public contributions on economic policy, uh, I would say that this is a major economic policy opportunity for the country, but it's also a huge risk if we get it wrong. So uh, global, global capital markets, for better or worse, have made up their mind on a lot of these key questions. Uh, and we need to make sure that this is a sensible transition. Now, we don't know how successful hydrogen will be, uh, but we do need to put as much time and energy into this as we, as we can. Um, the other point I make here is that um, I, I don't believe in uh, overly bureaucratic measures. And I don't think that putting all this into legislation is the, is the right answer. I don't think we should be outsourcing these judgments to bureaucrats. Uh, just like I don't think we should be outsourcing our judgments to the Reserve Bank. Uh, I think that we are in a situation where there is too much independence that is centred outside of the elected parliament uh, and that ultimately parliaments and governments are responsible for these judgments and should stand up and seek election or seek re-election on that basis. And so I don't support uh, legislating things and uh, creating new bureaucracies in this space. I think what we have put out is a reasonable plan uh, and it is a, a plan that I think will most heavily benefit the regions, which is where the main pain points will be. They will be in the regions. Senator Roberts. Senator Thank you, Roberts. Madam Acting. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Contradictions erupt and abound in climate and energy policies because no politician has ever provided the logical scientific points as evidence. John Howard's government introduced the renewable energy target and stole farmers' property rights to use their property. Yet six years after being booted from office, he confessed in London in 2013 that on climate science, he's agnostic. He had no science to support what has become the gutting of our electricity sector and our productive capacity. In 2016, the father of the Senate, Ian MacDonald, said there has never been a debate on the climate science, and he's correct. Two months ago, 10 federal politicians confirmed in writing to me that they have never provided, never been provided with this scientific evidence. I'll name those people at this time. They show integrity and courage. In August last year, 19 federal politicians advocating climate alarm and climate policies failed to provide me with the scientific evidence. I'll name them too. In 2007 and 2008, Kevin Rudd claimed 4,000 scientists support the claim that carbon dioxide from human activity affects climate and needs to be cut. 
The UN's climate body's own data shows only five endorsed the claim, and there's doubt they were even scientists. Matthias Cormann, instead of providing evidence as requested on many times, says, quote, we must meet global obligations. To the same organizations that Prime Minister Morrison rightly describes as, quote, unelected international bureaucrats. My own freedom of information requests and the parliamentary library searches show no evidence has ever been given to members of parliament, Senate and House of Reps, requiring these policies. Yet both the Labor Greens coalition and the Liberal Nationals coalition have climate and energy policies not based on empirical scientific evidence. Come clean with the people of Australia. Unshackle our nation. Give the people a go. Restore freedom. Senator Mario Smith. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. My home state of South Australia should not have to endure this government's failure on climate policy any longer, because their failure is costing my state. It's costing our environment. It's costing us in terms of the River Murray. It's costing us in terms of investment. It's costing us in terms of jobs. And it is costing our children a prosperous future. Their failure on leadership, on climate change, is a failure of the highest order. And instead of readying our country to take advantage of the economic opportunities of a renewable energy revolution, they have done what they do best, stoke fear, inflame division, mislead the Australian people on what is to come. And we have seen this time and time again from the Liberals. Like when the Prime Minister said that low emissions technology, like electoral vehicles, will end the weekend. And we've seen it in the Prime Minister's embarrassing performance in Glasgow. Their failures on climate change policy have robbed Australians, and they have especially robbed those Australians who have the most to lose from a changing climate. South Australians will not be taken for fools. They see it, they get it. And while people have rightfully been focused on the pandemic for the past two years, beyond that, the one issue raised with me more than any other is the need for urgent action on climate change. South Australians want action on climate change because they know the environmental and economic future of our state depends on national leadership, on national action. But instead, under this government, they've had 21 different energy policies under three prime ministers. Just recently, another glossy document, a pamphlet with no detail, a pamphlet, an embarrassment on the world stage, where Australia should be leading, where we are capable of leading. And rather than in increasing our ambition on tackling climate change, rather than being leaders, every time, every time we get here, they're dragged kicking and screaming. This is of the utmost importance to my state. People in my state have seen the impacts of climate change firsthand, the black summer fires, and we know fires, bushfires, predicted to increase in intensity and frequency. And we know, we know that if more action isn't taken to enhance and promote renewable energy, we'll see power prices going up. South Australians, my constituents, they want to know why this federal government isn't seizing the opportunities to produce more cheap, reliable, renewable energy, why they aren't taking advantage of this revolution. By investing more in our renewable energy sector, we create jobs, we drive down power prices, we deliver South Australians a better future. And South Australians, I can tell you, they inherently understand what the coalition simply cannot grasp. Meaningful action on climate change is critical for our environmental future, but also for our economic future future, for the future of our children, for their future prosperity. And their inaction, it makes me angry and I know it makes South Australians angry because they just can't grasp how important it is. There are huge opportunities for my state in South Australia if Australia is to lead, if Australia is to lead and deliver the jobs and the growth which we know a green energy revolution can deliver. And we see this leadership from the state opposition in my state, from Peter Malinowskis and his team, 
with their plans to build a 200 megawatt clean energy hydrogen power plant and storage facility. We've seen it from parts of the private sector who have driven investment in this space, not helped by the policy settings of the federal government, but more and more seeing the light, seeing the economic opportunity, taking that leadership where the federal government will not. State governments stepping up to lead on climate policy where the federal government will not, where the federal government, where the federal Liberals have just divided ignited fear, sought to disrupt and destroy any meaningful effort to tackle climate change. And my state risks being left behind unless they get their act together. Our country risks being left behind unless they get their act together. South Australians know how urgent this is, and they want the federal government to recognise that too. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Acting Deputy. President, I stand in this place as a proud Gunai Gunditjmara Japarung woman. Our people thrived on this continent for tens of thousands of years, and we are the oldest continuing living culture on the planet. Everything on country, the water, the air, the sky, the animals, our totems, carries the memories of our ancestors and the stories and lore of our elders. We have cared for everything from the roots of the grasses to the leaves of the highest trees and every living being that relies on them for thousands of years. Just to be destroyed in 250 years of colonisation, bang, wiped out, the dispossession desecration and destruction of country, the pollution of our waters, the theft of our homelands. These stories are not unique to our people in this continent. We heard COP27 from First Nations people from around the world who told the same stories of dispossession desecration and destruction. Climate change is simply a failure of First Nations participation and empowerment, and your failure, your failure, because we didn't fail this country. The reason why our ecosystems are collapsing is because you failed to hear us. You failed to care about the things that mattered, and you failed our ancestors and their stories. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak to the matter of urgency in front of us. Just today, we have received news that Sergio, a 22-year-old climate activist in New South Wales, has been sentenced to 12 months in prison for participating in a non-violent direct action targeting the coal industry. Twelve months in prison! What an outrageously severe and disproportionate punishment. What an appalling message this sends to climate activists and those of us who are fighting for a healthy planet. The real criminals are the fossil fuel companies who are killing our planet, not those who are trying to save it. The Morrison government, they are the real criminals who refuse to tackle the climate crisis, not those who want a future for all of us. The real criminals are running amok, spruiking dirty coal and gas. They are the ones con condemning us to catastrophic climate change. Australia's insatiable appetite for coal and gas is bringing our Pacific neighbours even closer to the climate precipice. Yet, Scott Morrison refuses to act. I can't say I'm surprised. This is someone who brought a lump of coal in Parliament. This is a Prime Minister who was dragged kicking and screaming to Glasgow, where Australia actively sabotaged climate action. I'm angry that we have a Prime Minister who is happy waving around a glossy pamphlet with a pathetic policy which is more of a plan to fuel the climate crisis rather than tackle it. And I am furious that we still have a government ideologically rooted 
in colonial power, hell-bent on destroying nature, and greedy for accumulating resources and wealth by hook or by crook. We know the Liberals are pathetic on climate justice, but if Labour really cares about climate change, then they should join the Greens and offer a bolder alternative vision. They should commit to a 75% reduction in emissions by 2030. They should join us in stopping the dodgy climate-destroying project in the Beetaloo Basin to prioritize the concerns of First Nations communities, because we will not have climate justice without First Nations justice. Anything less is mere theater. But change will come, and it will come from the people. They know we must quit coal and gas. They know the Beetaloo Basin and Scarborough gas projects are ticking climate bombs. They know the Morrison government must be kicked out. And they know that the Greens in shared power will push Labour further and faster. Thank you. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. no. I think the ayes have it. Division required? Ring the bells. Oh, just in time, the Deputy President will be taking over.
stop the bells. I will, however, give the whips a few moments, as all senators understand. Pairing arrangements are complex at the moment. The question is that the urgency motion be agreed to. Ayes will pass to the right of the chair, noes to the left. I appoint Senator Ciccone, tell her for the ayes, and Senator Davey, tell her for the noes. There being 22 ayes and 20 noes, the question is resolved in the affirmative. I'll just give senators a moment to resume their seats. Thank you very much. Yep. I shall now proceed to the consideration of documents. So the documents are listed on page four of today's order of business. So I'm waiting for uh, people to get back to their seats if no one is uh, wishing to speak to any of those documents. Are you seeking the call, Senator O'Neill? I am. Chair, uh, sorry, Deputy President. Um, we're at item 14, is that correct? Yep. Uh, yep. No, we're at documents, okay. um, the ones listed on page four of today's order of business. Okay, so I'm now going to move to the item 14, tabling and consideration of committee reports and government responses. As Senator Davey. Uh, on behalf of the chairs of various committees, I present additional information received by the committees as listed at item 14 on today's order of business. Okay, so which one are you specifically talking to? I'm not. Is, I'm just tabled. tabling yeah. them. Okay, sure. Thank you, Senator Rice. Thanks, um, Deputy President. I present the fifth interim report of the Community Affairs References Committee on Centrelink's compliance program. And I move that the Senate adopt the recommendation contained in the report proposing an order for the production of documents. Yes, this is the fifth interim report on Centrelink's compliance program. In particular, the impact of the federal government's automated debt collection processes upon current and past income support recipients, the program otherwise known as robo-debt. We are not giving up seeking justice for people impacted by this devastating program. I do want to start the table, my speech tabling this report tonight by acknowledging the important work of my predecessor as chair and as Australian Greens Community Affairs spokesperson, Senator Rachel Seward. And there is a lot of Rachel's sort of blood, sweat and tears in this report. Rachel's passion for people was reflected in her tireless work to bring their voices into this place. And it's because of that work and of others, the rest of the committee, that the Senate Community Affairs References Committee has refused to simply just accept the government's delays 
and denial of the impact of robo-debt, even as the public service has been forbidden from uttering the term robo-debt in Senate estimates. And at the forefront of the committee's mind has been the individuals and their families who have been affected. And the committee remains committed to holding the government to account and resolving unanswered questions on behalf of the hundreds of thousands of Australians who have been affected by this scheme. Our report puts it very clearly, saying that more than 18 months after the government's announcement that debts under the scheme would be refunded, as of 28 October this year, 9,200 individuals continue to wait for a refund. And moreover, eligible applicants to the class action will need to wait another 10 months before receiving their share of the settlement sum. And it's also noted that the settlement does not provide compensation for the psychological and financial hardship incurred by affected individuals. And more broadly, questions remain concerning what the Australian government knew about the legality of the debt recovery system. And despite persistent questions from the committee, the government has refused to provide key documents central to this inquiry. And the quote from Justice Murphy in the report summarises the situation. And he says, the proceeding has exposed a shameful chapter in the administration of the Commonwealth social security system and a massive failure of public administration. It should have been obvious to the senior public servants charged with overseeing the robo-debt system and to the responsible minister at different points that many social security recipients do not earn a stable or constant income and any employment they obtain may be casual, part-time, session or intermittent and may not continue throughout the year. It should have been plain that in such circumstances the automated robo-debt system may indicate an overpayment of social security benefits when that was not in fact the case. It is not good enough that we are still having to pursue the government over this. Too many people have suffered to simply accept the pathetic answers the Australian government has given to date. It was a step forward in June to have the federal court's decision to recognise that the Liberal government unlawfully raised $1.7 billion in debts against 443,000 people. But people shouldn't have to fight their own government for justice. We deserve a government that's on the side of people, not billionaires and big corporations. And as my predecessor, Senator Seawitt, said, Robo-debt cost lives. It has ruined many, many more and has been the cause of immeasurable pain and anguish. We still don't know what the government knew and when, and they are still desperate to cover it up. The government thinks that they can get away with only refunding victims served notices after 2015. This interim report that I am tabling this evening contains two recommendations regarding the settlement that was reached this year. Firstly, that Services Australia distributes a settlement sum in accordance with the Implementation Plan for Settlement Distribution Scheme as a matter of priority. And secondly, that following the finalisation of the Implementation Plan, that Services Australia publicly release the following data. The number of class action group members in each category, the total value of debts of the group members broken down by category, and the average share of the settlement sum that eligible group members received which, of course, the release of data brings me to the other fundamental issue that this report covers, and that's the issue of the government ducking and weaving and hiding information that the community and particularly those affected by robo-debt deserve to have. The, in our report, we say that the committee views that the government's knowledge regarding the legal basis of robo-debt is a crucial element of this inquiry and the repeated refusal by the relevant ministers to provide information has limited the committee's ability to appropriately assess the operation of the income compliance program. And in not releasing its legal advice about robo-debt, either publicly or in camera, the government is trying to hide its cruelty to innocent people. And it's hoping that if it refuses to share this information for long enough, that we'll all forget and that they won't be held to account. But we will not forget and we will not give up attempting to uncover what really went on. This program has cost the Australian government hundreds of millions of dollars and has had a devastating impact upon hundreds of thousands of individuals. The Australian public deserves answers as to how this could occur. 
So the committee reiterates its strong rejection of the public interest immunity claims made throughout this inquiry in relation to the executive minute and its legal advice and costs regarding the income compliance program. So as part of this interim report, the committee recommends that the Senate adopt the following resolution, that we note that the Senate Community Affairs References Committee has rejected the Minister's for Government Services explanation regarding public interest immunity claims on several occasions, and that there be laid on the table by the Minister for Government Services by no later than 1 p.m. tomorrow revised responses to relating to legal advice and the income compliance program, which have been subject to rejected claims of public interest immunity during our inquiry into the, uh, into the program. And we also want to see laid on the table a copy of the executive minute to the Minister for Social Services, um, as referenced in the Commonwealth Ombudsman April 2017 report. Or, if we can't get that doc those documents tomorrow, we need a letter confirming that the above responses relating to legal advice and the executive minute will be provided in camera to the Senate Community Affairs References Committee by no later than two o'clock tomorrow. And if the minister again fails to table these documents, we, this motion is moving that we will require the minister to attend the Senate at the conclusion of test question time to provide an explanation of the minister's failure to table the documents. The hiding of information that this government has been doing during this robo-debt debacle is deplorable. Australians deserve better than a government and a minister and a prime minister who think that they can just spin their way past accountability and who refuse to be honest with the Australian people. I mean, that's why the Greens have been calling for a royal commission into the robo-debt affair, to get to the bottom of this. Australians deserve answers, and we deserve accountability to make sure that this does not happen again. But fundamentally, the best way to make sure that such outrages don't happen in, again in the coming years is to get rid of the Morrison government. Because Australians are sick and tired of the lack of accountability, sick and tired of the smirks and grins from this Prime Minister, because it's always somebody else's fault. It's not his. It's always hidden away, never out in the open. I mean, he doesn't hold a hose. If you're sick and tired of Scott Morrison, we're going to have to vote for change. If you're sick and tired of a government that basically is on the side of the billionaires and the big corporations rather than ordinary people, we are going to have to vote for change. If we want an end to this lack of accountability, an end to corruption, if we want a federal ICAC with teeth to get to the bottom of corruption that's going to take genuine action on corruption, we're going to have to vote for change. And fundamentally, as has been shown by this debacle over Robodebt, this appalling ruination of people's lives. If you want a government that cares about people rather than attacking them, we're going to have to get rid of the Morrison government and vote for change. Um, thank you, Senator Rice. Uh, Senator O'Neill. Uh, thank you very much, um, uh, Deputy President. Yeah, I'm assuming it's on the same point. It, it is on yes, the same matter. And, and can I just indicate? I know that there are other senators in the chamber, and there's a number of reports. And this is a time-limited debate for 60 minutes, as I understand it. So I know that people will want to make a contribution. I'm going to make a short contribution on RoboDebt because I think. Uh, Senator Rice has articulated very clearly the findings that are embedded in this in, uh, interim report. I also want to acknowledge we all miss Senator Seward and her passion and energy for this. And I note that this is another interim report that makes some really serious recommendations. And I say again, for the fifth time, for the fifth time in this place, this government inflicted illegal debts on its own people on its own people. Over a million people have been impacted. The government was found to have illegally raised debts and sent them out and demanded them from Australian people, sent debt collectors to the doors of people who have never, ever, ever had a problem with the government or the law in their lives. They reached into the homes of what they call the quiet Australians. I call them the decent Australians. The ones who get up every day and do their work and look after their families and abide by the law and make a contribution to this great country. No one was safe from Mr Morrison. As the Treasurer, he cooked this up. and He cooked it up 
with or without legal advice. And either way, that is a diabolical problem for this country. It cannot be allowed to stand. We are calling for the legal advice that gave the government comfort that it could go ahead and construct a system called robo-debt that was found later on by the legal system to be illegal. This is not a little thing when the government acts illegally and attacks its own people. So we need to get to the bottom of it and we need to find out how such a thing could have happened and we need to prevent it from ever happening again. And I gave my word to two women whose sons were so overwhelmed by being hounded for this debt by their own government that they simply lost the will to survive. And they are no longer with us. This is a sad reality for Australians. And if this speech triggers any concerns for you, I encourage you to contact the public health support lines that are out there, like Beyond Blue and the Black Dog Institute. Because those two young men didn't, and they are not with us. But their mothers are fighting for recognition of what this government did to two young Australian men and a whole lot more people. And I will not let this go. People say, robo debt, you know, that's a couple of years ago, you should get over it. Well, I'm not going to get over it. Because when you become the government, there is a huge responsibility that sits on your shoulders. And that is to act in line with the Constitution. And it is to act in line with the law of the land. And it is to act in a way that doesn't drive the people of the nation that you're supposed to be serving to suicide action, to despair and to brokenness and to mental ill health by being attacked by your own government. So I will not let this rest. I will not let this pass. And there are colleagues here with me who will continue to hold this government to account. And they can use all of the technical language that they want to diminish this. But this is a gross failure of government. It is a shame on our history. It is a blight on the parliamentary history of this country. It is no small thing. It cannot be swept under the carpet. So let's keep picking up that carpet and looking at the ugliness, looking at the ugliness of what this government has advanced and attacked and done its attack on the people of this country. There are some very clear directions about what the government has to do. Show up, provide the information, let the Senate see what went on. Let us make sure that this never happens again. And if you can't show up and put it here in public, there's an option for you to give in camera. If you can't do that, there's more action. But this is not going away. It is not going away. And I honour all those families and all those individuals who were brave enough to participate in the inquiries that we've undertaken on their behalf to get to the bottom of this. Robo-debt was the infliction of illegal debts by this government on the Australian people. It cannot be allowed to go misunderstood. We need to know how we got to that point. And the government has a responsibility to the Senate on behalf of the hundreds of thousands of Australians who were terribly impacted for us to be able to get to the bottom of that problem. So I call on the minister, do your job, don't come in here with weasel words, come in here with the documents. It's time. Cough it up. Tell the truth. I know it's not the usual pattern for this government, but it's time. And people affected by robo-debt, they deserved so much better from this government that they got. And they are through us here in the Senate, calling on us to provide them with some understanding of how a government could get it so wrong and to give them the protections that they need going forward that it can never happen again. So I endorse the report and I seek the support of the Senate. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, Senator O'Sullivan, is it on the same matter? Uh, on, no. Oh, OK. Fine. So well, there's a motion that Senator Rice has moved. On the same matter, Senator Patrick? Yes, it is. OK. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Madam, Dep uh, Madam Deputy President. 
Um, look, I'll just go to, and touch on the nature of the motion uh, that's in the report, and that is to get access to legal information, uh, legal advice. Now, uh, over and over again, the government walks into this chamber and, sa and says that uh, it's legally uh, privileged, would cause harm to the uh, public if uh, legal, the legal advice was released. Um, but the fact of the matter is the Senate has never accepted legal professional privilege as a public interest immunity. And this goes uh, back uh, through the history here in Australia even to the New South Wales Parliament where Mr Egan, the Treasurer of New South Wales, was, was actually uh, discharged, it was, it was, was taken from the chamber. It was taken from the chamber because he failed to deliver uh, documents uh, under order for production. And uh, the matter then went to the High Court in a case called uh, Egan and Willis, where the High Court affirmed the power of the Senate to produce documents, to order the production of documents. There was one matter, matter that was left untouched by the High Court, and that was whether or not that applied to legal privilege. And that was then dealt with in a matter called Egan and Chadwick in the New South Wales Court of Appeal. That's their highest appeals court, their, their, their highest uh, court in New South Wales. And three justices in that court ruled uh, unanimously that, uh, the, that a House has the ability to call on uh, legal advice to be tabled and is entitled to do so when conducting a review of uh, the government's uh, uh, processes or, or indeed the government's actions in respect of either legislation or their executive function. So let's make it really clear that in actual fact the claim being advanced by the government in this instance uh, is, um, is uh, erroneous and particularly in circumstances, you know, even if you argued there was harm, even if you argued there was harm, uh, that doesn't prevent the information being tabled to the committee in camera. Okay? There is no legal basis for the government to deny access or to, uh, to, to not table uh, this legal advice. And I would encourage uh, further thought in relation to this matter. Um, I will be supporting the motion, and there may be the situation where the, where the minister is called to the chamber. And if the explanation is unsatisfactory, I suggest maybe uh, we go down the pathway of the New South Wales Parliament and eject the responsible minister from the chamber. That's, uh, that's what we should do, because we've got a problem here. We've got a problem here in that people outside of the Senate and journalists all think that uh, it's a bit of a joke, the Senate, in terms of its orders for productions, in, in, in terms of its answers, uh, the, the, you know, answerings, uh, answering of questions on notice and so forth, that the whole thing's a bit of a joke. And we might think to blame the government for that, or maybe even public officials, but I'm sorry, it's not their fault. It's not their fault. It's the fault of the Senate. That's whose fault it is. It's the fault of the Senate, and the Senate is in it that don't uh, recognise their responsibility to enforce orders of the Senate and to use all necessary means in order to be able to enforce those method methods and allow us to do our job. I encourage senators to go and have a read of Erskine May. Erskine May is, of course, uh, the UK's equivalent of Odgers. And uh, it's, a, it's available online, and you can even go back to uh, the version just prior to our federation, which applies to this chamber. And you can, well, you can read through it. It's really interesting. You can see, you can see how uh, the, the House of Commons, Commons established its privileges. You can see how the House of Commons set in place all of the things that need to, needed to be done. There are stories in there of, uh, of the... Um, Sergeant at Arms in the House of Commons going out to uh, arrest someone as ordered by the Speaker and uh, two judges, uh, the, 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 the um, Sergeant of Arms being called before two judges and the judges put the Sergeant of Arms in jail. And so you know what happened? 
the House of Commons put the judges in jail. That's, that's where we established that Parliament was supreme. And, we were, and, and of course, there is respect for the boundaries. There's also another case in there where an MP was arrested by some sheriffs and the sergeant of arms, under orders from the speaker, then arrested the sheriffs, such that the member wasn't interfered with in terms of their, uh, their, their um, discharging of their parliamentary functions. There were over a thousand contempt matters dealt with throughout the history of uh, the House of Commons. They, have, uh, th they went through a whole range of processes, blood, sweat and tears, to establish the powers that are exercised by this Senate, because that's where we inherited those powers through section 49 of our constitution. And so we give great disrespect to those members of the British House of Commons who over centuries established these powers. And when we look around, we say, gee, we don't like the government not, uh, not, not fronting up with the document, and the press gallery is watching us and reporting on the fact that actually, well, you know, the Senate doesn't have the powers or, or doesn't seem to have the powers. It does have the powers. It's just the fault of senators who don't respect the way in which those powers were given to us. Um, now, I accept that uh, you can abuse power, and that's grossly irresponsible. If you use a power in, a, in an improper way, that's grossly irresponsible. But it's also irresponsible not to use a power for proper purpose. And we should recognise that. We need to think about this. It's not like we can go to someone that sits above us and say, hey, government's not playing it fair. It's not like that at all. We have to look at ourselves. We have to look at ourselves to enforce the powers that were, were given to us, earned through blood, sweat and tears, through arrests, you know, so the, 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 the privileges um, uh, in relation to freedom of speech, Article 9 of the Bill of Rights. You know, that, that, you know, that flows from, from uh, kings arresting MPs and putting them in the tower and so forth. These are powers that were were earned over a long period of time and are there for us to use and to use properly, and it is wrong if we don't use them properly. So I just urge that if we get to the point uh, where the minister refuses to provide the documents, let's look to the New South Wales Parliament, let's look to Erskine May, and, uh, and as senators, doesn't matter what side you're on, because it's quite important that the powers are properly exercised. Um, uh, and, and, and not let to slip. So that's my suggestion, that's my contribution. Let's see what happens in relation to this motion. If it gets up, let's see what the response is uh, and let's take it to the, to the, to the final uh, place uh, and exercise our powers fully. Otherwise, we will just be looked upon as a joke. Uh, thank you, Senator Pat Patrick. Um, Senator Rice, just before I put this motion, are you also seeking leave to continue your remarks? Yes, okay. seeking leave to continue my remarks. All right. Shall we take that as done, and I'll put the motion with the Senate, with the concurrence of the Senate, because that just means the document will stay on the notice paper. Okay. So we'll put the motion that was moved by Senator Rice. Um, so the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Rice be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I believe the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Thank you. And we'll now go to Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. On behalf of the Joint Select Committee on Australia's Family Law System, I present the committee's third interim report and final report, and together uh, together with toge the, the accompanying doc documents, and I move that the Senate takes note of the reports. Thank you. I've risen today, uh, as I have many times, in fact, nearly 90 times uh, since I was elected uh, into this place. But I think one of the most memorable, and possibly the most impactful of those, when I rose here in the Senate uh, on behalf of the government in September 2019 to move to create the Joint Select Committee on Australia's Family Law System 
here in the Senate. Uh, I'd been a senator for just over two months when I did that, and it has been over two years since I uh, moved that motion to establish this select committee. Uh, that uh, now, two years on, we have finally finished uh, the work of that committee. And I make these points uh, simply to highlight the importance of this inquiry and uh, in my context as a senator. Uh, over the course of this inquiry, the committee has held 13 public hearings, 13 in-camera hearings and received over 1,700 submissions. The committee has heard from many people who have direct experience of the family law system. There are advocacy groups and other organisations. We heard from academics and legal professionals. And on behalf of the committee, I thank everyone that made a contribution. Contributions were extremely heartfelt, personal and, in many cases, very difficult for them to make. And I acknowledge sincerely the, uh, the impact of uh, each of those contributions. And I thank those that made the brave decision to seek uh, to speak and, and to give a submission. Many were given in camera because of the nature of them, but each and every one of them was important. Uh, the report presented today uh, follows on from the committee's first interim report presented in October 2020. And it's the second interim report on improvements in the family law proceedings presented in March 2021. The first interim report previously tabled canvassed the broad range of issues that uh, arose in the evidence provided to the committee, touching on matters such as perceptions of bias within the system, the role of family consultants and expert witnesses, whether the adversarial nature of the family law courts could be improved. Uh, that was a big issue that we continued to hear. Uh, the misuse of systems and processes and professional misconduct and the perceived or apparent systemic issues. We also heard about the costs of legal fees and uh, encountered in the legal system and also within the family law system. The delays encountered in the family court was another issue that we heard, and issues in relation to family violence and the family law system. And the second interim report detailed the committee's conclusions and recommendations in relation to the family law system. This included proposed and contemporary reforms, as well as suggesting extra measures that the committee considered were needed to better support Australian families using the family law system. The 29 recommendations contained within the report place emphasis on reducing costs and delays experienced by those interacting with the court, as well as exploring how the enforceability of orders could be improved. Also explored, uh, explored where, uh, where options were uh, uh, to refine the family violence framework, amending the Family Law Act and alternate dispute resolution and several other issues. I'm pleased to inform the Senate that the Australian government has already moved ahead on a number of these recommendations. For example, the government has allocated an additional $100 million in funding over the next four years to strengthen the family and federal circuit courts. And the committee uh, heard from the courts uh, with regards to how that is being implemented, and it was received uh, certainly with, with gratitude because they're seeing already uh, the impact of that. So that's good. Uh, in the second interim report, it was noted that there had not been enough time to consider issues related to child support, uh, an issue that was raised many times in the submission process. So this issue led to an agreement of the committee to uh, and ultimately the Senate to extend the deadline of the final report, which I'm proud to table today. The third interim report, which I'm also tabling today, deals with the majority deals in majority with the systemic problems relating to children in the family law system and the child support system and it offers 19 new recommendations. One of these is that the government convene a ministerial task force and expert working group with a broad range of represent representatives uh, to examine the child support formula. Now, unfortunately, the committee was not equ equipped to review this issue in the appropriate and required detail that would be necessary for a subject uh, as important as this. Uh, as a number of submissions were received, uh, but it does need further assessment. That's why this recommendation is within the report. The committee strongly believes that ongoing community engagement is a vital feature of government decision making and, and policy development. The committee has recommended that regular meetings of the Child Support National Stakeholder Engagement Group should therefore be reconvened. The final report notes government actions and family court initiatives since March 21 and 
makes further recommendations supplementary to those made in the second and third interim reports. The committee reiterates its uh, considered opinion that recommendations relating to the proportionality of costs and the use of arbitration are significant reforms that should be adopted. Private meetings between the committee and the Chief Justice of the Federal Court and uh, Federal Circuit and Family Court of Australia and the Chief Judge of the Family Court of Western Australia were held in order to privately discuss the proceedings and decisions of respective courts and committees. These meetings provided a solid foundation for further inquiries and informed the deliberations and recommendations contained within the report. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Chief Justice uh, Algiston and uh, Osterjan, thank you very much, Senator Wright. Um, uh, Chief Deputy, uh, sorry, Deputy Chief Justice uh, McClellan, uh, for their assistance to the committee during this inquiry. The committee and I would like to thank all those who stepped up and gave evidence before the committee. Uh, it was not an easy thing to do. It was not an easy thing to do. Uh, and so Senator Waters will be able to attest to that. We, we had um, quite significant uh, moments in that committee where people uh, were quite moved by the, the evidence that they were giving. And I, and I really do thank them for that. It was a brave thing for many of them to do. Uh, many of them are living in the middle of it, uh, dealing with it. Uh, and uh, for some of them, it was reliving uh, some of their worst times of their life. And so I do thank them. The courage required uh, touched me and, and I know no doubt every other member of the committee. Uh, so I thank those that stepped up uh, very much indeed. Uh, also deserving thanks is the committee secretariat, uh, who do a, body, uh, a whole body of work behind the scenes. The workload and the difficult subject nature uh, for this committee was immense, and I acknowledge and thank them very much indeed. Uh, we also met with many legal professionals, community groups and academics, and I thank them also. Uh, throughout the inquiry, the committee has sought to understand the ongoing deficiencies and issues present in the Australian family law and child support systems. The committee has sought to find solutions that are practical, workable, equitable, and that it will uh, go to make an ongoing improvement to the lives of many men, women, children and extended family that use this system. Finally, I want to acknowledge uh, all members of the committee uh, including uh, member for Menzies, Mr Andrews as chair and the deputy chair, Senator Hanson, and indeed all the other colleagues uh, involved in that committee. We approached it in a very collegiate way. Uh, we worked uh, exceptionally well together. Uh, Senator Rice, who's in the chamber now, was, was part of that, and, uh, and I thank her as well for uh, the commitment that we all had uh, uh, to making sure that we were able to canvas uh, the many and difficult issues uh, that relate to the family law system. Uh, so on that, uh, I table these reports and uh, it concludes the work of the committee. Uh, and I do commend this report to the committee, uh, both the, the final reports, uh, but also that the, the interim ones that have been uh, put in as well. And I seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll go to uh, Senator Waters. Thanks very much, Deputy President. The Australian Greens opposed this inquiry from the outset, not because we think there are no problems with the family law system, but because those problems have been the subject of numerous comprehensive inquiries. Understanding the problem is not the issue. Doing something about it is. This politically motivated inquiry sought to relitigate old issues delay implementation of previous recommendations, it emboldened domestic violence offenders, offenders and it re-traumatised victim survivors and their children. Experts and service providers opposed the inquiry. The government should have prioritised evidence-based strategies to make family law safer for victims and survivors of family violence, rather than allowing this compromised inquiry to proceed. The weight of evidence given to the committee over many months, uh, years in fact, confirms what was already known, that gendered violence is a core problem at the heart of the family law system, that inadequate resourcing has created delays and gaps in the system that continue to put women and children at risk, and that funding, specialisation and wraparound service models are the solution. 
We are relieved that, having heard all of the evidence, the committee's prim primary recommendations are not those championed by the men's rights movement. Instead, they largely acknowledge, once again, the need for a better understanding of gendered violence to be embedded throughout the family law system. The inquiry has identified, once again, the need for evidence-based strategies and additional funding to make family law safer for survivors of family violence, and it's reaffirmed the role of the federal government in facilitating that. While the un uh, inquiry was unnecessary and damaging, I would like to thank everyone who once again made a submission sharing their story and their expertise, who appeared at both the public and the private hearings, uh, or who briefed the committee. I thank in particular also the Secretariat staff for their tireless efforts to collate the evidence presented. We have supported recommendations calling for more training for judicial officers and report writers, implementation of the successful Lighthouse project and the priority property pool conciliation pilots, and increased staffing. We note that the progress that's being made on harmonising definitions and procedures uh, and information sharing to reduce the number of times survivors have to relive the same trauma. We note that progress and welcome it, but more needs to be done. Importantly, the whole basis on which this inquiry was set up was the idea that women routinely weaponise the family law system against their ex-partners and concoct or exaggerate domestic and family violence. It is a horrifying and dangerous myth that cannot stand. This dangerous myth was clearly contradicted by the vast bulk of expert evidence to the inquiry, noting that women are more likely to under-report violence because they fear they will not be believed, and that disclosures of violence uh, they fear will disadvantage their case and jeopardise the safety of their children. The only way to strengthen the outcomes of family law matters is to ensure that they are heard by an experienced specialist judge with an understanding of the dynamics of family violence. The final report notes that the merger of the family court with the federal circuit court took effect on 1 September 2021. The Australian Greens, along with the vast majority of those working with and within the family law system uh, and the, in the legal profession and former family court judges, all opposed the merger. The merger risks the specialist expertise that is essential to ensuring a child safety focus in family law matters. We continue to oppose the merger and we believe that the strongest protection for children, families and survivors of family and domestic violence is a strong, standalone, specialist family court involving a holistic, specialist system of collaborative, culturally safe, co-located services and resources. At least 60 per cent of family court matters involve domestic and family violence. The merger has delivered loss of specialisation in a court that relies on specialist expertise to navigate complex matters and ensure the safety of children. We support case management measures and the harmonisation of rules and practice directions, but we note that those measures were possible and indeed already underway without the merger. The backlog of cases is overwhelming and does a disservice to families seeking to move on safely with their lives. Skilled, experienced registrars, liaison officers and non-judicial staff play a critical role in implementing risk screening and triaging programs. We support more registrars to help parties navigate the system, to prepare for interim hearings and to maximise the prospects of successful mediations. However, so many family law matters are complex and disputed. These cases simply cannot be resolved in a way that ensures the safety of children without a judicial hearing. This government must fund more family law judges to maintain the specialist expertise needed to resolve complex family matters and to improve the pace of justice. Justice delayed is justice denied. Uh, on funding, review after review has confirmed that the entire family law framework is overstretched and under-resourced. Funding in the 2021-22 uh, budget for court programs and legal services is welcome, but it will not go far enough to reduce the significant delays and to improve access to justice in the family law system. The government must ensure that legal aid, community legal centres, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander legal services, family violence prevention legal services and their peak bodies have adequate and secure funding to provide timely advice and representation to parties. Failing to strengthen the legal advice uh, and assistance sector will simply exacerbate delays and costs that directly impact on the accessibility and quality of justice. 
Uh, finally, reform and review of the family law system will be critical to the success of the next national plan in protecting women and their children. It is essential that the national plan provides for culturally safe wraparound and responsive support services so that women and children have access to immediate support when leaving abusive relationships and longer-term support to navigate the legal system. The plan must be funded to at least $12 billion over the life of the plan that's $1 billion each year for prevention programs and for legal, social and support services for families and survivors of family and domestic violence. As highlighted at the recent Women's Safety Summit, it's also critical to have a standalone national plan for First Nations women and children. We welcome the government's apparent commitment to a First Nations women's national plan. However, this plan must be truly self-determined by and prioritise the expertise and solutions of First Nations women and their community-controlled services and organisations. We call on the government to hold a First Nations women's gathering to facilitate the development of this plan, and at all stages of developing this plan, First Nations leadership expertise and solutions must be prioritised. This was a politicised and fraught inquiry. We are glad that it is over, and we call on the government to now finally do what needs to be done to provide a family law system that works to minimise trauma and maximise the safety of all parties and their children. I seek leave to continue my remarks. Senator Hanson, are you you're seeking the call? I'm seeking the call. Thank you. Thank you very much. I rise to speak to the third interim and final report for, from the Joint Select Committee on Australia's Family Law System. I thank the committee secretariat for its considerable efforts since the establishment of this inquiry, for which I have fought tooth and nail, and I was the one who got this inquiry up. As many parents have attested, and as I myself have experienced, Australia's child support system is outdated, unfair and unjust. It's a broken system that breaks people. We can fix it and we must fix it. It works to compound the hurt, pain and anxiety felt by parents at the breakdown of a relationship. It's a system which can be effectively weaponised by acrimonious parties seeking to inflict further hurt and financial penalty. It's a system which can effectively allow children to be used as pawns in such conflicts. It's a system which doesn't have to be this way. And since my election to the Senate, I have worked hard to bring these matters to light and debate. Ultimately, what we need is a fairer child support system, which works to ensure all parents meet and fairly share their responsibilities to their children. Works to ensure child support does not impoverish, impoverish those paying, those um, impoverish the party paying it or unduly enriches the party receiving it. Minimises the cost to taxpayers through efficiency and streamlined processes and ensures optimum service and speedy resolution to disputes. I'd like to relate a complaint I received about the child support system, which illustrates just how outdated, unfair and unjust it is. This parent equally shares access and financial support for three children with their ex-partner. However, on receiving a pay rise, this parent was suddenly required to increase child support by $1,500 per year, even though their children's expenses did not change. And upon the ex-partner having another child with someone else, this parent was required to increase child support by another $2,000 per year, paying more to, to support a child who was not theirs. How is this fair? This is just one of the many examples of the inequity built into Australia's broken child support system. I've been working towards a fairer child support system since I was elected to the Senate. In my first meeting with Prime Minister Turnbull, I said the family law and child support systems needed to be fixed. This inquiry was about getting to the root of the problems and finding real solutions. But despite the evidence presented by so many people who have experienced its unfairness, some of the other members of the committee have turned a deaf ear. They've preferred to listen to the bureaucrats and lobby groups who inflict this pain on parents, not the parents themselves. Perhaps it's due to the lack of personal experience with the system among committee members. It may be a little confronting for them to consider the input of families destroyed by this system. I've had a lot of personal experience with this system and I've proposed a number of practical solutions to address the problems. For me, this comes down to the simple fact that both parents 
have brought their children into the world, so they alone should share the responsibility to raise and support them. The aim for everyone should be equal child access except where a parent is clearly unfit. While we must always ensure the welfare of children, we in this place are obliged by the Constitution to legislate parental rights. We don't need another stolen generation of children estranged or cut off from their family, including grandparents. Many grandparents feel they haven't been heard in this debate. To this end, I have proposed the following principles. Accessible income should be defined as net salary or wage after tax. It must be recognised that 80% of working Australians are pay-as-you-go employees, and it's unfair that current child support arrangements unfairly discriminate against them in comparison to a self-employed person. Services Australia consider $526.50 per week is a livable retained income based on 20, approximately 27,000 a year being the threshold at which child support payments kick in. But in a briefing, I told them they were leaving parents paying child support with as little as $370 a week, and they had no idea. If $526 a week is minimum, child support should not leave parents with less in their pay packets. Salary assessment should, not, should be based on a 38-hour week and not include overtime or additional employment. People need the incentive to move on with their lives. Child support should be based on the number of children at the time of separation, not based on subsequent children with other parents. Residential costs should be assessed individually as both parents need to have homes to accommodate their children. And family tax benefits A and B should be part of accessible income. At the moment, a single parent with one dependent child receives a fortnightly family tax benefit payment of, five, of $320, which is not accessible income. Potential earning capacity or ability should not be a factor in income assessment. Just because someone is capable of earning a larger income does not entitle Services Australia to assess them in this, this way. Work cover or TBI, TPI payments should not be accessible income and nor should superannuation payouts. Punitive action should result if a payee parent acts in contravention of court orders or mutual agreements regarding visitation rights. And child support payments should incorporate the travel incurred in delivering a child between parents and it's a shared responsibility. Ultimately, the best approach is to determine child support paying payments according to what is needed to raise the child. Food, clothing, housing, education and medical care shared by both parents. This should be based on the average cost of such support to the average Australian family. The cost of raising a child should be the only factor which dictates the contributions from both parents. As we must ensure these contributions are in fact being spent solely on raising the child, Many parents are sick of paying child support only to see their ex driving a new car or taking luxury holidays. Its recommended payments are made to a special child support account and the recipient must be accountable to Services Australia for its expenditure, where child support access is between 35 and 65% effectively costs are the same, so there simply should be no child support. This will minimise the practice of acrimonious parents withholding child access to boost their child support payments. It will take the sting out of, it, uh, out of it and parents will be able to spend more time with their kids. It will also minimise costs, save a lot of time and encourage parents to get themselves a job and face up to their responsibilities instead of relying on child support for income. They can move forward with careers instead of taking lower paid jobs to minimise the child support payments. These are practical solutions, which should have been adopted by the committee as formal recommendations. They haven't, which has obliged me to, to lodge a dissenting report. In an attempt to prevent my dissenting report, the committee has just amended its report to include my proposals as issues raised with a vague recommendation that these proposals be explored by some task force. Not enough, not by a long shot. My dissenting report stands as an indictment on the refusal of the government and opposition to make meaningful changes to a broken child support system. 
I am not appeased. I will not be appeased until there is a real commitment to return fairness to child support. Ultimately, we all want the best for our, all our families involved and this incredibly in di um, difficult circumstances, children and parents. I will not speak to the remainder of the report except to say I support some recommendations and dis disagree with others. What is more important is fixing a broken system that is an ineffective, costly, slow, inequitable, and which is all too easily abused in the name of acrimony and appeasing self-interest groups. It's time for a fairer system and I'm not stopping until we get it. Too many Australians are taking their lives due to our family law and child support system. All parents and children deserve better. And with Senator Waters and her comments, I believe she is biased in her, com in her comments and reluctant to acknowledge that domestic violence is com committed by women also. Evidence given was in camera. There wasn't the traumatised that was there. Everyone had a chance to put their, their story across. But as I said, at the end of the day, we have to address those people that are suiciding, taking their lives, children not being having the time to spend with their parents, grandparents denied the right to see their children. If we can't intervene in the household, why are we doing it and telling them they can't see the children just because they go through the family law system and the courts? And judges need to wake up to the fact that parents, they are denying parents the right to see their children. This is to fight. I will continue on behalf of many Australians. Thank you, Senator Hanson. Your time has expired. Um, Senator McGrath, Senator O'Sullivan was seeking to continue his remarks. Do you wish to On move behalf that way? of Senator O'Sullivan, I seek leave to continue his remarks. Is leave granted? Being no objection, leave is granted. Two yes, things I'd like sure. to do, please. Um, uh, on behalf of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Corporations and Financial Services, I pre present three reports as listed at item 14 of today's order of business, together with accompanying documents. And I move the Senate take note of the reports. Are you speaking to? Yep. I do have something else to table before we adjourn. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, why don't we get you to table that? Okay, just cool, thank you. And then cool, I'll go easy. Back to um, I present the second interim report of the Joint Select Committee on Implementation of the National Redress Scheme. I move that the Senate take note of the report and I seek leave to incorporate the tabling statement in Hansard. Is leave granted? There being no objection, I appreciate it, thank, thank you. you. Senator O'Neill. Oh. To speak today to one of those three bills that has just been tabled by the government. All of them are worthy of consideration, and I also want to acknowledge that uh, those bills were, um, th those reports were produced under the chairmanship of uh, Mr. Andrew Wallace, who today has become the uh, Speaker of the House. So I want to acknowledge that uh, rise to a great high office uh, by him. But today I'm here to talk about a particular bill uh, and recommendations around a bill that are very, very concerning. Um, it's the Corporations Amendment Improving Outcomes for Litigation Funding Participants Bill of 2021. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, uh, yeah. This report yeah. is the project of a cursory yeah, and risable one day of hearings and a rushed consultation process. But I'll be in the chair. We're left with a government report unmoored completely from the concerns of legal experts who think that this law addresses a non existent problem and that the bill may even be unconstitutional. This bill, to be clear, is not about access to justice. This bill is about ideology and delivering for the masters of the Liberal Party, those with bulging wallets and even bigger egos who are self-interested in their attempt here, under the cover of COVID, to water down dis current continuous disclosure laws and to push the government to rush through regulations on litigation funders that are so poorly designed that ASIC needs tens of thousands of dollars in legal advice to figure out how to actually implement them. This is a disaster in the making on the watch of this government. and This is all just so that they can ensure the dodgy corporates were less threatened by the prospect of a class action. Now, the bill will cull the market for litigation funders. It will make them more risk-averse to funding class actions and it will cut the amount of class action funders available and thus make it harder for ordinary Australians to act access justice. But that's exactly what this government want. They want to keep everybody in the dark, they want to keep you quiet and they want to make sure you can't get into a courtroom and fight for your fair share when they've done the wrong thing or when a major corporate's done the wrong thing. 
Now, supporters for this reckless bill were so few and far between that the committee received a visit from the mysterious Rule of Law Institute at our sole hearing. Despite no submission, they were called to give evidence at the public inquiry by the Liberal members of the committee. And at the hearing, Mr Merritt made it very clear that he had no relevant experience or expertise to give, and he made several inaccurate and misleading comments that were, had to be corrected after the hearings. He also refused to disclose who actually funds the mysterious institute as well, leaving myself and many of the other members of the committee very sceptical about its purported independence. There was another star witness, a, a lobbyist, Mr Stuart Clark. And if there's sufficient time, I'll come back to discuss him. But most seriously, this bill may not be constitutional. Now, that's principle number one. A government should be bringing bills forward that are unconstitutional. We've seen what happened with robo-debt when the minister who's now responsible for that department and continues to fail to answer questions and provide legal, uh, legal advice. We know that this government's not good at this stuff, and we have had evidence to say that this bill may be unconstitutional. Not phased. The government's not phased. Now, in Labor's dissenting report, we note former Solicitor General Justin Gleeson SC and other legal experts who make this point. Multiple serious concerns were raised by the submitters, including but not limited to whether the corporation's power in the Constitution, which is Section 51, and, their, and the, all the referral powers to the Commonwealth, pursuant to Section 51, um, can, uh, sorry, with the relevant section uh, 38, 39, can uh, support the provisions. Whether the provisions would amount to an inconsistency with the state class actions provisions so as to override them pursuant to section 109 of the Constitution, including impacts on the group cost order provisions unique to the Supreme Court of Victoria. Also, potential issues arising in respect of overriding the power of state courts or directing state legislatures. Now, these are very real issues. And they remain unaddressed by this government, and the majority report of this committee glosses over the evidence presented in the hearing that the bill may not stack up constitutionally. Overall, this year-long process of reform of the litigation funding industry has been nothing but haphazard, chaotic and botched. And of concern to many submitters to this inquiry was that Labor senators only had a day a single day to look over the majority report before it was reported. The government used its numbers, pushed this through at lightning speed. Other things that they've promised, like an independent commission against corruption, well, well more than a thousand days they promised it. More than a thousand days ago they promised it. They've done nothing. But litigation funding, they're pressing ahead, even though the bill was described as unconstitutional. That's how shambolic this government is. This is clearly a box-ticking exercise for the government. They didn't want a real inquiry, just the semblance of one, in a PR cover-up to rush their poorly drafted laws through. Witnesses had less than two business days to respond to questions on notice, and even then the only witness to fail to have them in on time was the Attorney General's department and the Treasury Department. They couldn't make the government's timeline. They haven't answered questions about constitutionally constitutionality. Any bill with as many serious issues as this one as, as, as profound questions about its constitutionality should continue to be scrutinised and not advanced Set, on the floor of this you, parliament. Senator, the time for the debate has expired. Do you wish to be in continuation? I seek leave to continue my remarks. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Leave Mr. is granted. Mr. Uh, Minister. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Uh, I present government responses to the report to the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Legislation Committee report on the courts and tribunal legislation amendments uh, 2021 Measure No. 1 Bill 2021, and also the 197th Report of the Joint Standing Committee on Treaties. And in accordance with the usual practice, I seek leave to have the documents incorporated in Hansard. Okay, uh, leave leave's granted. Thank you, Minister. Uh, okay, there, are, uh, Senator Rennick. Uh, oh, sorry. Make a statement. S sorry. <laughs> I. I'm sorry, I saw, only saw Senator Rennick first. Um, I'll go to Senator Rennick, th then come to you. I'm, I'm sorry, Senator Hanson Young, but. Okay, you're calling quorum? Yes, okay. thank you. Uh, quorum's been called.
Um, uh, quorum is present. Uh, Senator Rennick. Uh, uh, I seek leave to make a statement relating to vote on the vote on General Business Notice of Motion 1270 relating to the Environmental, uh, Environment and Communications Legislation Committee inquiry into the ABC and SBS complaint handling. Is uh, leave granted? So I'm in the hands of, of the chamber here. Uh, Senator Wong. I'm sorry, I, I, I've only just got to the chamber. I didn't realise um, uh, quite the context of all of this, but can I just be clear? Is Senator Rennick seeking what is he simply seeking to make a statement at this point? Well, you, you have to explain why. Well, no, well, sorry. I, I think, I, the, the, the convention is. Yeah, the convention is that you first need to seek leave to make a statement. Senator the Wong, Senate, well, I think that's what he was doing. No, yes. he just said that's not what he just well, said. That's what. Yeah. So I, I'm in the hands of the, the chamber. It is Senator Rustin. Uh, um, with the indulgence of the chamber, um, I would just um, seek for the person who. Uh, denied leave um, to perhaps reflect on that decision on the basis that it is convention um, has been afforded to um, the Greens in this chamber and many other parties in this chamber um, that when somebody has made a mistake in their vote that they um, and they seek to have that vote recommitted uh, that it's allowed. So I would just ask that maybe um, we could ask Senator Rennick to seek leave again uh, and for those at the end of the chamber to uh, reconsider their position on the basis that this has been a, a convention that has been afforded to them in the past. Uh, so I am in the hands of, of the chamber. Senator Rennick has sought leave to, to make a statement. Uh, Senator Hanson Young, you're seeking the call. So Senator Rennick is uh, seeking leave to make a statement, not to have the vote recommitted because so you've changed your mind. The topic of he the hasn't statement. changed his mind. It's Well, he would like to make that statement to do it. If I, if I could have an order, please, in line with how this chamber does operate, uh, it is customary for a, a senator in Senator Rennick's position to be given leave to make uh, such a statement in relation to a vote that, that had happened previously, especially as it may lead to a, a recommittal that, that may be sought. So, what I'm in the hands of the chamber. So, so just so um, everybody is aware, Senator McKim, I, I notice you. I'll just come to you in a moment. Once Senator Rennick uh, has given his explanation, it will then be up to the Senate to decide whether there will be a, a, a recommittal. This is in line with, with the custom of, of the Senate uh, over many years. So, uh, Senator McKim, you were seeking the call. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. The, uh, just if I could, on indulgence, the, the issue, if Senator Rennick is seeking leave to, to make a statement about a particular matter, I think it would be of assistance to the Senate if he could uh, make that clear in just a short number of words what the matter is, rather than just simply rise and say he's seeking leave to make a statement. Because well, at the well, moment, I understand that's no, what Senator, he has said. Thank you, Senator McKim. Senator uh, Rennick actually did do that uh, uh, when he rose to speak. So I'm reading the mood of the chamber, and I'm going to give the call to, to Senator Rennick. Uh, okay. Well, Senator, he had sought leave, and Senator Hanson Young had said no. But so Senator Wong has the call. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, I, Deputy President. I appreciate it. There is a process here, and I suggest we go back to the beginning. I think Senator Rennick should seek leave to make a statement about X. The Senate, including Senator Hanson Young who denied leave previously, as is her right, uh, can make a decision about whether she, the Senate grants leave, and then he makes the, the, the content, the substantive statement at that point, and then the Senate determines whether we accept that. Why don't we, we will start again. Thank um, you. Then we'll have a reset. 
uh, Senator Rennick has the call to uh, seek leave. Senator Rennick. I seek leave to make a statement relating to the vote on general business notice of motion 1270 relating to the Environment and Communications Legislation Committee inquiry into the ABC and SBS complaint handling. Is uh, leave granted? Sorry, leave is granted. Senator, Senator Rennick. Uh, I seek leave to have the question put again on general business notice of motion 1270 due to a confusion around pairing arrangements this afternoon. Thank you, Senator Rennick. Uh, Senator Hanson Young. Um, well, uh, here we have it. <laughs> oh, sorry, Senator Hanson Young. Uh, no, no, no. I'll speak. Just, just make a start. I'll speak. Sorry, Senator Hanson Young, you're seeking leave to speak. Well, I, I'll, I'll seek uh, leave yeah. uh, in relation uh, to this matter. Um, uh, you're, we have to take our jobs very seriously in this place. If, there, um, if Senator uh, Rennick has voted in the wrong way, that's one thing. If he, he, if he missed the vote, that's another. Um, but uh, simply wanting to change the way votes were paired, and this is really showing what a shamble this chamber is right now, and this is under the watch and management of the government. They've got uh, renegades in their own team, and they have no idea how to control them. I mean, I, I must—I feel for uh, Senator Birmingham. He's no um, uh, Senator Cormann uh, when it comes to being able to whip and control uh, the team over there. Um, you know, he's a very decent guy, but the government has lost control of their own team. That's what's happening here. Lost control. And now we see a total mass confusion. The Australian people have every right to know how members in this place vote. And I, for one, have been very concerned over the last number of weeks, and increasingly this week, over the last couple of days, of pairing arrangements that are not disclosed to the public. That are not disclosed to the public or the chamber. And it is just not acceptable. This is a democracy. <laughs> we all have a responsibility to, be, to make decisions in this place and we have to be accountable for them. And what this is showing is what a shamble the pairing arrangement and the lack of disclosure is. It suits the government from time to time to keep this stuff secret. Why? Because, as we know, Mr Morrison changes his mind every day. So why would he want a record of how his own members vote? He doesn't. And so this, here we go again. Um, it's been, it has been talked about in this chamber increasingly, particularly over the last two days, that this is not being managed properly. And what we're going to see happen is one day there is going to be a piece of legislation that passes in this place under these murky secret deals, and it's going to get challenged in the High Court right. because it's not legitimate. Right. We can't actually count the number of votes in this place properly and hold people accountable. So I'm very, very reluctant to be agreeing to something like this when it is, it's a stitch-up because the government can't control their own team. It's not Mr Morrison uh, who votes in this place, it's individual senators, and their names should be recorded. Yep. The reason Mr Morrison doesn't want this is because he doesn't want to be held accountable for what his team is doing. He says one thing one day and does another the next, and he hopes that the Australian people forget. Well, we don't forget. We're watching and we're holding people in this place to account. Now, Senator Rennick has every right to have a Barney with his Prime Minister, every right to have uh, concerns about how his Prime Minister is running the show. But do not take your job seriously in this place and do not stand up and be clear about how you are being paired. Are you being paired because you want to or because the government, the whips have done it on your behalf? I mean, I'd be pretty pissed. I'd be pretty annoyed, Senator Rennick, if they're pairing you without telling you how your pairing arrangements have gone. And I understand that if that's your frustration, you should be able to stand up and put that. And I'd be questioning whether you can really trust what's going on on your Senator front bench Hanson -Young, and your prime resume minister. Your seat. It's being 7:20. The Senate is now adjourned. Senator Henderson? No.
Senator McKim. The Senator McKim, I think, is ready to go. Uh, have I, just checking, I've got the call from you, President. You have the call, Senator McKim. We thank are you very, in adjournment. Thank you, uh, President. As the ALP and the LNP quibble over the minuscule differences between their climate policies, all the while both pocketing massive donations from corporations that are cooking the planet, it is time tonight to pay tribute to activists all over the country and right around the world. So to the people who are putting their bodies and their freedom on the line to stop logging, mining and the processing, transport and burning of fossil fuels, the Greens applaud your courage and your commitment. And we thank you from the bottom of our hearts for what you are doing. We acknowledge the risks and the dangers that you face. And we understand that you are taking direct action because of the abject failure of parliaments and supposed leaders here in Australia and around the world to ensure a safe climate and a sustainable future and a livable planet for our children and our grandchildren. And I want to pay particular tribute to a young person called Sergio who was sentenced yesterday to 12 months imprisonment with a non-parole period of six months, six months minimum period in jail for his part in a direct climate action in the Hunter Valley. 12 months imprisonment with a minimum non-parole period of six months for halting a coal supply train for five hours. This sentence is massive overreach and an absolute disgrace from the magistrate that imposed it. Sergio should not be facing six months in jail or more. Instead, he should be honoured for his bravery and thanked for his public service. And that's what I do on behalf of the Greens this evening, because he has had the courage to do what all of the fossil fuel flunkies in this place will not and have not, and that is to stand up and fight for a safe future and a safe climate, not just for himself, Order. not just for an entire generation of Australians, but for the tens or hundreds of millions of people around the world, overwhelmingly poor and overwhelmingly people of colour, who will pay the highest price as our climate break down, breaks down around us. But instead of real climate action, we see state power, government power, locking in behind polluting corporations to defend their interests. And we need to be clear. The interests of these corporations means extracting profit at the direct expense of our climate, of nature and of our future. And right around this country, Labor and Liberal governments are accepting donations from corporations which profit from pollution. They are taking those donations, they're delivering on what they've been bought to do, and once they've done that, they sit down with their corporate donors and they draft laws to curb or even ban people's right to protest in this country. Laws to protect the profits of the corporate planet cookers at the expense of the rights of ordinary Australian people to protest to safeguard their future. Laws to lock in the ability of fossil fuel and logging companies to destroy nature and cook the planet, and to, uh, laws to ensure the imprisonment of anyone who's brave enough to stand in the way of those planet cooking and nature destroying companies. And then we see agents of the state like New South Wales Commissioner, Police Commissioner Mick Fuller rolling out into the media and threatening climate activists with jail sentences of up to 25 years. What a disgrace. I barely recognise this country. But I've got a warning today for those corporations and their servants in this place. The social compact is fracturing. Governments and parliaments are not delivering on their end of the social contract. They are actively facilitating the planet cooking, the destruction of nature and the mass extinction event that we are living through. 
Governments are going to find out very quickly they cannot arrest their way out of the climate crisis. And if they keep on trying, they'll soon find out that their jails are nowhere near big enough. So thank you to all the brave activists standing up against the vested interests and the powerful and in support of a safe climate and in support of nature. Thank you, Senator McKim. Uh, Senator Askew. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. When Hungry Jacks launched its Rebel Whopper in 2019, it was marketed as 100 per cent Whopper, 0 per cent beef, with a smoky barbecue flavour just like the famous beef Whopper. Yes, the Rebel Whopper burger patty is made from soy protein and, for all intents and purposes, the Rebel Whopper has been made to look and taste like the chain's regular Whopper. The only major difference is the protein contained in the burger. The ingredients that make this plant-based burger patty taste like the meat it seeks to emulate is heme. Heme is an iron-rich molecule found in all living things. In animals, the heme in haemoglobin and myoglobin carry oxygen through the bloodstream and muscles. Heme also gives meat, like beef, its distinctive red colour and metallic bloody taste. Put simply, heme is what makes meat taste meaty. Plant-based meat alternatives have been made to taste like meat through the inclusion of a heme-rich protein derived from soy plants called leg haemoglobin, which is short for legume haemoglobin. This heme is manufactured using yeast that has been genetically engineered with the gene for soy leg haemoglobin. The texture of meat has also been replicated in these plant-based patty alternatives because the molecular structures of animal muscle and plant proteins are different. Animal muscle is formed by bundles of interlocking protein fibres, while plants have small, round, non-fibrous proteins. Muscle-like threads have been created in plant protein by elongating soy proteins and using heat and pressure to create strands that mimic a muscle-like texture. Clearly, we have very clever scientists at work here, creating some incredible food products. But this speech is not a biology lesson or to share scientific innovations. I'm talking tonight about the unnecessary confusion created within the minds of consumers when faced with an array of products created to look like meat. This is why I'm talking about a Hungry Jack's burger in the Senate. I want you to think about what it actually means when we have businesses creating products to look and taste like meat but are not actually made from meat. Who are these products supposed to appeal to? I don't know of any vegetarians or vegans who actively seek out products that look and taste like meat. In fact, I imagine many would consider them an insult to their choice not to consume meat or animal products. I've seen plant-based meat alternatives at my local supermarket, and I'm sure you have too. But did you look twice like I did, unsure whether the package contained a real meat patty or a chicken strip? When such products look like meat and are positioned in areas adjacent to the section stocked with meat and chicken, is it any wonder consumers are confused by these options? Research agency Pollinate surveyed 1,000 Australians in July on their attitudes to plant-based meat. Pollinate found 61 per cent of those that took, did the survey mistook at least one plant-based meat product as containing animal meat, and half said they find packaging for the products tested in the survey to be confusing. When these consumers were asked which elements of the plant-based products packaging and marketing they found confusing, they said animal imagery, the small or hard to read font for plant-based references and use of meat descriptors. I don't think it's too much to ask that plant-based protein product manufacturers and marketers refrain from using images of cows, chickens or other animals on the packaging. And I don't think they should be allowed to use the words like beef, bacon or chicken to describe these products because despite being made to look and taste as such, they are not either beef, bacon or chicken. US State Missouri went so far as to enact a law to stop such marketing trickery from happening in 2018. Missouri, Missouri's law prohibits anyone from misrepresenting a product as meat that is not derived from harvested production livestock or poultry. Plant-based food producers have launched lawsuits since, alleging this label law, labelling law violates First Amendment rights to free speech, but it criminalised the word meat 
and unfairly restricts how manufacturers can sell meat alternatives that they have been unsuccessful. As my fellow senators know, the Senate Standing Committee on Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport has been conducting an inquiry into this, product, this situation. The committee examined whether meat branding had been impaired by the appropriation of product labelling by manufactured plant-based or synthetic protein brands. I look forward to reading the committee's report because I believe we should know exactly what is included in the food products we buy and what we are consuming when eating out or take away. Thank you. Thank you. You, uh, Senator Antic. Thank you, Mr. President. Deputy President, most Australians take it for granted that denying services for basic rights based on gender, race, sexuality, religious, or political views is wrong. This is the very reason that Australia has anti-discrimination laws, laws to protect people from being refused services and employment over these very issues. That is to be expected of a liberal democracy like Australia. So it's tragically ironic that after several decades of building upon anti-discrimination legislation, it's only taken a relatively short time for Australia to be transformed into a two-tiered society on the grounds of medical discrimination. All of the simple act of refusing a COVID vaccine. Australians are being refused entry into businesses, denied basic services, having their movements restricted, losing their jobs and having their careers ruined. First it was nurses, then physios, then dentists, chiropractors. And last week, the health bureaucracy in South Australia mandated teachers. This week, it's cabbies and Uber drivers. Those who refuse COVID vaccines are being marginalised for no reason other than their refusal to comply with the whims of a power-hungry, unelected health bureaucracy around the country. And history doesn't look kindly on these actions. Justifying such medical discrimination in the name of science is incoherent. If the argument is these vaccines protect you, then you have no reason to be worried about unvaccinated people and vaccine passports are rendered useless by the fact that vaccinated people can still spread the contagion. Why then are unvaccinated people being hunted by our institutions and the bully boys of the corporate world? Australia cannot become a nation in which people are required to present private medical information to fully participate in society. Such processes are a hallmark of totalitarian regimes like Soviet Russia, and they're a tool wielded to pressure people into compliance. Travelling interstate, ordering a cup of coffee, going to the movies, visiting an elderly parent and being allowed to work should never require an unwanted medical procedure, whether it's safe or effective or not. The right to live and work without being subjected to a medical procedure or the whims of a Timpoc bureaucrat must be restored and protected. The borders must be open for all people, regardless of their private medical decisions. And we can't pretend that Australia is a free country until these steps are taken. Our freedoms are nurtured and defended so that they're passed on to the next generation, but they're being trampled on supposedly in the name of health and safety. The assault on basic human rights and dignity has been astounding. Rallies all across the nation last weekend drew hundreds of thousands of Australians, not anti-vaxxers, not far-right extremists, not white supremacists, as the lazy, lazy media and the left has called them. My office has in fact been bombarded with emails and calls from people across the country who have been forced to choose between taking a medical procedure that they don't want and keeping their jobs. It's a great shame that our nation has allowed this to happen. Recent polling commissioned by my office shows that nearly 28 per cent, nearly a third of South Australians have felt pressured into taking one of these treatments. That may be upwards of 400,000 South Australians. Those pushing against this discrimination today will be remembered. Uh, in a way, those pushing medical discrimination today will be remembered in much the same way that segregationalists were remembered in the past. So Robert Menzies once said, the rarest form of courage, I think, in the world is moral courage, the courage that a man has when he's prepared to form the view of the truth and pursue it, when he's not running around the corner every five minutes to say, is this going to be popular? I wonder what Sir Robert would say about us today. Uh, no, uh, so I think uh, I've got Senator Steele John, who's, if you're there remotely, Senator Steele John. We Thank can, you. Yes, we can uh, hear you, Senator. Can you hear me? Yes. No? Please, please proceed, Senator. Thank you. The Scarborough gas development is shaping up to become part uh, of Australia's most uh, polluting fossil fuel industry the gas industry. 
If it goes ahead, this mega project off the north coast of Western Australia will singularly increase national emissions by some 10%. It will produce four times more emissions over its lifetime than Adani. The mere suggestion of its existence uh, is inconsistent with our, our Paris climate targets. It irreversibly threatens First Nations cultural heritage sites, including 45,000-year-old World Heritage, World Heritage Murujuga rock art. It puts marine life at risk. It puts life at risk, full stop. At a time when the rest of the world is scrambling to reduce uh, emissions and tackle uh, climate change, what is the Morrison government doing? They are, scheduled, they are working in cahoots with the fossil fuel industry uh, and other fossil fuel giants uh, in the corporate sector uh, who have signed off on this project yesterday to launch this disastrous endeavour. The science in relation to this project is irrefutable. The mining and burning of coal, oil and gas is fueling the climate crisis, and yet the government continues to find ways to ignore the facts, even as the water rises around its neck and the flames lick at the empty space where its conscience should be. We know what this project is about. It is about the millions of dollars that they are accepting from the fossil fuel industry. In October, the International Energy Agency reported that Scarborough uh, could be a dud investment if the world commits to net zero uh, by 2050. Global markets for LNG exports um, are growing increasingly uncertain as our trading partners uh, switch to cheaper and cleaner sources of energy. So regardless of whether you look at it from an environmental or an economic standpoint, Scarborough makes absolutely zero sense. What is so frustrating about this is that reaching net zero is absolutely achievable. And earlier uh, that we begin the transition, uh, which is inevitable, it is an inevitable transition, um, the smoother it will be. We can harness our abundant renewable energy resources to generate cheap and reliable energy. Uh, we can drive our economy uh, into the future and create hundreds of thousands of new jobs. We can take care of fossil fuel workers and their families, uh, supporting them through this transition. And we can do it all uh, without Scarborough ever coming into existence. Our community here in WA made itself crystal clear. There is no desire for the Scarborough Grass Project. As I speak today, the community has mobilised outside of Woodside's HQ here in Perth to oppose the project in the strongest possible terms. We will not accept new fossil fuel projects in this state. The Greens unequivocally oppose uh, the uh, building of this development and support the community in its total opposition uh, to the Scarborough Gas Project and indeed to all new coal, oil and gas developments. Thank the Chamber for its time. Thank you, Senator Steele-John. Uh, Senator Abetz. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. As Australians, we rightly rejoice in being one and free. That sentiment, so succinctly expressed in our national anthem, needs to fertilise the thinking of our nation's authorities as they deal with COVID. Families, workplaces and communities are experiencing tensions between those supportive of vaccination and those who are hesitant or outright opposed. For the record, I'm vaccinated and encourage people to follow suit. But also for the record, I will not shun those who hold an alternate view. Robust discussion and willing interactions are an integral part of a free democratic society, as is the need for respect and understanding for the other point of view. They are the hallmarks of a civilised and orderly liberal democratic society. Those fundamental principles, understandings and appreciations need to be fully grasped as we deal with COVID. Our immunisation handbook informs us 
that valid legal consent should be obtained prior to immunisation and that undue pressure, manipulation or coercion are not the foundations of such valid legal consent. The threat of a two-tier society based on the vaxxed and the unvaxxed is not what I want for Australia. A divided society is a weakened society. People who want to be vaccinated should be given that opportunity and are availing themselves of the taxpayer-funded rollout. Those who have concerns have a right to not so avail themselves whilst their taxes are helping to pay for the rollout. It's how our society works. But workers being threatened with dismissal unless vaccinated is not something I can support and indeed feel compelled to oppose. If vaccination does what it asserts, there should be no fear of the unvaccinated by the vaccinated. So as soon as everyone who wants to be vaccinated has been given a reasonable opportunity to be so vaccinated, we should be getting back to normal for domestic purposes. To hear of labourers and medical specialists losing their jobs because of their views on vaccination is unacceptable. Medical students are being told they can't sit their exams if not vaccinated, but students in other disciplines can. A GP who doesn't want to be vaccinated will be denied from even practising telehealth. Go figure. Defence personnel at the peak of their physical wellbeing are threatened with dismissal if they don't submit. It is now beyond question that those who are fully vaccinated can also catch and transmit the virus which begs the question as to why only one group, the unvaccinated, is being discriminated against. We have a shortage of highly qualified defence personnel, workers, doctors and nurses, yet very soon some of these committed and dedicated workers will not only lose their gainful employment, but their essential service will be denied to the wider community, livelihoods, careers and aspirations all being trashed whilst dividing us. Proportionality in these things is currently missing. Why do you need to be vaccinated to sit a medical exam or practice telehealth? Why are we denying much needed services of all types to the community because of people's vaccination status? Unvaccinated Australians, who might I add are overwhelmingly good, decent Australians, point to the risk of an adverse reaction to immunisation in comparison to the dangers of contracting COVID. Respectfully, I disagree, and that's why I'm vaccinated. But it doesn't stop me from acknowledging and respecting their right to their point of view and argue that they should be denied access to entertainment, shopping centres, churches, let alone their jobs and professions. Personal freedoms are the cornerstone of what makes Australia great, which is why I can't stand by and watch long-held rights of personal medical choices being thrown away. Freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it to our children in the bloodstream. It must be fought for, protected and handed on for them to do the same. So said Ronald Reagan. He was correct. Our authorities need to respect freedom and not create a two-tier society. The right to a job should not be dependent on a jab. By all means, convince, but don't coerce. By all means, educate, but don't discriminate. Protecting freedoms, including of those with whom we might disagree, is vital. Our failure to do so will have corrosive long-term consequences. Thank you, Senator Abet. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, distrust and division. These are the two words defining the Morrison government today. Two goals of a government that has nothing else to offer the Australian people. When you step back and look at how our nation is holding it together right now, it is difficult to comprehend exactly how we got here. We should be on the cusp of great things right now. We should be about to rebuild our economy and our society after two incredibly difficult years, two years when the overwhelming majority of Australians pulled together. They did the right thing for themselves and their families and understood that we are stronger when we work together as a community. 
We should be united in pride about the sacrifices that Australians made to keep each other safe. We should be in awe of the scientists who delivered vaccines despite all odds. We should be determined right now to lift everyone up who fell behind in the last two years. And as we head into a new year, we should be full of hope about what we can achieve in the future and prepared for any setbacks that might come along the way. And instead, we are mired in distrust and division. Mired in distrust and division. Distrust and division that is overseen by the highest elected office holder in the land, our own Prime Minister. Distrust and division that has been actively fermented by the highest office holder in the land. Distrust and division fanned by a Prime Minister who everyone knows is playing two sides of a very dangerous game. He is agreeing to condemn, under questioning, anti-democratic protesters threatening violence, threatening our democratic process in Melbourne. But at the same time, he is using their exact language. He is using the exact language of these violent protesters over and over again, mimicking their lines, their lines that it's time for government to get out of our lives. This is a desperate and dangerous game. It is unbecoming of our Prime Minister. It is undermining of our democracy. It is a complete failure of leadership. And it squanders the goodwill and the support Australians have been showing each other through these two years of crisis. It is a disgrace. It is a dog whistling, vote grubbing, desperate disgrace. And it is a hypocritical disgrace at it. Imagine if, instead of all of this, our Prime Minister had just explained over the last two years that we needed restrictions in place while there were no vaccines to keep us safe. Imagine if we'd had a Prime Minister who had told the truth, who had told the truth to the people that until he rolled out the vaccines, you will need rolling lockdowns. Imagine if we'd had a Prime Minister who had actively pursued those vaccines and bought them when they were available so that people didn't have to go through this second, incredibly tough year all over again. Imagine if instead of Prime Minister Morrison, we had a national leader who could actually bring people together. The distrust and division that this Prime Minister and members of his government are actively courting is being piled on to a massive trust deficit that already exists. A trust deficit, again, overseen by our Prime Minister. A Prime Minister who is, at best, loose with the truth. A Prime Minister who has been caught out lying again and again. A Prime Minister who is always searching for the next line to get through his next difficult day. Who bends with the breeze, distracts and diverts, and spins and spins, hoping no one will know which way is up. A Prime Minister who moves to his next message just as fast as he can get from one press conference to the next. And he does all of this because he has absolutely no plan for our country. Thank you, Senator Walsh. Senator Roberts, remotely, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? And we can hear you, Senator. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I note that we're living through a time of great civil disturbance. The media have chosen to fill our screens with exaggerated horror and fear. As a result, families are turning against families, neighbours against neighbours and employers against employees. At this difficult time, we cannot lose sight of the good in this world. While daunting for some, we benefit from counting our blessings and looking forward to again becoming the Australia we all know and love. My message tonight is simple. Abundance is not a dirty word. It's a blessing to be appreciated. Australia is blessed with natural diversity and climate and soil. Somewhere on our continent exist the conditions necessary to grow any crop to rival the world's best. 
Whether olives in Inglewood or cashews at Dimbula, Aussie farmers will always step forward to have a go. As 42 countries slip into food deficits, Australia's agricultural output is at record highs. We're literally feeding the world right now, and more water for our farmers will feed more of the world's hungry. Our entrepreneurship had lifted Australia from a prison colony to a top 10 world economy. Australians invented the black box fight recorder, heart pacemakers, the electric drill, bionic hearing, Wi-Fi hotspots, and even Google Maps. Now this flow of innovation has not stopped, it continues. The University of Queensland pioneered a world first tissue culture system that can produce up to 500 avocado plants from a single cutting. This gives Australian producers the ability to bring new cultivars to market faster, cheaper and using fewer chemicals than anywhere in the world. The world avocado market is valued at $20 billion and Australia has only 500 million of that so far. From farming, let's look at mining. An Australian invention called the reflux classifier allows for the recovery of minerals that normally run to waste in the processing of ore. The University of Newcastle pioneered this recent technology, returning $1.5 billion in royalties back to Australia every year. The University of Newcastle recently registered a patent on a new type of low-cost thermal storage material called miscibility gaps alloy. Miscibility gaps alloy raises the promise of storing energy from non-baseload power sources to be fed back into the grid in times of peak energy demand. This has the potential for a multi-billion dollar export and licensing industry. I certainly hope so, because that may stop some arguments about the proliferation of unreliable renewables, what I call intermittents. Miscibility gaps alloy could not exist without carbon and without mining. The economic powerhouse that is Australian mining has kept Australia out of recession these last two years. At one point, we had the world's largest value of stored natural resources. If we were still exploring for the bounty this land has given us, we may still be the richest country in the world. It's not too late. We need to reject the black armband view of our history and by extension, our future. We need to embrace entrepreneurship to defend the inalienable right for everyday Australians to lift themselves up through hard work and enterprise. And we need to make sure the benefit of that hard work accrues to Australians doing the work, to everyday Australians, not to foreign corporations. So let me explain. The wealth each Australian creates every year, called the gross domestic product per capita inflation adjusted, increased from $41,000 per person in 1980 to 77,000 per person in 2019. Do we, though, feel almost twice as wealthy as we did 40 years ago? No, definitely not. Median or midpoint wages have not increased in this period. The spoils of the hard work of everyday Australians have not gone to everyday Australians. Instead, this wealth has gone to foreign multinational corporations and to the administrative class. Public service wages are growing at 4%, while private enterprise wages at less than 1%. And that's just not right. What's needed in the short term is removal of all COVID restrictions so the economy can open up and the Australian entrepreneurial spirit can repair the damage of COVID lockdown mismanagement. Then we need to remove green tape so farmers can farm and miners can mine. Instead of unelected, unaccountable foreign bureaucrats dictating to us, we must start making decisions for ourselves. Government does have a role to build the roads, build the dams and build the railroads. We need to restore our productive capacity to support this growth. Tax and finance are necessary. Tax and finance reform are necessary to ensure that Australians can access the capital to expand and ensure that the profits from that expansion stay here. We have one flag. We are one community. We are one people. We are one nation. Abundance is not to be ashamed of. Abundance is a blessing to celebrate. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Uh, Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I was absolutely delighted to attend the opening ceremony for the 2021 Challenge of the Nations uh, netball tournament, which was held at Bill Norris Oval, Bean Lee. And Mr Acting Deputy President, you would know Bill Norris Oval extremely well, uh, as would my friend uh, Senator Stoker. The netball tournament was put on a wonderful or by a wonderful organisation called the Enua Manu Achu Nui Marua Rua Association of Queensland. And the participants in the tournament, and there were something like 90 teams in all, came from our Pacific family and also from our First Nations people. 
and I'd like to pay tribute to all the teams who participated, all the organisers uh, and everyone involved in what was a wonderful, wonderful event. The competition is actually being played over two weekends, so the weekend just gone and the weekend coming up. And there was a total of, if you can believe this, 860 players, 380 juniors, 480 seniors, with 12 teams from Cook Islands, Netball Queensland, 10 First Nations teams, 17 teams from Queensland Maori Netball Inc., 11 teams from New Way Netball Queensland, eight teams from Queensland PNG Gold Netball Club, who were actually hosting the opening ceremony. And if I can really pay tribute to all of the, uh, the great uh, people, teenagers who dressed up in their cultural costumes uh, to lead the march of the teams, uh, eight teams from I should say 18 teams from Queensland Samoa Netball Inc. Two teams from Solomon Islands Brisbane Community Netball, 12 teams from Queensland Tonga Netball Inc. Total of 90 teams. This is the seventh year of the competition, and I would like to uh, make three comments in relation to the competition. Firstly, it was all about promoting the cultural identity of each of the, each of the nations represented in the tournament. And it was just wonderful to see, especially the young kids, embracing their cultural identity. Second, you had all the Pacific family coming together with our First Nations people for this wonderful, wonderful event. And it was all about bringing people together. So, Mr Deputy President, this wasn't just a netball competition. I have played Senator Stoker's uh, smiling at me. I have played some mixed netball in my distant past. I was not invited to participate on any of the teams. Uh, but it wasn't just about netball. It was a celebration of the cultural identity of each of our great Pacific family nations and also of our First Nations people. I would like to thank the following people for their involvement. Uh, Mr Kevin Nando, who was the wonderful MC and actually acts as an MC in many events in the southeast corner of Queensland. Deborah Sandy and her daughter for a wonderful welcome to country, uh, including a song in their traditional language that, which they shared with the audience. The opening prayer was held by Reverend Teramono Ua of the association. I'd, I'd like to specifically acknowledge the great work of the events manager, Jean Timoko Tio. Uh, just wonderful, wonderful work she undertook. Acknowledge the president of the association, Tio Katao Bruno to Ariki, the communications officer, Francis Panaya, the treasurer, Jessica Inay, the umpire coordinator, Tahu Wanga, assistant Riley, admin, admin team, Perry Tapsil, Mecca Tapsil, Tiano Tio, Jasmine Taropi, timekeeper, Riley Rui. My time's running out. I'm going to get through all these people. Cook Islands Netball Delegate Association representatives, Neri Ann Gregg, Nan Glassy, Kevin and Tupi. Dando, Indigenous Australia team rep Shane Abram, Queensland Maori Netball Inc rep Iris Ruhi, New Way Netball Queensland representatives Jade Noble and Rose Leo, uh, Queensland PNG Gold Netball Club representatives Anne Marie and Christina Carswell, Queensland Samoa Netball Inc Vanilla Gentle, Solomon Islands Brisbane Community Netball representative Athika Kraus, Queensland Tonga Netball Inc Joyce, Joyce Cosgrove Ponga and Sinner. Uh, I think I've covered everyone, and can I just thank everyone who was involved in this tournament. My apologies if I didn't get the pronunciation exactly right, uh, but I'll make sure it's in Hansard, and congratulations one on all for what was a wonderful, wonderful event. Thank you, Senator Scar. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you very much. I received so many wonderful speeches from young people in my electorate as part of Raise Our Voices Youth Voice in Parliament Week that I couldn't choose just one to read. So tonight I'd like to read a speech written by a 15-year-old Canberran named Sarah. My name is Sarah Perrett. I am a high school student in Canberra. I am 15 years old. I am currently watching the government and citizens of Australia work together to bring an end to the pandemic in Australia. This has shown that the only way to solve big problems is with a big community. My future for Australia is broad and inclusive. It's a future that gives everyone a chance to help. Everybody loves being part of something big and exciting. I believe that our future is big and exciting. 
The environment is one of the most current and important issues. We should be aiming for a time where children don't have to worry about the environment. If we change how everyday Australians such as myself view the climate crisis, then we can get them involved. We need more participation. Many know what is happening to our earth, but few know, know how they can help. We should be addressing the fact that fixing issues in Australia can also assist in fixing our earth. Problems such as the unhealthy amount of overeating in teenagers and children have an effect on Australia's environment. There are many more of these problems that can be addressed. The only way to solve these nationwide problems is if we all do it together. If we work as a nation, we can help everyone, but when we split, we can't help anybody. Thank you, Sarah, and I look forward to seeing you give a speech in Parliament uh, one day soon. Uh, I would also like to speak briefly about another issue of great importance to Canberrans, and that is about the ACT's democratic rights. Twenty-four years ago in federal parliament, Mr. Mr Andrews, a member of the other place, introduced laws that diminished the democratic rights of over half a million people. Those laws, which remain in place today, denied people living in the ACT and the Northern Territory the right to political autonomy with respect to voluntary assisted dying. Now, some 25 years on, despite every state having debated or passed voluntary assisted dying legislation, another man continues to stand in the way of repealing these fundamentally unfair laws and single-handedly blocking the democratic rights of his constituents, and that man is ACT Senator, Senator Zed Selger. Now, this isn't the first time that Senator Selger has let his own views be prioritised over the overwhelming majority view of the community he claims to represent. From same-sex marriage to climate action, he actively cam campaigns against important issues in this place. But this is the first time that Senator Selger has actively fought to have all Canberrans treated like second-class citizens. Earlier this week, I presented a petition signed by thousands of Canberrans who want to see our democratic rights restored. When I started this petition on this issue, the response was immediate and overwhelming. Every member of the, every ACT federal representative, other than Senator Seselja, supports the restoration of territory rights. Every member of the ACT Legislative Assembly, including every member of the Canberra Liberals, supports the rest restoration of our territory rights even those representatives who may not support voluntary assisted dying. They still support the right of our elected lo local parliament to have the debate. I tabled my petition to let the record show that over 2,800 Canberrans want to enjoy the same democratic rights of every other Australian. They want their rights to align with those Australians who just so happen to live in the States. After 24 years of discrimination, with every state now having debated voluntary assisted dying legislation, the time has long passed for this parliament to end the discrimination and restore territory rights. All we need is one more debate on a bill to get this done for the ACT and the Northern Territory. We could have had that debate this week in this place, but as, as we've seen, this chaotic government refused to allow the debate on one of their own senators' bills to even occur in this chamber. I will keep fighting on this issue. I want to see Canberrans have their democratic rights restored. They deserve the same rights as every other Australian, and to think otherwise, as Senator Selger does, is, isn't just outdated. It's simply unconscionable. I think we need to ensure that the debate happens respectfully, and we need to ensure that the local parliament in the Northern Territory and the ACT are given the same rights to debate the subject of voluntary assisted dying and that allows the rights of citizens in those territories to ha enjoy the same rights as every other citizen who happens to live in a state around Australia. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. November 25th is the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. I wish we didn't need this day. I wish that there weren't any reasons for me to speak out about gendered violence in Australia and around the world. But it does serve as a reminder that we still need to take serious action if we are to have any hope of eliminating this violence. Violence against women continues to be an, at epidemic levels in this country. Every year we continue to count the numbers and every year they continue to be distressingly high. The Counting Dead Women Australia project reports that at least 38 women have lost their lives because of violence so far this year. Last year, we lost 56 women. 
and there were countless others who suffer abuse and violence. We must do everything to end all forms of violence against women. We must prevent these deaths. A report in June this year by the Queensland University of Technology's Centre for Justice confirmed our fears that domestic abuse increased during COVID-19 lockdowns. A study by the Harmony Alliance and Monash University, also published in June, found that a third of migrant and refugee women surveyed had experienced some form of dom domestic and family violence. Women on temporary visas also experienced high levels of domestic violence. Yet, for so many, support services such as crisis or social housing are limited, as are protections against abuse. There is so much that needs to change. The housing crisis we are in particularly impacts fleeing, people fleeing domestic violence. What happens if someone is fleeing violence and no emergency housing service has the capacity to accommodate them? They will be forced to stay in an abusive relationship. Research by Anne Rose, published in November 2020, found that almost half of the murder, women murdered by an intimate partner in Queensland had previously been labelled by police as the perpetrator of domestic violence. How is this meant to give us faith in the current system? An open letter from the Law Council of Australia warned the Attorney General that the merging of the Family Court and the Federal Circuit Court would harm families and people experiencing family violence. The government, at the behest of One Nation, still pushed this bill through. I know that if the federal government treated violence against women with the seriousness, with the urgency it deserves, we would not be in this position. But we have a real absence of national leadership. We do not have leaders willing to challenge and reform the systems and structures that allow gendered violence to continue. There is no question that violence and sexual assault services need more funding. We need to build women-only refuges and properly fund specialist services. Women need to know that they will have the support they need when they walk away from violence, abuse and control. By eliminating violence, but eliminating violence against women isn't as simple as demanding the government do more. It also demands deep changes in society and in an entrenched patriarchal culture, attitudes and systems that allow violence against women to be normalized. Gendered violence is deeply embedded in society. It affects all of us in both known and unknown ways. It is still painfully obvious that we need to do so much more. Governments need to do, no, do more. Society needs to do more. Women across this country have told us in no uncertain terms they will not rest until sexism, misogyny, abuse, violence, rape and assault against us becomes a thing of the past. And be assured that women united will never be defeated. We must listen and we must act to remove the gender inequities that pervade our society, including the gender pay gap, unpaid care work, poverty, sexual violence, harassment and discrimination. The International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women serves as a reminder of how much work still needs to be done. But my hope is that in the very near future, we won't have to mark this day because women and children will be respected and free, be free from violence. And I look forward to that day. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to contribute to this adjournment debate. I would like to honour the life of Wayne Fowler Morrison. Wayne Fowler Morrison was a proud 29-year-old Wiradjuri, Kukatha and Warangal man. He was a loving father, a keen outdoorsman, a fisherman and an artist. He was a gentle and kind man. He is loved deeply by his family and they miss him terribly every single day. In September 2016, officers, police officers, forced a spit hood 
on Wayne's head. They cuffed his wrists and ankles at Yadala Labor Prison and he was thrown face down in a van. A spit hood is a mesh fabric device that covers your mouth. It covers your face and often your head too, making it difficult to breathe. They often forcefully are pulled onto a person's head and secured with an elastic band around the neck. Imagine that. Let's be clear. Spit hoods are torture devices. Tragically, Wayne was pulled unconscious from that van and died three days later from causes including asphyxia. We don't really know what happened in that van. There's no CCTV footage. And at this stage, officers are still refusing to give evidence. No one has been held accountable. So the fight continues. No justice. Wayne's family continues to fight for justice every day, and they've achieved something absolutely remarkable this month because they didn't give up the fight. On 18th of November, the South Australian Lower House voted on Fowler's bill to permanently ban the use of spit hoods in South Australia. Wayne's family, who fought for justice, meant that South Australia was the first jurisdiction to ban the use of spit hoods by law. The first jurisdiction. What does that mean? Every other jurisdiction gets away with it. Since Fowler's death, his family have been demanding a ban on spit hoods to prevent any other family having to go through that intense anguish and pain of having a loved one be killed by the criminal legal system. This is a pain that our people know all too well. This ban on spit hoods also shows how preventable deaths in custody, particularly Aboriginal deaths in custody, which you all keep ignoring. We can change this with political will and courage. Don't see much of that in here, obviously. I honour the work of Wayne's family and I demand that this parliament and, in fact, all parliaments pass legislation to ban the use of spit hoods. Around the world, international human rights organisations have called for an end to police and prison officers using spit hoods. Many people have died or been seriously injured. Spit hoods are a threat to human life dignity and safety. If spit hoods were banned, Fowler might still be here. Spit, hood, spit hoods are state-sanctioned torture devices. And we'll never forget the image out of Dondale Youth Detention when 13-year-old brother Dylan Voller strapped to a chair and spit hooded by prison officers. This is the 13th anniversary of the Royal 30th anniversary of the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody. We have to stop torturing black people in this country, right? 240 years of torture has to thank stop. Thank you, Senator Thorpe. Time's expired. Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak up for fairness and equality, specifically in support of the fundamental notion that those who are doing the same job should be treated in the same way, especially when it comes to wages and conditions. This is a principle that many working people have fought and struggled in support for for so many years. One would hope that in modern day Australia, this value of fairness and equity would be well enshrined by now. And you certainly could be forgiven for assuming that this principle of same job, same pay would be upheld within our Australian Public Service, an institution that should be setting the standard for employment conditions for our entire national workforce, 
but sadly many thousands of Australians who work for the Commonwealth Government know only all too well that this is not the case. Because under the Scott Morrison Barnaby Joyce Government, we have seen an absolute explosion of the use of labour hire across all departments within our national public service. That is to say, we are seeing a big increase in the number of staff who do the work of, Commonwealth of the Commonwealth Government but aren't directly employed by them. And the sad truth is that those workers employed through labour hire firms to work for the Commonwealth are not treated equally to the APS staff that they work alongside. Invariably and inevitably, these labour hire workers earn far less and receive far less in entitlements and training than their permanent counterparts in secure jobs. How insidious and widespread is the use of labour hire by our Australian public service? Well, we don't exactly know, but we should. According to the Community and Public Sector Union, there are at least 20,000 labour hire workers working alongside permanent staff in the Australian public service. In my home state of Tasmania, there are at least 350 labour hire staff working for the Commonwealth Government, with the CPSU estimating the real figure could be as high as 500 positions. By some estimates, in some departments, it may be well as high as 42 per cent of the to total workforce. That's according to a Canberra Times an an analysis from this year that also found contracted labour averaged one in five workers across the 14 Commonwealth government departments. That analysis found the Department of Veterans Affairs topped out with the figure of 42 per cent of staff engaged through labour hire firm. Almost one in two workers. It's extraordinary, unnecessary, unfair and costly. Costly to the Commonwealth. This practice has to change. It's a disservice to both the workers employed directly by the AEPS and to the labour hire workers who work alongside them. It's a disservice to the nation. It's costly and it's just not right. We should expect more than a supposed from a supposed model employer, our very own national government. Well, Labor wants to do something about it. We've got the backs of working people right across this country, particularly those in insecure work, and we've got the backs of the many thousands of Australians who work in public service for the Australian people. A Labor government will end the practice of paying Labor hire workers less than those who are directly employed by the employer when they are actually doing exactly the same job. The present system is a distortion and an unfair one at that, and it's not in the interest of taxpayers. Under the Morrison-Joyce government, taxpayer funds are being gushing into the coffers of expensive labour hire firms who then pocket the funds while studying the, their workers and thinned out pay packets and slimmed down conditions. Labor will seek to rein in this wasteful practice. An Albanese Labor government would conduct an audit of employment across the entire APS to weed out those areas where temporary forms of work have been used in an inappropriate manner. Instead of lining the pockets of the big labour hire firms, an Albanese Labor government will use precious taxpayers' money wisely, fairly and sensibly by employing those who work for the Commonwealth government directly in our Australian public service with secure jobs, fair pay and conditions, and will make sure that they have fair bargaining net framework. But it won't stop there. Our commitment to fairness and equality in the workplace and the notion of same job, same pay extends beyond our public service to the entire workforce. In fact, so committed is Labor in, to achieving this principle, we are prepared to give the, the government an opportunity to do, do it for us. They can support Labor's same job, same pay bill. They only have to have the, uh, the workers Senator Brown, at heart. Time's expired. Senator Cox. Tonight I would like to highlight some of the important work being done by First Nations people to protect country through fire management. First Nations people have been undertaking traditional fire management for tens of thousands of years. Since colonisation and the removal of First Nations people from their land, we have seen the emergence of large, uncontrolled wildfires. These late, dry season wildfires damage our ecosystems and habitats. In the last few decades, we have seen the revival of traditional fire management practices in the Kimberley and across northern Australia. 
This includes the emergence of savannah burning carbon projects. Unlike carbon capture and storage projects, which are unproven and haven't been shown to work anywhere, these savannah burning carbon projects use First Nations knowledge and science. Savannah burning involves the lighting of cool fires in targeted areas during the early dry season between March and July. These fires burn slowly, reduce fuel loads and create fire breaks. Indigenous rangers and traditional owners work to undertake early dry season burning to limit the extent of destructive late dry season wildfires. At the moment, there are 32 First Nations owned and operated savannah fire projects that are abating around 1 million tonnes of emissions a year. A massive 7 per cent of Australia's total carbon credit units are produced by First Nations carbon businesses. Northern Australian fire management is now recognised as world's best practice. This is what happens when you lead with First Nations science and knowledge. Savannah burning carbon projects come with substantial benefits for both people and planet. This ranges from allowing First Nations people to practice cultural burning techniques right through to the intergenerational exchange of traditional knowledge and practices. First Nations organisations involved in fire management also report an increase in their capacity to care for country, culture and communities as a result of their engagement in the carbon industry. These projects also provide hundreds of jobs for First Nations rangers who are at the heart of traditional fire management practices. At the same time, it's important to note that traditional fire management practices are not culturally appropriate everywhere. And whenever cultural burning is undertaken, it needs to be done properly and scientifically, and it must be undertaken in, in line with the principles of free, prior, informed consent. In WA, savannah burning is used up north in the Kimberley, but it's less common down south in more populated areas. It's essential that the government and conservation groups work with First Nations people to co-design fire management plans that are culturally appropriate and work to improve the health of our habitats, our forests and our woodlands. I'm proud to say that the Greens are taking a Caring for Country plan to the next election, which was recently launched by my colleague, Senator Thorpe. We have a plan to strengthen laws to protect First Nations' tangible and intangible heritage, expand Indigenous protected areas that are owned, cared for and managed by First Nations people, and triple the funding of First Nations ranger programs. This plan gives the resources to the people who know best. First Nations people have cared for land and waters for tens of thousands of years. We have the wisdom and the knowledge to heal and care for our country. As we enter into summer, I hope that we can all learn to take time to listen to First Nations people when it comes to traditional fire management practices where appropriate, because we cannot have climate justice without justice for First Nations people. Thank yeah. you. Senator Fair of Anti Wells. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak about mandatory vaccination and vaccination passports. I have been consistent in raising my concerns about these matters since they were first mooted. This, coupled with the sheer multitude of emails and communications I have received from the Australian public, prompted me to vote for the COVID-19 Vaccination Status Prevention of Discrimination Bill yesterday. Can I state from the outset that I am not opposed to vaccination? I am fully vaxxed. Indeed, I am the holder of an international certificate of vaccination or prophylaxis issued under the international health regulations, referred to commonly as the yellow book, Senator Farrell, for obvious reasons. Now, as Minister for International Development in the Pacific, I did about 50 trips overseas, so you can appreciate my yellow book is actually quite full. Now, the opposition that we have witnessed regarding mandatory vaccination and vaccination passports is a combination of the slings and arrows Australians have faced since the beginning of last year. Since April last year, I have been saying that when people lose their jobs, lose their livelihoods, lose their businesses and suffer the mental anguish that goes with all of this, they will look for someone to blame and they will blame the politicians. There is no doubt 
that problems with the vaccine rollout and the issues with the AstraZeneca vaccine resulted in vaccine hesitancy. Regrettably, the positive benefits of the vaccine in saving lives was lost. Now, as the former Deputy Chief Medical Officer Dr Coatesworth stated in an op-ed in the Sydney Morning Herald on 24 July, the dishonesty by risk-averse academics armed with webcams overstated the devastation likely to be wrought by clotting. Furthermore, there was a perception that there was no real choice available to people. It was clear from the beginning of the pandemic that some in the community did not want to be vaccinated or could not be vaccinated. At that time, it was important that all options, including complementary choices, should have at least been made publicly available. Instead, messaging was confused and disjointed. Credible experts like Emeritus Professor Robert Clancy, immunologist at the University of Newcastle, as well as emerging data from other countries, were dismissed, notwithstanding credible trials showing alternative and complementary medicines were reducing the duration and infectiousness of COVID. I come now to National Cabinet. It was supposed to facilitate cooperation. Australians are not interested in the bickering between the Commonwealth and the states and territories. However, there has been a growing perception that the Commonwealth has forfeited control. The states and territories are doing what they can, but the Commonwealth is bearing the brunt of the blame for failures, including quarantine and vaccination. In an article in The Australian on 28 July titled National Cabinet Not Fit for Purpose, Paul McClintock, who led the COAG Reform Council for Prime Minister Howard, noted, ad hoc meetings of federal and state leaders is no way to run an effective federation. It is a questionable use of the word cabinet. The term cabinet sets up an image of collective responsibility. This body has none of that. In that regard, it has seen premiers split on lockdowns, vaccines and border closures and attacking each other multiple times throughout the pandemic. Despite supposedly agreeing to the national plan, it is clear that premiers are not following the script. I now turn to lockdowns. The disquiet and anger at lockdowns has progressively increased. At the beginning, there was greater understanding, but now people are fed up. Australians have seen draconian, draconian measures imposed and liberties taken away, which were not scrutinised by parliaments around Australia. As someone who manages her own email uh, account, I have watched the stridency of communications increase markedly since last year. The disquiet has now grown, grown to red-hot anger. Constituents are very critical of lockdowns and its long-term effects. Many businesses will not survive the stop-start conditions they have faced for almost two years and the economic consequences, which will take years to recover from. On the social front, we have heard about increased suicides, more domestic violence and child abuse, loneliness, people foregoing medical treatment. What is the long-term cost of this? Will the cure be worse than the disease? Last year, I saw a video of about 20 residents of a nursing rehab facility in the US protesting against COVID restrictions. Many in wheelchairs were holding up signs, I'd rather die from COVID than loneliness. I am especially concerned about the long-term effects on our children and young people, with studies showing that school closures have done more harm than the virus. The Daily Telegraph of 1 August reported the number of 12 to 17-year-olds presenting to New South Wales emergency departments with self-harm or suicidal ideation was up 47 per cent in July 2021 compared with July 2019. Mental health became the shadow pandemic. And whilst the language of the premiers was that we needed to live with the virus, they acted to the contrary. It was about suppression, eradication and zero cases. Lockdown Lockdowns became the default. We became Fortress Australia. Sadly, we lost perspective. We forgot that every year there are approximately, sadly, 170,000 deaths in Australia, of which flu and pneumonia are the ninth leading cause of death. The statistics indicate the overwhelming majority of people who got COVID recovered and deaths were mainly of the elderly, often with other complications. For most, it was a mild Ill illness. And there has also been an increasing anger that the benefits of lockdowns outweighed the costs. 
the cost to our Australian way of life across a whole range of different areas, especially in the deprivation of civil liberties, um, has deteriorated as long, um, the longer the lockdowns went on. Many saw firsthand the heavy-handedness during lockdowns, such as police br brutality, a curtailment of religious practice, all resulting, and other things, all resulting in civil disobedience. And criticism of those who chose to voice their concerns in a peaceful and democratic manner were faced with hatred and vilification and being tagged anti-vaxxers. Many who protested were not anti-vaxxers. They were opposed to people being forced to get vaccinated. Now, on the issue of vaccine passports, many agree that this is a further erosion of liberties especially given that fully vaccinated people can not only get COVID but can also transmit the virus. Indeed, unvaccinated people may never get the virus and according, accordingly never transmit it. So forcing people to vaccinate or requiring people to disclose their medical inf information is a dangerous precedent. It threatens fundamental freedoms and the potential to create a multi-tiered society where people are denied basic access to needs. And most importantly, let's keep in mind the Australian Immunisation Handbook sets out procedures which includes what constitutes valid consent for treatment and that it must be uh, given voluntarily in the absence of undue pressure, coercion or manipulation. And whilst the National Cabinet and the Australian Government has pronounced that vaccination must be voluntary, the directions given have been confused and unclear. And in the absence of clear leadership, businesses and organisations have struggled unfairly because National Cabinet has failed to provide a clear and defined protocol for all Australians to follow. And yes, I appreciate that vaccination levels are high. But judging from the volume of correspondence, many people got vaccinated not because they wanted to, but because they felt compelled to do so. And hence the term medical apartheid has continued to cause resentment. Now, many of the people who are protesting are ordinary Australians, um, although there have been some people amongst them who are using the events for their own uh, purposes. And we have to understand what's driving people to go into the streets and protest. So we can't just dismiss them or we will risk their resolve hardening and others joining them. We need to understand the insecurity that results when livelihoods are taken away and people feel compelled to take action. Now, there has been a lack of parliamentary scrutiny afforded to pandemic measures. At the federal okay. level, over 500 COVID instruments have been made, many of which were not scrutinised. The states, using their own powers, have also imposed draconian measures, the last, latest of which is the pandemic bill uh, in Victoria by Premier Andrews. I note there's been very little criticism of the bill from the federal government, which is obvious given it is mirrored on the provisions of the Federal Biosecurity Act. Now, indeed, we became somewhat of a laughing stock overseas, and report after report outlined how one of the world's freest societies had become the hermit co continent. And so I have no doubts, as I stated back in April last year, we as politicians will shoulder the blame because, sadly, we failed to scrutinise um, the measures we were imposing on Australians. Had we done so, I believe that many of the draconian measures imposed would not have been approved. Senator O'Neill. Ms Season, um, I, I always give myself the opportunity to speak as a Christian into this space. Um, I feel very privileged to be a person of faith in the Labor Party who is here and has this opportunity to speak to matters that, are, um, that emerge from my sense of my own faithfulness. And I note uh, in the Gospel we hear many questions asked by, who is, uh, by, by Jesus and by followers of him, who is my brother, who is my neighbour, when should I help people? And there are many answers there, and that is about acknowledging the deep humanity of every person. And so, uh, as a person of faith, um, I speak today to the reality that is uh, the lived experience of the Rohingya minority in Myanmar. This is a matter of international consequence, and the people there are our brothers and sisters. As the recent coup by the Tatmadaw, the uh, my Myanmar military, they have taken over the news and another major crime of Myanmar's military has slowly slipped from the headlines. I want to speak today in this chamber on the continued state persecution of the Rohingya people 
and of Muslims all over Myanmar, and ask all those here to turn their minds and their attention to the plight of these people, our brothers and sisters in this region. The plight of the Rohingya is now one of the world's most blatant and most overlooked cases of religious and ethnic persecution. And to date, hundreds of thousands of Rohingya are crammed into refugee camps with little to no economic prospect for services. The Rohingya are a mostly Muslim minority population living in Myanmar, principally in the Rakhine state on the border with Bangladesh. The Rohingya have lived in Rakhine and its predecessor state, Arakan, since the 8th century and are a mixture of diverse ethnic groups, including Arabs, Mongols and Bengals. Conflict between the Rohingya and the majority Buddhist population has been ongoing throughout the 20th century since Myanmar received independence from the British in the 1940s. In 1982, the Rohingya were denied citizenship under the new nationality law, which precluded them from basic freedoms such as movement, public education, the right to vote and access to employment. In 1989, the junta changed the name of the state from Arakan to a name used for centuries to Rakhine to privilege the Buddhist Rakhine ethnic group, who also form a significant minority population in the region. When the 1990 election saw the election of four Rohingya MPs, the junta dissolved the parliament, arrested and jailed and tortured MPs. And I sit here, I stand here before you as a, an MP and think about the way we think about service in our country. And I know that around the world, MPs suffer this kind of attack. We should never take freedom for, for granted. We should never take the privileges of this place for granted. And we should be standing up for people who are oppressed and people who are hunted down. Over the last decade, tensions have risen between the Rohingya and the increasingly powerful ultranationalist Buddhist sect, who were empowered during the decades of military rule. The ruling military spread fears that the tiny Muslim population of Myanmar, which currently stands at just 5% of the population, will rise and, I quote, outbreed the current Buddhist majority. Extremists such as the Buddhist monk Ashin Wirathu have spread hate and vile lies. lies uh, which uh, make general assertions such as uh, Muslims are all rapists and assertions that the Muslims are determined to integrate Buddhist women into their religion and culture. The Buddhist monk Warathu has also spread ludicrous claims that the halal way of killing cattle allows familiarity with blood and could escalate to the level where it threatens world peace. Where are through frequently posts fake news about supposed crimes committed by Muslims online. These lies are then propagated to tens of thousands of people via fake Facebook and YouTube and by the 2,500 monks that he oversees. This vile religious bigotry is straight out of the fascist textbook, but instead of being stamped out, it's infected all aspects of Myanmar society. Anti-Muslim riots broke out in Mandalay Myanmar's former royal capital in 2014, leaving two people dead. Muslims across Myanmar are now being forced to register as foreigners rather than as citizens of Myanmar. Of course, this leads to further discrimination and alienation. However, the simmering conflict did not come to a head until 2017, when the Arakan Rohingya Salvation Army, also ASA for short, attacked the government outposts. ASA was then declared a terrorist group and the Tatmadaw deployed 70 battalions to Rakhine State, whose soldiers responded with disproportionate and indiscriminate violence, including random murders, widespread sexual assault, torture and mass detention. The Tatmadaw ethnically cleansed hundreds of thousands of Rohingya from their homeland and forced them across the border into Bangladesh into what is now arguably the world's largest refugee camp, Cox Bazaar. These atrocities were completely disproportionate to the provocation and fit into dec a decades-long pattern of discrimination and dehumanisation of the Rohingya minority. The Rohingya people languish to this day in squalor in these camps, eking out an existence on the fringes of Bangladesh society 
and abandoned by their homeland and supposed protectors. I note there has been some international action on this issue. US President Biden has sanctioned Myanmar's generals in relation to these war crimes. New Zealand has suspended all high-level contact with Myanmar and imposed travel bans on its military leaders. Australia has provided $89 million in humanitarian assistance and targeted sanctions on the military leaders responsible. But the humanitarian crisis remains. 860,000 Rohingya are still stateless and displaced. They're living in refugee camps and in poverty. The, the COVID-19 pandemic has only made this awful situation that much worse. A December 2020 UNHCR report noted that food insecurity had risen, household income had dropped, and 10 per cent of camp residents reported their health had deteriorated and education was severely disrupted in the refugee camps due to the ongoing effects of the pandemic and multiple other complicating factors. Colleagues, we must do more to act. The actions of the Tatmadaw against the Rohingya are acts of genocide and crimes against humanity. Any semblance of democracy has been shrugged off by this year's military coup. I urge that strong action be taken by Australia in order to protect the vulnerable Rohingya populations and ensure that their human rights are upheld and protected. The ability to manifest your faith and your cultural identity should never be curtailed by any government or military junta. The coup will only make things worse for the Rohingya people. Australia needs to stand against genocide in our region now and forever. Australia has, together with good people in the Asia Pacific, done great work. We can and we should play a very significant role with our regional allies to make Rakhine safer for the Rohingya. We should call out and sanction the military leaders responsible for crimes against humanity. As I speak this, again, I, I think of the excitement that we have all coming off the end of uh, the, the COVID crisis here in Australia, and people look to Christmas with hope. Friends of mine have already told me that they've put their Christmas trees up early this year because <coughs> they, just want to, they just want to have some beacon on the horizon. While we are looking to Christmas with that hope, we know that for the Rohingya, the situation is getting worse and worse under a military, military junta and exacerbated by the pandemic. I urge all those here in the chamber, uh, leaders amongst our parties, uh, to really do whatever we can to support the human rights of the Rohingya and for the government with our regional partners to show leadership now and not later now as people are suffering in order to do more to halt the military junta and its genocidal campaign. And my Christmas prayer is that we act in a way that provides some hope to the Rohingya people so that they know they do not suffer alone, that their brothers and sisters of many faiths around the world are not ignoring their plight. Senator Rice. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. The Australian Greens believe that universal human rights are fundamental and must be resp respected and protected in all countries and for all people. Unfortunately, across the world, the rights to freedom, dignity and equality of so many people are under threat. And it is so vital for us to be advocating for the rights of people in Australia and overseas and to highlight the incredible resilience and advocacy work of on-the-ground activists, campaigners and journalists, and stand in solidarity with them in their crusade for justice and truth-telling. Tonight, I want to first draw attention to Australia's own need to recognise the rights of all people, including trans, gender diverse and intersex people and all LGBTIQA plus people, to live with dignity, to be seen, affirmed and celebrated for who they are. Celebrating and upholding the rights of all people to live lives free from discrimination 
stands in stark contrast to the approach of this government with their religious discrimination bill, which we have just seen the text of tonight. We're still analysing the bill, but it's clear that this is legislation that would increase discrimination rather than decrease it. Increased discrimination against LGBTIQA plus people, against women, against people with disabilities and people of minority faiths. It would override hard-fought anti-discrimination legislation in the states and territories, including Section 17 of the Tasmanian Anti-Discrimination Act, which prohibits speech that offends, insults or humiliates people based on other characteristics, such as race, age, sex or disability. This bill says that statements of belief will not be considered to be discrimination. And what does this mean? It would mean that it would be legal for single mothers to be berated as sinners, for women to be admonished that they should submit to their husbands, or for women who choose to terminate a pregnancy to be told that they will be going to hell. It means it would be legal for people with disabilities to be told that their disability is a punishment from God and it will allow a waiter to tell a gay couple enjoying a romantic lunch that they will pray to God to heal them of their same-sex attraction. And it will be legal for trans and gender diverse people to have their very identity undermined and attacked just on the grounds that those views are a statement of belief by some people of faith. Look, don't get me wrong, people have the right to hold those views. They can believe anything they want, but they should not have the right to impose those views on others who do not share them. Everyone deserves to be loved and to be protected by the state and should be able to go to school and to work and anywhere else free from discrimination. We are still on a long and arduous journey to equality. And the government's religious discrimination bill would leave us much further from the end of this journey than ever. I would now like to move on to the human rights situation in India. And the health of Australia's bilateral relationship with India is based on the presumption of India's constitutional guarantee of equality and justice to all its citizens. However, the democratic and human rights of India's peoples are very much under threat. According to Human Rights Watch, the BJP government has increasingly harassed, arrested and prosecuted human rights defenders, activists, journalists, students and academics who have been critical of the government or its policies. And the government has also continued to impose harsh and discriminatory re restrictions on Muslim-majority areas in Jammu and Kashmir. Over the last year, 22-year-old climate activist Disha Ravi was arrested in India for merely sharing a climate toolkit and Muslim journalist Rana Ayub routinely gets sent violent threats of rape and death for critically reporting on the BJP government. These atrocities against women, young people and Muslim people must be condemned. And recently, according to an Amnesty International report, over 300 politicians, journalists and businesses were on a list of potential targets of covert Israeli-made spyware, Pegasus. And these included a majority of opposition leaders in India, security forces, judiciary and cabinet ministers, and is an in glaring violation of India's constitutional guarantee of the right to privacy. And alarmingly, these facial recognition technologies, surveillance technologies and spyware were discussed and celebrated by our Prime Minister Morrison and Foreign Minister Payne at the Sydney Dialogue. In contrast, the Greens believe that the Australian government should be seriously questioning and challenging Indian leaders on their excessive use of these technologies to marginalise minority communities, women, LGBTIQA plus people, and Muslim and Dalit and Adivasi communities. And the Australian government should also condemn the development of covertly installed spyware like Pegasus by the Israeli government used to stifle voices of dissent. And we should also follow the US in putting the software Pegasus on a trade blacklist. 
I now want to move to the situation in Sri Lanka. Tamil community members here in Australia have told me of their deep alarm about attacks on Tamils by the Sri Lankan government. Earlier this year, the Sri Lankan authorities ordered the bulldozing of a memorial paying tribute to the victims of the 2009 Mulivakal massacre, which was a mass killing of Tamil Tamilians. And this is one of many instances of Sri Lankan authorities attempting to erase Tamils from the community. In March 2021, the Australia backed, backed the UK-led resolution at the United Nations, Human, United Nations Human Rights Commission, expressing deep concern at the deteriorating situation in Sri Lanka, noting the excessive militarisation and erosion of the judici judiciary's independence. However, just one month later, we were supplying aerial surveillance drones to Sri Lanka to deter and disrupt asylum seekers trying to reach Australia. It is high time for the Australian government to acknowledge Tamil people in Sri Lanka as a persecuted minority and to divest from providing military support to Sri Lankan authorities. And we should be standing in solidarity with and increasing support for Tamil refugees and asylum seekers in Australian communities. I now want to move to Myanmar, and I repeat my ask, which we have heard time and time again from people in Myanmar, from the people here in Australia and globally, for the Australian government to impose targeted sanctions on the leaders of the military coup. Radios produced by Australian company Barrett Communications have been sold to the Myanmar military junta. Such trade must immediately be stopped, otherwise Australia is complicit in the anti-democracy coup by the military junta. Yet despite the loud, persistent and completely justified calls to support democracy in, in Myanmar and to sanction the junta, Minister Dutton recently met with representatives from the junta regime at the ASEAN Australia Defence Minister's virtual meeting. And we condemn this palpable disregard of the people's democracy in Myanmar and consider Minister Dutton's meeting with the junta as a message of recognising an illegitimate regime that took power by force and is committing atrocities against innocent civilians. Instead of legitimising the junta, the Australian government should be having formal government-to-government -government meetings with and recognising the national unity government. Recently, I rallied with community members in solidarity with Sudanese people fighting for democracy in Sudan. In the last few weeks, so many people, including ministers, journalists and civilian protesters, have been tragically arrested by the government. The Australian government should be actively, loudly and persistently condemning the, this unjust military coup and actively working with governments across the world for a just transition of power to a legitimate democratic government, ensuring peace and justice for Sudanese people. And finally, I speak about Ethiopia where the Tigrayan and the Oromo people are being persecuted by the military state. According to a UN and Ethiopian Human Rights Commission joint report, the Ethiopian regime has displayed appalling levels of brutality, especially towards women. And as the UN Human Rights Commission also recognised in a recent update, Tigrayan forces have allegedly been responsible for attacks on civilians, including indiscriminate killings resulting in nearly 76,500 people displaced in Afar and an estimated 200,000 people in Amhara. The Joint Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade Human Rights Committee recently heard very powerful evidence as part the, about this issue, and we heard from diaspora members, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty and, and others. And there was a single clear message that the Australian government must do more, and the international community must do more. So there's a set of clear recommendations that has been put forward by the Global Centre for the Responsibility of Protect. And we support those calls, calling for a humanitarian ceasefire, for the government of Ethiopia to remove the humanitarian blockade and for the deployment of international monitors. And I call on the Australian government Thank to you, amplify Senator these calls. Rice, time's expired. Senator McGrath. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Over recent months, China has continued to defy the sovereignty of Taiwan and many other nations in our immediate region. Earlier this year, both China and Russia sent a chilling message to the rest of the world in staging war games in northwestern China. This display of strength not only demonstrates the increasingly closer ties between Beijing and Moscow, but shows the comfortability between the two powers, with Russian forces 
seen firing Chinese weapons. Communist China has grown arrogantly comfortable to a worrying degree in showing its preparedness for conflict. This new show of strength is the next step in China's strategy to assert their dominance and expand their influence in the region. Communist China is a bully. It comes as the rest of the world turns a blind eye to the fact that China's pressure in Hong Kong has completely overthrown the one country, two system agreement. Hong Kong is gone. Hong Kong is one of the many tragedies arising from the COVID-19 pandemic. Indeed, it was the first casualty. I think it is very clear who is next, which, if the time comes, will be one of the greatest tests for the free world. Will we come to the aid of our democracy-loving friends in Taiwan or sit idly by and just let it happen, just like Chamberlain, succumbing to peace in our time, yet to find what comes down the track far worse? The threat to Taiwan is ever reflected in the gradual rise of soft power China in influencing upon the rest of the world to maintain authority over the language around Taiwan. Back in August, Beijing spectacularly expelled the Lithuanian ambassador and withdrew its own envoy from Lithuania because that nation moved to set up diplomatic ties with Taiwan. While in recent days, China has further reduced the level of its diplomatic relations with Lith Lithuania to below ambassador level for allowing Taiwan to set up an office under its own name in Lithuania. Either way, that China is increasing its pressure on both Taiwan and the rest of the world cannot go unnoticed. This mostly unfettered expansion and ability to make demands over so many nations means Communist China is not only strategising for global leadership, or better put, dictatorship, but seeks to position itself as a price taker, not giver, when it comes to trade. I have previously warned about the United States' concern about China's Coast Guard law that explicitly allows its Coast Guard to fire on foreign vessels in pursuit of China's claims and ongoing territorial and maritime disputes in the East and South China Seas. In addition, China flexed their muscle by sending multiple spy ships to observe this year's Talaman Sabre exercise off the coast of Rockhampton, all the while performing their own military drills off the coast of Taiwan in what is widely seen as a dress rehearsal for an invasion of that country, despite Washington's interventions. This assertive and provocative behaviour from the Communist Party in China has fast become their default reaction to any decision they do not take favour with. It will continue to be used to intimidate China's maritime neighbours, especially in asserting its unlawful maritime claims in the South China Sea. Madam Acting Deputy President, and that is why our government has turned to our strongest and our oldest and our most steadfast allies in the United States and the United Kingdom. I cannot stress enough how significant the new trilateral security pact AUKUS is. As China grows more aggressive by the day, this partnership is crucial to ensuring enduring peace, as well as free and open trade continues, continues in our region. We should always endeavour to work with China. However, we cannot be ignorant to their continued efforts to coerce and intimidate other countries. Communist China is the greatest threat to peace and the rule of law since Stalin's Soviet Union. We must be pragmatic yet realistic about the actions of China and what they mean for us and our allies. We must always stand up for our values as a liberal democracy. We cannot pretend that the regime in China today or tomorrow is the same as a China we have dealt with in the past. Economic war has already been declared on Western nations around the globe. And we've felt that already here in Australia, on our wine, our barley and our beef. And we must carefully consider how we continue to deal with China and the exemptions we sometimes afford them. As China continues to exert this subtle yet ever-present force, it is important the rest of the free world takes a continued strong stance on China. We need to hold China to the same standard on issues of trade, law and human rights. We must be careful and we must be aware. 
Now, Madam Acting Deputy President, the ABC. The ABC needs to be reformed to be saved from itself. The ABC is a, a $1.1 billion organisation funded by the taxpayer, yet the ABC along the track has, has wandered off the course. And it's now leaving, leaving us in the unfortunate position we are in now to wonder what should we do with the ABC. Labor and the Greens and the left love to run a protection racket to protect the ABC against any reform. We saw that today in the Senate, where Labor and the Greens uh, combined to, to stop an inquiry into something as innocent as the complaints process within the ABC. What we're seeing is a grotesque, left-wing, back-scratching orgy of, of, of flatulent arrogance from the ABC and from those on the left. This ABC who sneers at us, it is led by an arrogant chair who sees the ABC as a country apart from Australia. And that is quite sad. This inevitable result of decades of free reign, of grossly excessive budgets and diminished accountability, we've ended up with an inner city hive of woke workers hiring woke friends to do their woke work in their quest to wokeify the world. But in conjunction with, with the first night crowd, with, with the chair of the ABC and her fellow first nighters at the opera, and, 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 and chinking their, their, their champagne glasses, sneering at middle Australia, sneering at those who believe in a pluralistic, diverse media market. It is time for there to be reform of the ABC. There is time for the recruitment process to be opened up. It is time for their inner city headquarters to be sold and for their staff to be shifted to regional Australia. It is time. It is time for there to be a proper review of the charter of the ABC. But it needs to go beyond that. I have written to the Minister for Communications calling for an inquiry into the future of public broadcasting in this country. We have the ABC model, which is essentially is an old wireless trundling along. Yet we have a, a pluralistic, diverse media market. And the ABC, this monolith, this taxpayer funded monolith, is not fit for purpose in the 21st century. So we need a, an inquiry into the future of public broadcasting in Australia. We need to determine whether there is a need to fund Triple J, whether there is a need to fund all these different. Uh, different TV and radio stations. Now, I will strongly say, as someone who lives and spends a lot of their time in regional Queensland, there is a place for a, a taxpayer-funded broadcaster in regional Queensland and in regional Australia, because there is not a diverse media market there. But in terms of the rest of our country, it is time for a Royal Commission into the future of public broadcasting in this country. It is time that we stood up for the taxpayers of this country who are not getting value for money, and it is time that the board of the ABC, that most arrogant organisation, realise they are losing middle Australia because we have choice. There is so much diversity in our media market, and it would be sad if the ABC was just to fail and fall over. I want the ABC to be saved. I want it to be reformed so it can be saved from itself. Thank you. Thank you, Senator McGrath. Senator Patrick. Thank you, um, Madam Acting Deputy President. I'd like to take the opportunity to make a few remarks about the electorate of Grey, South Australia's largest electorate, covering no less than 92 per cent of the state. For those senators not familiar with Grey, the major population centres are Sejuna, Port Lincoln, Wyala, Port Augusta, Roxby Downs, Port Pirie and Kandina. In my time as a senator, I've spent a lot of time travelling around Grey. Wyala is my hometown. I grew up there. I had family there. 
I've had a long affinity for that fine city and for the coast of the Eyre Peninsula and the York Peninsula, for the long drives across uh, plains filled with wheat and the dramatic peaks of the Flinders Ranges and the surreal landscape of Cooper Pedy. I must say, one of the uh, delights of my job as a senator for South Australia has been to tour about and meet the people of Grey. There are some great characters there, whether in the fishing industry in Port Lincoln or amongst, uh, among the opal fields of uh, Cooper Pedy. I've also come to know, and, know, and, know Rowan Ramsey, the local member for Grey, and he's been a member there for a long time now. He's from Kimber with a property not far from the nuclear waste repository the federal government has imposed on the local community through a sham consultative process. Mr Ramsey was elected in 2007. He's held the seat now for 14 years. Once a Labor stronghold, Grey has been regarded as a safe Liberal seat since Barry Wakeland won it in 1993, 28 years ago. Grey's been a Liberal fiefdom for quite a while now. Anyway, the current uh, incumbent in Grey spoke in the House of Representatives on October the 28th, waxing lyrical about how well the people of Grey are doing. He spoke at length about roads, without question a significant issue in many parts of the electorate. He spoke about the sealing of the Streslecky track that stretches from Lyndhurst and goes through to Inaminka and on through to the Queensland border. The member went on to enthuse about the money that's been provided by the federal and state governments to support that and other road infrastructure developments across Grey, including the Joy Belush Bridge in Port Augusta. Mr Ramsey was able to refer to hundreds of millions of dollars of road funding that has or will, or will be spent in Grey. He declared, it's been a great time for the electorate of Grey. It's been a good time to be the member. Obviously, these are good announcements to make in one's electorate, but I think it's also important to see this re rebuilding of the roads. I think road work is great. Having driven far and wide across the electorate, I know the value of better roads and the value uh, they are for the graziers, the farmers, the miners, the people of the remote APY lands, indeed everyone across the expanse of the electorate. I was jarred, however, by the self-congratulatory tone of the member for Gray's speech. I did wonder about his essential, essentially one-dimensional view. Roads are important, but I couldn't help but recall the many conversations I've had with the people uh, across Grey who, while thankful for new bitumen, have bemoaned the great disadvantages they face in so many things in terms of limited economic opportunities, drug-related issues, youth unemployment, limited access to, to key health, mental health and aged care services. I've heard, about the concerns, uh, I've heard concerns about the future of Wyala the lack of strategic planning uh, for the future development of the Eyre Peninsula, concerns about the tendency for decision makers in Adelaide and Canberra to make ad hoc decisions with little regard for circumstances on the ground, the shambles concerning the, uh, Cooper Beatty's power supply and the impending uh, shambles in relation to their uh, water supply, and the botched decisions uh, making of the, of the South Australian government for a desalination plant at Port Lincoln, just being recent examples. No doubt the member for Grey would say that this is all anecdotal, that things are going tremendously well. As he said in his recent speech, it's been a great time for the electorate of Grey. It's been good, a good time to be uh, the member. However, when one looks at the bigger picture, all is not well. Far from it. Throughout the entirety of the Liberals' hold on Grey, the electorate has remained the most socially disadvantaged region of South Australia and, indeed, one of the most disadvantaged regions of Australia as a whole. Plenty of money has been spent on bitumen, but in the absence of real strategic vision for Grey uh, and the will of the, of the federal and state governments to make major investments required to remedy the region's entrenched disadvantage, things will not change much for many people. In this regard, I'd recommend that all senators take a look at the latest Dropping Off the Edge report. Uh, it's a uh, hugely valuable study of social disadvantage across Australia produced by leading social researchers at the University of Canberra for Jesuit uh, Social Services. It's a very comprehensive study looking at a host of indicators from income levels and employment to housing and rental stress from environmental factors to educational levels 
uh, incidents of domestic violence and access, access to social and health services. It's a study that's been um, undertaken repeatedly since 2007. And senators would do well to look closely at the patterns in their own, um, in their own respective states. In the case of South Australia, the la latest report shows serious disadvantage across the state, with the bulk of, the, of most of the disadvantage in the seat of grey. In, uh, in the study's map, grey is coloured red, indicating the highest level of disadvantage uh, across almost all of the indicators. This entrenched uh, disadvantage, whether expressed in low incomes, family stress, higher imprisonment rates, uh, domestic violence and poor health outcomes, is persistent. Most of, the, uh, of those rated as highly disadvantaged in, in, uh, in 2021 were similarly disadvantaged in 2015 and, indeed, in studies further back. In highlighting uh, the findings of this report, I don't want to suggest that life in grey and especially on the Air Peninsula is, is all bleak. But I don't. Uh, uh, I don't. But it's it's a useful correction to the uh, triumphal media releases from the local member trumpeting the latest federal grant to lay down some bitumen. Grey is an electorate with much economic promise, but also deeply entrenched social disadvantage that hasn't changed greatly through the long liberal hold on the seat. Of course, that's part of the story uh, uh, as a grey electorate has been uh, on the geographical margins of uh, South Australia, but also on the so-called safe Liberal seat. Um, it's been on the political margins uh, in, in policy making in both Adelaide and Canberra. Grey has been taken for advantage. Uh, sorry, for taken for granted. Grey has been taken for granted. In months to come, as the federal election approaches, I have no doubt that the member for Grey will be putting out more press releases about road funding and this or that federal grant. But it's far from clear that Grey receives any more funding than would normally be the case uh, for a member of a remote regional electorate. And it's certainly less than what Grey would receive if it were one, coloured, uh, one of the colour-coded marginal electorates on the Prime Minister's political spreadsheets. But what we really need to see is a strategic, economic and social vision for the entirety of the electorate, one that is backed by the will and investment needed to tackle the entrenched disadvantage across northern and western South Australia. That's what ought to be on the table for the seat of Grey at the next federal election. We'll have to see whether political circumstances are conducive to that. But if left to its own devices, with no effective challenge from the Labor Party, I can't see the current member for Grey delivering that. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Patrick. The Senate stands adjourned and we'll meet again tomorrow at 9.30.